Cosmic Striptease by Harlan Ellison. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. Cosmic Striptease by Harlan Ellison. The Atlas didn't make it. It blew up. And so did the Thor. The Vulcan wasn't much better. It just went pfft. None of them got anywhere near outer space. The real outer space. Oh, yes, they went up hundreds of miles, even thousands. The Vulcan went nearly 5,000. But they were still in the electromagnetic field. Nobody really understood the EMF. Einstein had hit on it with his final theory before he died. He said gravity and magnetism were just manifestations of something else, some single thing that held the very secret of matter. It was suspected that the Vulcan had reached the limits of the EMF, but nobody was sure. You can't be very sure about a thing that just goes and then isn't there anymore. Not there at all. That's what radar said and telescopes and theodolites and every other detection apparatus conceivable. Not until the Jason went up where no rocket had ever gone were they sure. Sure that man would never leave the confines of his EMF, at least until he solved the problem of the nature of the EMF. And that seemed the problem of the nature of matter itself. You'll have to admit that's a difficult problem to tackle. Yes, they tackled it. Theories were a dime a dozen. But just what the EMF really was, nobody could say even mathematically. Instead of wasting money on rockets that went pfft, they began to investigate space with rays, frequencies, radiations, echoes, electronic things the man in the street just didn't understand. What he did understand, however, was the answer that came back from space, as a result of all this electronic probing. Mars picked us up and answered. We thought we had quite a bit of electronic science, but we turned out to be babes in the woods. The Martians knew more about rays and waves and frequencies and vibrations than the Yanks knew about buying baseball players. They had a real cool signal. They called it the resonating magnetic field. You know what a resonating field is, don't you? It's like a great big drum. You hit it right, and it'll vibrate with the biggest boom you ever heard. It resonates. Our scientists knew how to resonate crystals, but the Martians could resonate the atmosphere. And when they resonated our atmosphere, every Earthman dug them, no matter where he was. That's the way their first signal reached us. A resonant voice sounded clearly everywhere on Earth, speaking in the language of the area in which it was heard. It was all a matter of resonant pitch. A thought had a basic wave, and it can be keyed to any pitch. When you say something, you express a thought by resonating the atmosphere. No matter if you speak English or German or Brooklyn, it's all the same thought. Well, when the Martians talked, we, each of us, were our own wave converter, and the vibrations that hit our eardrums came out whatever language we talked. How did they do it? Well, how do you explain electronic knowledge as advanced as that? You're right, they didn't. They didn't even try. They said we wouldn't get it anyway, so why waste airtime? A few of our big domes were incensed, but the Martians let them smoke. They said they had been watching our rocket efforts, and had figured we were pretty stupid since everybody in the solar system, and outside it for that matter, knew you couldn't lick the EMF with rockets. But then we'd started our electronic probing of outer space, and they lifted their mental eyebrows. It, they said, gave them the itch to give us a few pointers. You can imagine the fuss there was in the Pentagon, and in the Kremlin for that matter. Here was a chance to load up on classified stuff of the highest order, and something called an RMF was the biggest leak the world had ever known. Well, the Martians deep-froze that kind of idea right away. They weren't going to have any truck with secrets, especially secret weapons. They gave us quite a ribbing about weapons, and there were a lot of red faces on Earth. They were civilized, they said, and even their plows had been beaten into resonators. They had a highly developed moral sense, and the word war appeared in their dictionaries only in the archaic section. They were going to tell us a lot of things, to be sure, but they were going to elevate us. They were going to make real ladies and gentlemen out of us like they were. And as a beginning, they said they were going to put on a pageant. They were going to depict life on Mars for us as it was today, in all its glory and perfection. And they were going to do it in the form of a play. You can picture the Broadway producers perking up their ears at this. And right away they began thinking of the whole thing in terms of a production. 
Naturally, when the Martians said it would be done via worldwide television, the big networks immediately sensed a big deal, and they jumped almost as high as Vulcan. But the Martians said the broadcast didn't need receivers, but that the sky itself would be the TV screen. This was going to be the exact opposite of closed-circuit TV. This was wide open. As wide open as Minsky's in the 20s. Nobody knows how they did it, but NBC and CBS got a dual contract with the Martians for the commercials. Yes, it's true. The Martians agreed to monitor their commercials and then rebroadcast them as part of the big show that was to introduce Earthmen to Martians. The sponsors weren't difficult to sell. They fell all over themselves to get spots on the program. Actually, the whole thing was the most serious development in world history. Picture it for yourself. Out of a clear sky one day, at night because it involved the whole Earth in the same instant, a voice came from outer space, from Mars, and introduced us to a form of life our scientists had always claimed was a member of the Lycan family, but which actually was a lot more human than you are. What we had thought was the lowest form of Mossback was actually the highest human civilization in the solar system. Wedgwood China, suspension bridges, and hot dogs were old stuff 30,000 years ago with the Martians. They were really advanced, and when we understood it, most of us, that is, we felt mighty flattered to think that they were going to try to rub some of it off on us. Actually, the big show idea was a good one. Their psychologists had studied us and had decided that the best way to educate us was the painless way, by entertaining us. They knew how TV fascinated us. They noted our bowed shoulders, our kinked necks, our TV squint. What more natural thing than to put on the biggest TV show of all, and at the same time take the bow out of our shoulders, the kink out of our necks, and restore the focus of our eyes to the natural one of infinity. The whole sky was going to become one gigantic television screen, in perfect focus, in full. How full we never imagined until we saw it, color, and in 3D. This big show, they said, was going to come in like cosmic rays, from every direction, but seeming to focus directly overhead. Every seat in the house would be the best seat in the house. You were the entire audience, sitting in the one seat, surrounded from horizon to zenith by the entire stage. The Earth's EMF, they said, was a perfect lens shape, and it formed a perfect focus on the center of the Earth. The atmosphere was a perfect lens also because it was governed by, and in fact owed its existence, as did the entire Earth, to the EMF. Ever stop to think that it's the EMF that makes the direction exactly opposite to your feet the direction we call up, no matter where we stand on Earth? To a Chinese, up is the other way. It's the EMF does that. The EMF expressing itself as gravity. There really isn't anything called gravity as an entity. The EMF is the entity, and gravity is one of its legs. Magnetism is the other. Maybe the only way you could describe the EMF would be to call it the body, and nobody knows what the head is. The egotist who thinks he is the center of the universe may be right after all, except that he's not alone. Everybody else is at the center, too. Not that Edith Miller was egocentric. She was beautiful, yes, but not egocentric. She was not only beautiful, but she was the private secretary to Herman Findler, head of the new NBC-CBS Big Show merger. It was quite true that she would not have been secretary had she not been beautiful. After all, it's what you see on TV that counts, and the bosses never let that fact get very far out of their minds. Anything that couldn't go before a camera didn't go in TV anywhere. Edith went everywhere. She was the kind of a girl who, when you saw her, you wanted to see more, and you cursed the things as they are that made it impossible. It just wasn't fair, was the thought that instantly suggested itself as you saw enough to realize there was much more. That was the thought that Roy Mallory usually carried in his mind as he went about his business of production and coordination, and sometimes it affected his coordination, but never his production. As a TV producer, he was tops, and now, the youngest man and the sharpest of all businesses, he was assigned to handle the biggest spectacular of them all. To give you an idea of how highly regarded he was, having given him the assignment, Herman Fendler also gave him his secretary, but strictly on loan. Roy's face was flushed as he walked back to his office, Edith beside him, Fendler's words still ringing in his ears. The big show, he breathed. Wow. Not too big for you, said Edith. 
not with you to handle the details, he returned gallantly. That will be wise, she said. Huh? he said. To let me do all the handling. He flushed a different kind of flush now. <laughs> what makes you think? The look on your face when Mr. Findler said you could have me. I've seen that look hundreds of times, and it always means the same thing. But, he protested, we understand each other perfectly, don't we? she asked sweetly. Yes, we have our desks in separate offices. No, we don't. I intend to sit with my desk directly opposite you so I can keep my eye on you at all times. Mr. Finler gave me the job of seeing that you do your job, and I'm going to do it. Sadist, he snapped. Of course, she agreed. But can I help it? He looked at her, and suddenly he grinned. No, you can't. But with you sitting across from me, that realization won't lessen my sufferings any. It won't be so bad, she said. You can look. You are a sadist, he exclaimed. The big show opened with a commercial. Roy and Edith were sitting atop the roof of the central studio, relaxing in contour chairs. Roy's chair adjusted to his figure comfortably as he leaned back, but Edith's found the task impossible. She squirmed about until Roy glanced at her and remarked, Why don't you give up? The chair isn't made that can fit those curves. You've just got... Too much of a good thing, that's all. It isn't the chair, she said. It's that commercial. Just look at it. Roy stared at the huge box of breakfast food that loomed across the entire sky. The sponsor is probably delirious with joy, he said. Did you ever see such color and such sharpness of focus? It's so vivid you can almost reach right up and touch it. It's really there, not a picture. But what a thing to open the most important historical event of all time, the establishment of visual communication with another planet. I get what you mean, said Roy, but if you don't stop squirming, I'll find myself unable to concentrate on the big show. Footsteps behind them announced the late arrival of Herman Fendler, and he literally hurled himself into his contour chair as he puffed. Stupendous! Utterly stupendous! And to think that we've got the contract for these commercials! Now the scene changed, and it was Fendler himself announcing the big show. Fendler beamed as his own voice rolled out of the sky, sonorous and dignified and with the clarity of a golden bell slightly amalgamated with bronze. Ladies and gentlemen of the world, we bring you now the big show, the sensational Martian television broadcast of the pageant of life as it is lived on Mars. It is with great pride that we announce that through the combined efforts of NBC, CBS, we bring you the most historic event in television history or in Earth's history. For that matter. You all know how the Martians first communicated with us from space. You all heard the voice that came to us so unexpectedly. But now, at last, we can see as well as hear. For the first time, you will see our fellow men and women from Mars enacting before you the glorious pageant of their 35,000-year history. It is through this history that they hope to acquaint you with themselves, so that we can go on through the future as brother worlds, understanding each other, respecting each other, loving each other. It is true that our Martian brothers are far advanced over us, in the mechanics of civilization as well as the moral values. It is also true that as we watch, we will be forced to revise many of our own standards, but all for the better. It is the fond hope of the Martians and of the many among us who are concerned with our future development, the governments, the churches, the universities, that we will be speeded up along the path of civilization upon which the Martians have so long trod. Let us pray that what we see now and in the days to follow, nay, the weeks and months, for it will be a pageant of tremendous length to show the history of 35,000 years, will be as leaven to enlarge our lives and catapult us into a higher development that can enrich us beyond our dreams. My fellow men, I give you the Martians! A burst of applause followed, and Fendler beamed. You think of everything, my boy, he approved. Makes the show seem more live. Roy looked at Edith and snorted, almost inaudibly. She looked back. No matter what you think, she whispered, I can tell you he expected it and your name would be mud if you hadn't included it. Don't let it go to your head. That's right, whispered Roy sarcastically. Look out for me like a mother. Another voice came now, and with it the face of the first Martian ever seen on Earth. Edith gasped for breath. He's beautiful. The wind sagged out of Roy's sails. Oh, no, he groaned. The last thing I expected. Competition. Not at all, said Edith. 
You never had a chance. He'll never lay a hand on you, said Roy maliciously, unless he can do it over TV. If he could, I think I'd let him, returned Edith sweetly. Your cruelty is savage beyond comprehension, growled Roy. Why don't you jump off the roof? His voice trailed away as he listened to the Martian. Fellow men and women of Earth, came the voice, exquisitely clear and cultured, we are happy to present ourselves to you. In order that you may know us completely, we will begin with what we on Mars consider the most important facet of our lives, the family. The next thing you will see is a Martian wedding, which is really the beginning of living on Mars. Until the day a Martian man and woman join themselves as a family, to begin the wonderful task of continuing the race, it cannot be said that they have really been alive, but only going through the first faint stirrings of life as it really is. Look now upon a Martian wedding day. As the voice faded away, the face of the Martian, which had filled the whole sky, began to recede, and as it did so his shoulders came into view, his bronzed chest, his perfectly formed arms, his gleaming nude torso... "'Oh, my goodness!' screamed Edith, sitting erect in her chair. "'Oh, my goodness!' "'He's stark naked!' roared Findler. "'Mallory's nude as a jaybird!' "'So I see,' said Roy uncomfortably. "'Rather makes the classical sculptures of the ancient Greeks seem crude by comparison, doesn't he?' "'Eh?' said Findler. "'Oh, yes, he does. I, I see what you mean, but—' He subsided and relaxed in his chair because now the figure had vanished. Classical art personified. Great artists those Martians must be. Roy looked covertly at Edith, who was trembling and trying to compose herself as she too returned to her reclining position. Eight, nine, ten, he muttered. What did you say? asked Edith faintly, her composure returning. Just counting myself out, said Roy sadly. If that's what it takes, I'm long gone. Once more, the gigantic television screen of the sky came to life, and this time Roy Mallory sat erect. <laughs> this is more like it, he exclaimed with renewed interest. The scene was a great cathedral-like building, with the rays of the sun streaming redly through fantastically carved windows that seemed made of diamonds. Walking straight toward them came a young woman, smiling radiantly, and bearing in her arms a large bouquet of the most vivid and exotic flowers Roy had ever seen. Except for the flowers, she wore absolutely nothing other than a gold band around her forehead, in the center of which was a gigantic blood-red ruby. Standing on both sides were long rows of smiling men and women, two by two, and in common with the girl who advanced down the aisle between them, they were all completely naked. One thing seems certain, said Fendler. Clothing is unknown on Mars. I hadn't suspected that, but I suppose it would be best to make nothing of it. Exactly, Mr. Findler, said Roy. God created man and woman in the Garden of Eden unclothed, and it was only the warping effect of sin in their minds that made them wear clothing. Obviously on Mars this either never happened or they have returned to godliness and purity. You're right, my boy, said Findler, beginning to beam again, and this time he beamed with distinct pleasure. Beautiful, aren't they? Terrific, said Roy. The flowers are lovely, said Edith bravely. She carries them so gracefully. F flowers, said Roy absently. Oh, yes, flowers. Uh, very nice. Geraniums, aren't they? Look, she's giving them to the audience. There's the groom, said Findler. My, sh she's a lucky girl. Edith threw the executive a look that should have made him sink through the roof, but he didn't see it. She returned her gaze quickly to the heavens and tried to stare composedly. Once again, she found it difficult to find a comfortable position in her chair. For long minutes, the three, along with every other person on Earth, watched the ensuing ceremony, which was simple, direct, noble, and uplifting. Background music that began as a murmur grew until it became a virtual pian of joy as the young Martian couple announced their eternal vows in ringing tones. Then, before the assembled audience, they removed their golden circlets from about their heads and exchanged them. Obviously, this completed the wedding ceremony, for now they clasped their arms around each other and kissed, long and tenderly. "'It is lovely,' said Edith wistfully. Now the young couple, arm in arm, advanced slowly up a few steps toward an ornate couch, 
around which burned candles with flames of a color never seen on earth. Uh, said Findler. He leaned forward anxiously. Oh, said Edith, her hand flying to her mouth as though to stifle any further outburst. Ah, said Roy. The couple advanced to the couch and sat down upon it. A moment of incredulous silence was broken as Findler leaped to his feet. Mallory, he roared. Get that show off the air. Cut the power. Smash the cameras. Do anything. The FCC will murder us. There's no power to cut, said Roy. This isn't our show, remember? Just the commercials. Then put on a commercial! Hurry, man! Right in the middle of the show? Asked Roy. Besides, they control the commercials, too. Immediately after the scene, as I understand it, they'll put on the breakfast cereal again, and it will be rather well-timed, I'd say. Edith rose to her feet, her face flaming. You've got to do something. I, I don't know what, said Roy, looking at the sky intently. Besides, isn't this what they got married for? He settled himself more comfortably. Fendler turned and raced from the roof. Somebody turn that thing off, he screamed. His voice floated back to Roy and Edith on the roof. It died away in the recesses of the building. Nobody can turn it off, said Roy. And it's going to go on for months. For months? exclaimed Edith, horrified. She cast a glance upward, then turned away, clenching her fists and biting her lips. What's the matter? asked Roy. Can't you take it? She stamped her foot. Roy, Mallory, you say one more word and I'll... Roy shrugged. I'm surprised at you. Offhand, I'd say the Martians were highly advanced, sensible, uninhibited. Pretty wonderful human beings. At least they know what they're living for. Maybe it would do you good to watch. Edith looked up momentarily at the sky, then lowered her gaze swiftly. I... I can't, she whispered. Then she, too, ran from the roof and disappeared down the stairway. Roy looked after her a moment, then shrugged and returned to his contour chair and settled himself deeply into it. As the big show went on, he had no idea of the turmoil that was sweeping the world. It was only when the day's performance was over and he went down to his office that he got his first inkling. It consisted of the discovery that he had been fired, at the request of a certain breakfast cereals company. By noon the next day, every sponsor who had signed up for the big show had canceled their contracts, and by midnight it became painfully obvious that, although the contracts could be easily canceled, it was not equally easy to cancel the show. That night the big show went on, depicting more of the Family life of the Martians, taking Earth viewers through a typical day of a Martian couple on the day of the birth of their first child. To many of those who watched the show, it offered a tremendous fascination. But to others, more squeamish and unable to face the naked realities, both of the flesh and of the business of giving birth to a baby, neither of which spared any detail in their presentation, it was an experience past their ability to endure. However, as one prominent physician said, this is the way a baby should be born. Every woman on earth can take a lesson from what we have just seen. If they did, we'd have little use for doctors, psychiatrists, or psychologists. This is the miracle of birth as it was meant to be. It was the unfortunate sponsor who made the loudest noise, though. His screams were heard the world over. His brand of beer, spoken of in such glowing terms before and after the broadcast, wasn't worth a nickel after the Martians did a rerun of the show depicting how the birth would have gone if the mother had been a drunkard. Now, indeed, were there faintings and mental blow-ups among the populace. The scene was rather ghastly. Some thought the Martians had overdone it, but as the president of the WCTU remarked triumphantly, exactly what we've been saying for decades. At midnight, the FCC suspended the license of the NBC-CBS Big Show merger, and Herman Findler himself lost his job. Along with him, of course, Edith Miller became unemployed, although no woman in that category could claim to be more beautifully unemployed. Roy Mallory, visiting his office to remove some of his personal belongings, found her emptying her own desk. Oh, he said. Another casualty? You read the papers, don't you? she asked. Yes, I heard of the FCC closing the networks up. But it hasn't stopped the show. Tonight, you know, is the Martian version of what they do for entertainment. I suppose we'll be watching that happy young couple going out on the town and doing it up brown or buff, as you might say. You will be watching, Edith cut in acidly. I have no doubt at all. As for me, certainly I'll be watching. That doll is almost as beautiful as you are. 
and I keep thinking how nice it would be if we were on Mars. We're not, she said, and we won't ever be. Alas, he said glumly, and alack. You're as funny as a crutch, she said, stuffing the last of her belongings into her bag. You ought to get yourself a job as a comedian. Oh, I've already got a job, he said airily. Oh? Yes. She stood there, poised as if to leave, but not actually translating the poise into action. Where? she asked, setting down her bag with a defiant slam. I could use a good secretary, he said. Tell me where you're working, she demanded impatiently. I'm starting my own business in television producing, he said, and I'll never make it go without a competent secretary. And? He put his hands behind his back. Look, no hands. I'll take the job, she said. And what are you doing for your first show? Give me time, he grinned. I just this minute started the new company. I thought so, she said calmly. Well, how about the big show? <laughs> the big show? Why not? Who will we get for a sponsor? He asked sarcastically. How about Sunbathing Magazine? She suggested. He looked at her wide-eyed. Sunbathing Magazine? He gasped. Of course. With all this publicity, their circulation will zoom to the moon if they just grab it, and it's up to you to see that they do. Baby, he said wonderingly, I just don't know how to take you. Don't try it, she said, picking up a letter knife and toying with it. Exactly one week later, the Martians dropped all their previously scheduled commercials and put on the first of the new commercials. As Roy Mallory reclined in the contour chair atop the roof of his newly rented office, Edith Miller suddenly appeared at his side and looked around. Where's my chair? she asked. He leaped to his feet. I didn't think you cared to watch the big show, he said. I only ordered one chair. You're always yelling about extravagance. All right, she said. I'll sit on the parapet. You'll get a stiff neck. I've already got one, she said. I'll say you have, he said disgustedly. But why not forget all that? This chair is big enough for two. I don't need this job that bad. He grunted and sat down in the chair again. Okay, but tell me if your neck does get stiff. I'll change with you 50-50. Fair enough, she said. The show began, and there was silence on the roof. Edith watched calmly, and Roy divided his attention between watching her and the show. As the show progressed, it became obvious that the script was perfect for the new sponsor. We'll make a million on that percentage agreement, said Edith. Two million, said Roy. I think I'll make you a partner for that bit of masterminding. Keep it, she said. And by the way, isn't that the roof of the sunbathing magazine building over there? Yes. And isn't that the editorial staff of sunbathing magazine out on the roof watching the show? Yes. And aren't they in the buff, as you so crudely put it, in spite of the fact the sun isn't out? Roy sat up in his chair and looked sharply at the roof in question. In the vivid light from the sky pictures which were now showing a happy couple soaring fantastically in a Martian equivalent of the aerial gadgets of Coney Island, still unimpeded by the briefest of entangling garments, it was quite obvious that the editorial staff of Sunbathing Magazine was, indeed, buffing it. They're pretty modern over there, he said. You can't blame them for practicing what they preach. But isn't this an innovation? I believe so. Usually they limit their activities to private camps. I heard today that there were new teenage clubs being formed pattern after the big show, said Edith. Clubs? Yes, the police arrested a whole group of them in Sandusky, Ohio, for stripping off their clothes during a local hop. Uh, that's not so good, said Roy. Oh, I don't know. They weren't really doing anything wrong. Roy almost choked. <laughs> Nothing wrong? No, they were conducting the whole affair on a highly moral plane. The police let them go and dismissed the case when their parents showed up and suggested that it was all rather natural and that they felt no harm had been done. The parents said that? asked Roy incredulously. Weeks passed, and the big show went on. The audience, which had always been huge, now became almost universal, and no longer were there any remarks about nudity, but instead sunbathing groups began springing up everywhere. For a time, this development, which began to edge its way into public places with an accelerated pace, rather than private camps, stirred up another storm, and there were demands that Sunbathing Magazine be banned from the newsstands. This fell through when the authorities pointed out the magazine was tame compared to the show in the heavens. Then one day, Edith handed the phone to Roy with the remark, Another sponsor? 
Who? asked Roy in surprise. The League of Decency, said Edith. Something about if they can't lick him to join him. There was a peculiar look in her eyes as Roy took the phone and leaned back in his swivel chair to talk. When he had finished, he turned back to Edith and said, Baby, I've got a hunch that it won't be long before the only use the people on this earth will have for clothing will be for protection from the elements, which, after all, are not as temperate on Earth as they are on Mars, with its scientifically controlled weather. You may be right, she said. She busied herself with her filing cabinet. That night, as Roy lay back on the roof chair watching the Martian version of a musical show, which several weeks ago would have seemed tremendously daring, it stirred scarcely a flicker in his nervous system. It was in the middle of the ballet, wherein lovely Martian girls soared about on twinkling toes, gloriously nude, bathed only in incredibly exotic color symphonies played on them by a master color organist, that Roy heard the soft pad of footsteps behind him. He heard Edith seat herself in her chair, but paid no attention, so engrossed was he in the spectacle before him. But as he lay there, something nagged at the back of his mind disturbingly, and all at once it hit him. Edith's footsteps had had the unmistakable slap of bare feet. For an instant, he lay there frozen. Then he turned his head with a jerk. Edith was lying in her contour chair, composedly looking at the big show. And she was as naked as the day she was born. He sat up angrily. This is going too far, he exploded. Edith turned to him in wonderment, her eyes wide. What? she gasped. That's certainly a strange reaction coming from you. You're as buff as a billiard ball, he said indignantly, his face growing red. I don't think I look like a billiard ball, she said. I've always been under the impression I was rather nice looking, neither square nor perfectly round, just nicely curved. Your sadism has gone too far this time, he snapped. I don't appreciate it at all. You can sit here and moonbathe if you want to. I'm going downstairs and work. He began to stride toward the roof entrance. What's the matter? Can't you take it? She called after him. He whirled. If it'll satisfy your sadistic little mind, he said. I can't. Now, are you pleased with yourself? She looked hurt. Who's being a sadist? She said. She stood up and came toward him. He grew giddy, and for a moment the roof whirled around him. Then all at once he found himself lying on the roof, and his head cradled on her lap. He looked up at her. You aren't being a sadist? He persisted. Of course not, she said. After all, the Martians are 30,000 years ahead of us, and if it's all right with them, who am I to be backward? Baby, he said, drawing her lips down to his, you've been ahead of them all the time. And all over Earth, the mankind took a gigantic step forward into a new Eden that promised many good things. End of Cosmic Striptease by Harlan Ellison Space Brat by O. H. Leslie This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Quartertone Space Brat by O. H. Leslie The aliens' invasion plan was logical. To conquer man, they reasoned, you start with baby and work up. Mr. Gertz slapped his forehead in vexation, and his wife Emma shifted in their double bed and said, Louis, for heaven's sake, go to sleep. Sleep? Mr. Gertz mocked her speech. What are you, kidding? How can I go to sleep with that brat next door screaming its head off? It's only a baby. What do you expect? I expect a little peace and quiet. Poor little thing, she murmured. Mr. Gertz grumbled. The baby cried on. Athra, chairman of the War Council of Nara, squatted on the red blood cushion and twisted the plastic features of his eyeless face into a portrait of contempt and impatience. He had listened silently to the arguments and counter-arguments of the council members, and only until their shrill, strident voices had grown tired of the useless debate did he speak. And when he spoke, they listened. Fools, he said harshly, seven orbits has the sun made of Narla. Do you think Jihira has waited this long to make its plans? A murmur went up at the mention of the hated name. Jihira, their planetary neighbor, had hurled its declaration of war seven Narla years ago. 
Still, the major preparations for the battle were not underway. The battlefield had been chosen, a distant world on the rim of the Great Nebula, a world whose green land areas and wide seas most resembled the terrain of the two combatants. It was traditional for Narla and Jihira to fight on other worlds. Through countless centuries, they had learned the bitter outcome of war on their own soil. Jointly, their exploratory forces had searched the galaxies for the scene of their next conflict. They had decided upon the planet called Earth by its inhabitants and fixed the date of the engagement for forty years hence, a generation to the short-lived creatures of the green world, but only a brief span to the people of Narla. Forty years, Athra rasped. Seven gone already, and still we sit in idle quarrel without our defenses prepared. Do you realize the consequence of such inaction? Do you not suppose that Jihira has already sent its agents to this world to scout out its population, its ways, its weaknesses, its dangers and pitfalls? And what have we learned? What information do our scouts supply? At the end of the hall, a figure arose, bowing humbly, its four jointless arms wrapped about its narrow body. If I may report, sir, he said quietly. The council members turned to the speaker. You may speak, Shura, the chairman said. The figure bowed again. As captain of the exploratory force of Narla, it is my duty to point out the nature of the problem we face on this new battleground. This is no ordinary world we have chosen. Its inhabitants are strange and unpredictable. They are alternately peace-loving and warlike, wise and stupid, courageous and cowardly, noble and selfish. There is little consistency in their actions or emotions, but there is one aspect of their nature which is common to all. And what is that? Suspicion. A lack of trust in each other's motives. And that is why our problem has been so difficult, sir. We would have sent our agent among them many orbits ago if we could have decided upon what form the agent should adopt. Shira slithered across the polished floor of the council room and stopped before the reading screen at the right of the chairman's pillow. He flipped the switch that started the screen glowing. Here is what the Earth race calls a man. A gasp of revulsion swept the room at the image that appeared on the screen. In addition to his unattractiveness, Shura said, the man is a relatively inefficient creature. As an individual, he is usually inclined to be emotionally unstable, petty, given to a sense of self-importance, greedy, acquisitive, slothful, and often cruel. At times, he is capable of unselfish and even noble actions, but even these are questioned by his fellow creatures as having hidden, base motivations. If our agent were to take the form of this man, his ability to uncover the type of information we seek would be hampered by the same distrust that affects all men of the planet Earth. Therefore, we cannot recommend, in all honesty, that we dispatch an agent bearing this shape to scout this battlefield. The chairman grunted. Then what shape do you recommend, Shura? The figure shrugged. We have considered several others— there are many type of organic creatures on this world, some of them more trusted by man than man himself. This shape, for example. He flicked the switch. A four-legged creature, blanketed with shaggy fur, with a long nose and pointed ears, appeared on the reading screen. This is what they call Dog. Dog is considered by the Earth race as man's best friend— he accompanies man everywhere, and told many confidences, even though he has no ability to speak or comprehend. He is well cared for, often pampered, and most importantly, he is usually trusted implicitly. And this is the shape you recommend? Shira sighed. No. Unfortunately, dogs' actions are limited by the masters. They are allowed little freedom of action. If dog becomes independent of man— they declare it wild and treat it as a beast of the field. The chairman slapped at his pillow with his seven-fingered hand. Get to the point, Shura. I do not wish to hear what shapes you do not recommend. I wish a positive answer to our problem. We have one, Shura said. The councilman murmured. Here is the shape we recommend, after careful study. It is the shape of man, but man in the dawn of his innocence. 
the only shape in which all of the inhabitants of this planet give their complete faith and trust. He flicked the switch again. Athra, the chairman, stared at the bloated, pink, ugly thing on the screen and looked disgusted. What in Narla's name is that? That, Shura said, is what the Earth race calls a baby. Unlike ourselves, the Earth creatures are mammals, burying their young within the womb and expelling it after nine months of gestation. The creature that emerges is called a baby, or infant, and it undergoes a process of cell growth until it becomes an Earth adult. But at no point in this entire growth process is the Earth creature more adored, more pampered, and most importantly, more trusted than the time when it bears the name of Baby. And this is your recommendation? Yes, sir. There are drawbacks, of course. The Baby is a helpless thing at first, dependent upon human care. But it is this very helplessness which makes the Baby so acceptable to the Earth race. Our agent would have to suffer a period of helplessness before he is able to perform his scouting duties, but the few lost years will be well worth the outcome. He will be completely accepted into Earth society. He will be one of them, not an alien stranger, unused to their ways and customs and mores. He will grow up as a normal member of the Earth race. Then, when the proper moment comes, he will be in the best of positions to blueprint our new battlefield in astonishing detail. From the corner of the room, Lothra, the ex-chairman of the Narla War Council, twisted his features bitterly and said, And just how does Shura propose to introduce this agent to the planet? Can we place him in the very womb of some earth creature? No, Shura said, that cannot be done. But infiltrating an agent in the form of a human baby will be no problem. The earth creatures readily accept babies without question as to parentage or identity. There are thousands of such babies born every day on the planet, and special institutions have been created for their care. Lothar growled. It's ridiculous. Too elaborate. I prefer the direct approach. That is our recommendation, Shura said stiffly. I suggest we put it up to a council vote. The chairman nodded in assent. Shura is right. The council will vote on the proposal. All those in favor will please raise their fourth hand. Mrs. Purdy of the Delafield Adoption Agency smiled toothily at the young couple seated in front of her desk. I'm always happy to deliver such good news, she said. I know how long you two have been waiting, but now I think your prayers have been answered. Jane Bryan caught her breath sharply. Oh, Miss Purdy, you mean... Yes, my dear. It isn't often that we are able to find just the infant our prospective parents have requested, but fate has been good to you both. Recently, our agency was fortunate enough to receive a foundling infant boy. He's a perfect darling, just about a month old, blue eyes, blonde hair, and an absolute charmer. Jane's husband, Dan, reached over to grip his wife's hand. Do you really mean it, Mrs. Purdy? I certainly do. Naturally, you were one of the first couples I thought of when the baby was brought here. The poor little thing was abandoned on our very doorstep. It was like a gift from heaven. Now all we have to do is complete a few minor formalities. Jane couldn't help herself. The tears started in her pretty green eyes, and she fumbled helplessly in her purse for her handkerchief. Dan got up and went to her. He put her head on his shoulder and let her weep in happiness and relief. Mrs. Purdy watched them, her eyes tender. "'Can we see him?' Dan asked. "'Can we see our baby now, Mrs. Purdy?' "'Of course. Come right this way.' Jane dried her eyes, and they left the office together. But her tears began to flow again as they approached the crib on the second floor of the adoption agency. Her arms went out impulsively toward the child that lay in peaceful slumber on the sheet. "'Oh, he's adorable!' Jane breathed. Oh, Dan, he's just what we always wanted. How soon? Dan said tightly. How soon, Mrs. Purdy? Just a few days. We'll work as swiftly as we can, Mr. Bryan. In a few days, you can take your new baby home. The few days turned out to be a week. Then the phone rang in the Bryan household, and Mrs. Purdy's cheerful voice said, Today's the day! At five o'clock on a Monday afternoon, Jane Bryan carried her new son across the threshold of their apartment. 
At two o'clock, the baby set up a hungry howl, and Dan Bryan stirred and sat up in bed. Wake up, he said to his wife. What is it? That damn thing is sure screaming its head off. I don't think I can wait. I think we ought to take care of it now. But how can we, his wife said. It would look suspicious, wouldn't it? What if it does? We can move out of here tomorrow, see another part of the world. But Lotha warned us to be careful. Lotha, Dan Bryan said, his lips curled. Why should we listen to anything he says? We take our orders directly from Jahira, not from a dirty Narlin traitor. I say tonight. Whatever you say, dear, his wife answered. Mr. Gertz looked at the bedside clock, moaned, and punched his pillow angrily. That lousy brat, he said. Why doesn't somebody shut him up? His request was answered. With abrupt suddenness, the baby's pitiful cry ended. There, Mrs. Gertz said comfortably. I told you, Louis, the poor thing was only hungry. Now go to sleep. Mr. Gertz rolled over. He dozed off quickly, now that the night was still, and slept with the innocence of a babe. End of Space Brat by O. H. Leslie The Tissue Culture King by Julian Huxley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Tissue Culture King by Julian Huxley. We had been for three days engaged in crossing a swamp. At last we were out on dry ground, winding up a gentle slope. Near the top the brush grew thicker. The look of a rampart grew as we approached. It had the air of having been deliberately planted by men. We did not wish to have to hack our way through the spiky barricade, so turned to the right along the front of the green wall. After three or four hundred yards, we came on a clearing which led into the bush, narrowing down to what seemed a regular passage or trackway. This made us a little suspicious. However, I thought we had better make all the progress we could, and so ordered the caravan to turn into the opening, myself taking second place behind the guide. Suddenly the tracker stopped with a guttural exclamation. I looked, and there was one of the great African toads, hopping with a certain ponderosity across the path, but it had a second head growing upwards from its shoulders. I had never seen anything like this before and wanted to secure such a remarkable monstrosity for our collections. But as I moved forward, the creature took a couple of hops into the shelter of the prickly scrub. We pushed on, and I became convinced that the gap we were following was artificial. After a little, a droning sound came to our ears, which we very soon set down as that of a human voice. The party was halted, and I crept forward with the guide, Peeping through the last screen of brush, we looked down into a hollow and were immeasurably startled at what we saw there. The voice proceeded from an enormous negro man at least eight foot high, the biggest man I had ever seen outside a circus. He was squatting, from time to time prostrating the forepart of his body and reciting some prayer of incantation. The object of his devotion was before him on the ground. It was a small flat piece of glass held on a little carved ebony stand. By his side was a huge spear, together with a painted basket with a lid. After a minute or so the giant bowed down in silence, then took up the ebony and glass object and placed it in the basket. Then, to my utter amazement, he drew out a two-headed toad, like the first I had seen, but in a cage of woven grass, placed it on the ground, and proceeded to more genuflection and ritual murmurings. As soon as this was over, the toad was replaced, and the squatting giant tranquilly regarded the landscape. Beyond the hollow or dell lay an undulating country with clumps of bush. A sound in the middle distance attracted attention. Glimpses of color moved through the scrub, and a party of three or four dozen men were seen approaching, most of them as gigantic as our first acquaintance. All marched in order, 
armed with great spears, and wearing colored loin straps with a sort of sporan, it seemed, in front. They were preceded by an intelligent-looking negro of ordinary stature armed with a club, and accompanied by two figures more extraordinary than the giants. They were undersized, almost dwarfish, with huge heads, and enormously fat and brawny both in face and body. They wore bright yellow cloaks over their black shoulders. At sight of them, our giant rose and stood stiffly by the side of his basket. The party approached and halted. Some order was given. A giant stepped out from the ranks towards ours, who picked up the basket, handed it stiffly to the newcomer, and fell into place in the little company. We were clearly witnessing some regular routine of relieving guard, and I was racking my brains to think what the whole thing might signify. Guards, giants, dwarfs, toads. When to my dismay, I heard an exclamation at my shoulder. It was one of those damned porters, a confounded fellow who always liked to show his independence. Bored with waiting, I suppose, he had self-importantly crept up to see what it was all about, and the sudden sight of the company of giants had been too much for his nerves. I made a signal to lie quiet, but it was too late. The exclamation had been heard. The leader gave a quick command, and the giants rushed up and out in two groups to surround us. Violence and resistance were clearly out of the question. With my heart in my mouth, but as much dignity as I could muster, I jumped up and threw out my empty hands, at the same time telling the tracker not to shoot. A dozen spears seemed towering over me, but none were launched. The leader ran up the slope and gave a command. Two giants came up and put my hands through their arms. The tracker and the porter were herded in front at the spear point. The other porters now discovered there was something amiss, and began to shout and run away, with half the spearmen after them. We three were gently but firmly marched down and across the hollow. I understood nothing of the language, and called to my tracker to try his hand. It turned out that there was some dialect of which he had a little understanding, and we could learn nothing save the fact that we were being taken to some superior authority. For two days we were marched through pleasant park-like country with villages at intervals. Every now and then some new monstrosity in the shape of a dwarf or an incredibly fat woman or a two-headed animal would be visible, until I thought I had stumbled on the original source of supply of circus freaks. The country at last began to slope gently down to a pleasant river valley, and presently we neared the capital. It turned out to be a really large town for Africa, its mud walls of strangely impressive architectural form, with their heavy slabby buttresses and giants standing guard upon them. Seeing us approach, they shouted, and a crowd poured out of the nearest gate. My God, what a crowd! I was getting used to giants by this time, but here was a regular Barnum and Bailey show, more semi-dwarfs, others liked them, but more so. One could not tell whether the creatures were precociously mature children or horribly stunted adults. Others portentously fat, with arms like sooty legs of mutton, and rolls and volutes of fat crisping out of their steatopigous posteriors, Still others precociously senile and wizened, others hateful and imbecile in looks. Of course, there were plenty of ordinary Negroes, too, but enough of the extraordinary to make one feel pretty queer. Soon after we got inside, I suddenly noted something else which made me feel queer, a telephone wire with perfectly good insulators running across from tree to tree. A telephone in an unknown African town. I gave it up. But another surprise was in store for me. I saw a figure pass across from one large building to another, a figure unmistakably that of a white man. In the first place, it was wearing white ducks and sun helmet. In the second, it had a pale face. He turned at the sound of our cavalcade and stood looking a moment, then walked towards us. Halloa, I shouted. Do you speak English? Yes, he answered, but keep quiet a moment, and began talking quickly to our leaders, 
who treated him with the greatest deference. He dropped back to me and spoke rapidly. You are to be taken into the council hall to be examined, but I will see to it that no harm comes to you. This is a forbidden land to strangers, and you must be prepared to be held up for a time. You will be sent down to see me in the temple buildings as soon as the formalities are over, and I'll explain things. They want a bit of explaining, he added with a dry laugh. By the way, my name is Haskam, lately research worker at Middlesex Hospital, now religious advisor to His Majesty King M. Gobe. He laughed again and pushed ahead. He was an interesting figure, perhaps fifty years old, spare body, thin face, with a small beard and rather sunken hazel eyes. As for his expression, he looked cynical, but also as if he was interested in life. By this time we were at the entrance to the hall. Our giants formed up outside, with my men behind them, and only I and the leader passed in. The examination was purely formal, and remarkable chiefly for the ritual and solemnity which characterized all the actions of the couple of dozen fine-looking men in long robes who were our examiners. My men were herded off to some compound. I was escorted down to a little hut, furnished with some attempt at European style, where I found Haskam. As soon as we were alone, I was after him with my questions. Now you can tell me, where are we? What is the meaning of all this circus business and this menagerie of monstrosities? And how do you come here? He cut me short. It's a long story, so let me save time by telling it my own way. I am not going to tell it as he told it, but will try to give a more connected account, the result of many later talks with him, and of my own observations. Haskam had been a medical student of great promise, and after his degree had launched out into research. He had first started on parasitic protozoa, but had given that up in favor of tissue culture. From these he had gone off to cancer research, and from that to a study of developmental physiology. Later, a big commission on sleeping sickness had been organized, and Haskam, restless and eager for travel, had pulled wires and got himself appointed as one of the scientific staff sent to Africa. He was much impressed with the view that wild game acted as a reservoir for the Trypanosoma gambiens. When he learnt of the extensive migrations of game, he saw here an important possible means of spreading the disease and asked leave to go up country to investigate the whole problem. When the commission as a whole had finished its work, he was allowed to stay in Africa with one other white man and a company of porters to see what he could discover. His white companion was a laboratory technician, a taciturn NCO of science called Agers. There is no object in telling of their experiences here. Suffice it that they lost their way and fell into the hands of this same tribe. That was fifteen years ago. And Augers was now long dead as the result of a wound inflicted when he was caught, after a couple of years, trying to escape. On their capture, they too had been examined in the council chamber, and Haskam, who had interested himself in a dilettante way in anthropology, as in most other subjects of scientific inquiry, was much impressed by what he described as the exceedingly religious atmosphere. Everything was done with an elaboration of ceremony, the chief seemed more priest than king, and performed various rites at intervals, and priests were busy at some sort of altar the whole time. Among other things, he noticed that one of their rites was connected with blood. First the chief and then the councillors were in turn requisitioned for a drop of vital fluid pricked from their fingertips, and the mixture, held in a little vessel, slowly evaporated over a flame. Some of Haskam's men spoke a dialect not unlike that of their captors, and one was acting as interpreter. Things did not look too favorable. The country was a holy place, it seemed, and the tribe a holy race. Other Africans who trespassed there, if not killed, were enslaved, but for the most part they let well alone and did not trespass. White men they had heard of, but never seen till now, 
and the debate was what to do, to kill, let go, or enslave. To let them go was contrary to all their principles. The holy place would be defiled if the news of it were spread abroad. To enslave them, yes, but what were they good for? And the council seemed to feel an instinctive dislike for these other colored creatures. Hascombe had an idea. He turned to the interpreter. Say this, you revere the blood. So do we, white men, but we do more. We can render visible the blood's hidden nature and reality, and with permission I will show you this great magic. He beckoned to the bearer who carried his precious microscope, set it up, drew a drop of blood from the tip of his finger with his knife, and mounted it on slide under a cover slip. The bigwigs were obviously interested. They whispered to each other, At length, show us, commanded the chief. Hascom demonstrated his preparation with greater interest than he had ever done to first-year medical students in the old days. He explained that the blood was composed of little people of various sorts, each with their own lives, and that to spy upon them thus gave us new powers over them. The elders were more or less impressed. At any rate, the sight of these thousands of corpuscles, where they could see nothing before, made them think made them realize that the white man had power which might make him a desirable servant. They would not ask to see their own blood, for fear that the sight would put them into the power of those who saw it. But they had blood drawn from a slave. Ascom asked, too, for a bird, and was able to create a certain interest by showing how different were the little people of its blood. Tell them, he said to the interpreter, that I have many other powers and magics which I will show them if they will give me time. The long and short of it was that he and his party were spared. He said he knew now what you felt when the magistrate said, remanded for a week. He had been attracted by one of the elder statesmen of the tribe, a tall, powerful-looking man of middle age, and was agreeably surprised when this man came round next day to see him. Haskam later nicknamed him the Prince Bishop for his combination of the qualities of the statesman and the ecclesiastic. His real name was Bugala. He was as anxious to discover more about Haskam's mysterious powers and resources as Haskam was to learn what he could of the people into whose hands he had fallen, and they met almost every evening and talked far into the night. Bugala's inquiries were as little prompted as Haskam's by a purely academic curiosity impressed himself by the microscope, and still more by the effect which it had had on his colleagues, he was anxious to find out whether, by utilizing the powers of the white man, he could not secure his own advancement. To cut a long story short, they at length struck a bargain. Bugala would see to it that no harm befell Haskam, but Haskam must put his resources and powers at the disposal of the council and Bugala would take care to arrange matters so that he himself benefited. So far as Haskam could make out, Bugala imagined a radical change in the national religion, a sort of reformation based on Haskam's conjuring tricks, and that he would emerge as the high priest of this changed system. Haskam had a sense of humor, and it was tickled. It seemed pretty clear that they could not escape, at least for the present. That being so, why not take the opportunity of doing a little research work at state expense, an opportunity which he and his like were always clamoring for at home? His thoughts began to run away with him. He would find out all he could of the rites and superstitions of the tribe. He would, by the aid of his knowledge and his scientific skill, exalt the details of these rites, the expression of those superstitions, the whole physical side of their religiosity, on to a new level which should to them appear truly miraculous. It would not be worth my troubling to tell all the negotiations, the false starts, the misunderstandings. In the end he secured what he wanted, a building which could be used as a laboratory, an unlimited supply of slaves for the lower and priests for the higher duties of laboratory assistants and the promise that when his scientific stores were exhausted, they would do their best to secure others from the coast, a promise which was scrupulously kept, so that he never went short for lack of what money could buy. 
he next applied himself diligently to a study of their religion and found that it was built round various main motifs. Of these, the central one was the belief in the divinity and tremendous importance of the priest-king. The second was a form of ancestor worship. The third was an animal cult, in particular of the more grotesque species of the African fauna. The fourth was sex, called variazione. Hascom reflected on these facts, tissue culture, experimental embryology, endocrine treatment, artificial parthenogenesis. He laughed and said to himself, well, I can but try, and it ought to be amusing. That was how it all started. Perhaps the best way of giving some idea of how it had developed will be for me to tell my own impressions when Hascom took me round his laboratories. One whole quarter of the town was devoted entirely to religion. It struck me as excessive, but Hascom reminded me that Tibet spends one-fifth of its revenues on melted butter to burn before its shrines. Facing the main square was the chief temple, built impressively enough of solid mud. On either side were the apartments where dwelt the servants of the gods and administrators of the sacred rites. Behind were Hascom's laboratories, some built of mud, others, under his later guidance, of wood. They were guarded night and day by patrols of giants, and were arranged in a series of quadrangles. Within one quadrangle was a pool which served as an aquarium, in another aviaries and great hen houses, in yet another cages with various animals, in the fourth a little botanic garden. Behind were stables with dozens of cattle and sheep, and a sort of experimental ward for human beings. He took me into the nearest of the buildings. This, he said, is known to the people as the factory. It is difficult to give the exact sense of the word, but it literally means producing place. The factory of kingship, or majesty, and the wellspring of ancestral immortality. I looked around and saw platoons of buxom and shining African women becomingly but unusually dressed in tight-fitting white dresses and caps, and wearing rubber gloves. Microscopes were much in evidence, as also various receptacles from which steam was emerging. The back of the room was screened off by a wooden screen, in which were a series of glass doors, and these doors opened into partitions, each labeled with a name in that unknown tongue, and each containing a number of objects like the one I had seen taken out of the basket by the giant before we were captured. Pipes surrounded this chamber, and appeared to be distributing heat from a fire in one corner. "'Factory of Majesty!' I exclaimed. "'Wellspring of Immortality! What the dickens do you mean?' "'If you prefer a more prosaic name,' said Hascom, "'I should call this the Institute of Religious Tissue Culture.' My mind went back to a day in 1918 when I had been taken by a biological friend in New York to see the famous Rockefeller Institute, and at the word tissue culture I saw again before me Dr. Alexis Carroll and troops of white-garbed American girls making cultures, sterilizing, microscopizing, incubating, and the rest of it. The Hascom Institute was, it is true, not so well equipped but it had an even larger, if differently colored, personnel. Hascom began his explanations. As you probably know, Fraser's Golden Bough introduced us to the idea of a sacred priest-king and showed how fundamental it was in primitive societies. The welfare of the tribe is regarded as inextricably bound up with that of the king, and extraordinary precautions are taken to preserve him from harm. In this kingdom, in the old days, the king was hardly allowed to set foot to the ground in case he should lose divinity. His cut hair and nail parings were entrusted to one of the most important officials of state, whose duty it was to bury them secretly in case some enemy should compass the king's illness or death by using them in black magic rites. If any one of base blood trod on the king's shadow, he paid the penalty with his life. Each year a slave was made mock king for a week, enjoyed, if he so wished, the royal wives, and was decapitated at the close of his brief glory, 
and by this means it was supposed that the illnesses and misfortunes that might befall the king were vicariously got rid of. I first of all rigged up my apparatus, and with the aid of augers succeeded in getting quite good cultures, first of chick tissues, and later, by the aid of embryo extract, of various adult mammalian tissues. I then went to Bugala and told him that I could increase the safety, if not of the king as an individual, at least of the life which was in him, and that I presumed that this would be equally satisfactory from a theological point of view. I pointed out that if he chose to be made guardian of the king's subsidiary lives, he would be in a much more important position than the chamberlain or the barrier of the sacred nail pairings, and might make the post the most influential in the realm. Eventually I was allowed, under threats of death if anything untoward occurred, to remove small portions of His Majesty's subcutaneous connective tissue under a local anesthetic. In the presence of the assembled nobility, I put fragments of this into culture medium and showed it them under the microscope. The cultures were then put away in the incubator, under a guard, relieved every eight hours, of half a dozen warriors. After three days, to my joy, they had all taken and showed abundant growth. I could see that the council were impressed, and reeled off a magnificent speech, pointing out that this growth constituted an actual increase in the quantity of the divine principle inherent in royalty, and, what was more, that I could increase it indefinitely. With that I cut each of my cultures into eight, and subcultured all the pieces. They were again put under guard, and again examined after three days. Not all of them had taken this time, and there were some murmurings and angry looks, on the ground that I had killed some of the king, but I pointed out that the king was still the king, that his little wound had completely healed, and that any successful cultures represented so much extra sacredness and protection to the state. I must say that they were very reasonable, and had good theological acumen, for they at once took the hint. I pointed out to Bugala, and he persuaded the rest without much difficulty, that they could now disregard some of the older implications of the doctrines of kingship. The most important new idea which I was able to introduce was mass production. Our aim was to multiply the king's tissues indefinitely, to ensure that some of their protecting power should reside everywhere in the country. Thus, by concentrating upon quantity, we could afford to remove some of the restrictions upon the king's mode of life. This was, of course, agreeable to the king, and also to Bugala, who saw himself wielding undreamt of power. One might have supposed that such an innovation would have met with great resistance simply on account of its being an innovation. But I must admit that these people compared very favorably with the average businessman in their lack of prejudice. Having thus settled the principle, I had many debates with Bugala as to the best methods for enlisting the mass of the population in our scheme. What an opportunity for scientific advertising! But, unfortunately, the population could not read. However, war propaganda worked very well in more or less illiterate countries. Why not here? Haskam organized a series of public lectures in the capital, at which he demonstrated his wriggle tissues to the multitude, who were bidden to the place by royal heralds. An impressive platform was always supplied from the ranks of the nobles. The lecturer explained how important it was for the community to become possessed of greater and greater stores of the sacred tissues. Unfortunately, the preparation was laborious and expensive, and it behooved them all to lend a hand. It had accordingly been arranged that to everyone subscribing a cow or a buffalo, or its equivalent, three goats, pigs, or sheep, a portion of the royal anatomy should be given, handsomely mounted in an ebony holder. Subculturing would be done at certain hours and days, and it would be obligatory to send the cultures for renewal. If through any negligence the tissue died, no renewal would be made, 
The subscription entitled the receiver to subculturing rights for a year, but was, of course, renewable. By this means, not only would the totality of the king be much increased, to the benefit of all, but each culture holder would possess an actual part of his majesty, and would have the infinite joy and privilege of aiding by his own efforts the multiplication of divinity. Then they could also serve their country by dedicating a daughter to the state. These young women would be housed and fed by the state, and taught the technique of the sacred culture. Candidates would be selected according to general fitness, but would, of course, in addition, be required to attain distinction in an examination on the principles of religion. They would be appointed for a probationary period of six months. After this, they would receive a permanent status with the title of Sisters of the Sacred Tissue. From this, with age, experience, and merit, they could expect promotion to the rank of mothers, grandmothers, great-grandmothers, and grand ancestresses of the same. The merit and benefit they would receive from their close contact with the source of all benefits would overflow onto their families. The scheme worked like wildfire. Pigs, goats, cattle, buffaloes, and negro maidens poured in. Next year the scheme was extended to the whole country a peripatetic laboratory making the rounds weekly. By the close of the third year, there was hardly a family in the country which did not possess at least one sacred culture. To be without one would have felt like being without one's trousers, or at least without one's hat, on Fifth Avenue. Thus did Bugala effect a reformation in the national religion, and thrown himself as the most important personage in the country, and entrench applied science and task him firmly in the organization of the state. Encouraged by his success, Haskam soon set out to capture the ancestry worship branch of the religion as well. A public proclamation was made pointing out how much more satisfactory it would be if worship could be made not merely to the charred bones of one's forebears, but to bits of them still actually living and growing. All who were desirous of profiting by the enterprise of Bugala's Department of State should therefore bring their older relatives to the laboratory at certain specified hours, and fragments would be painlessly extracted for culture. This, too, proved very attractive to the average citizen. Occasionally, it is true, grandfathers or aged mothers arrived in a state of indignation and protest. However, this did not matter, since, according to the law, once children were twenty-five years of age, they were not only assigned the duty of worshipping their ancestors, alive or dead, but also given complete control over them, in order that all rites might be duly performed to the greater safety of the common weal. Further, the ancestors soon found that the operation itself was trifling, and, what was more, that once accomplished, it had the most desirable results for their descendants preferred to concentrate at once upon the culture which they would continue to worship after the old folks were gone, and so left their parents and grandparents much freer than before from the irksome restrictions which in all ages have beset the officially holy. Thus, by almost every hearth in the kingdom, instead of the old-fashioned rows of red jars containing the incinerated bones of one or the other of the family forebears, the new generation saw growing up a collection of family slides. Each would be taken out and reverently examined at the hour of prayer. Grandpapa is not growing well this week, you would perhaps hear the young black devotee say. The father of the family would pray over the speck of tissue, and if that failed, it would be taken back to the factory for rejuvenation. On the other hand, what rejoicing when a rhythm of activity stirred in the cultures! a spurt on the part of great-grandmother's tissues would bring her wrinkled old smile to mind again, and sometimes it seemed as if one particular generation were all stirred simultaneously by a pulse of growth, as if combining to bless their devout descendants. To deal with the possibility of cultures dying out, Haskam started a central storehouse where duplicates of every strain were kept, 
and it was this repository of the national tissues which had attracted my attention at the back of the laboratory. No such collection had ever existed before, he assured me. Not a necropolis, but a histopolis, if I may coin a word. Not a cemetery, but a place of eternal growth. The second building was devoted to endocrine products and African armors, and was called by the people the factory of ministers to the shrines. Here, he said, you will not find much new. You know the craze for glands that was going on at home years ago, and its results, in the shape of pleuroglandular preparations, a new genre of patent medicines, and a popular literature that threatened to outdo the Freudians and explain human beings entirely on the basis of glandular makeup without reference to the mind at all. I had only to apply my knowledge in a comparatively simple manner. The first thing was to show Bugala how, by repeated injections of pre-pituitary, I could make an ordinary baby grow up into a giant. This pleased him, and he introduced the idea of a sacred bodyguard, all of really gigantic stature, quite overshadowing Frederick's grenadiers. I took advantage of the fact that their religion holds in reverence monstrous and imbecile forms of human beings. That is, of course, a common phenomenon in many countries where half-wits are supposed to be inspired and dwarfs the object of superstitious awe. So I went to work to create various new types. By employing a particular extract of adrenal cortex, I produced children who would have been a match for the infant Hercules, and, indeed, looked rather like a cross between him and a brewer's drayman. By injecting the same extract into adolescent girls, I was able to provide them with the most copious mustaches, after which they found ready employment as prophetesses. Turning my attention to the pineal, I was able to make children sexually mature at seven or eight, like the one who presumably had a pineal tumor described in the Night of the Burning Pestle. These were voted a great novelty, and there was quite a craze for them at one time, but I won't go into details. Tampering with the post-pituitary gave remarkable cases of obesity. This, together with the passion of the men for fatness in their women, Bugala took advantage of and I believe made quite a fortune by selling as concubines female slaves treated in this way. Finally, by another pituitary treatment, I at last mastered the secret of true dwarfism, in which perfect proportions are retained. Of these productions, the dwarfs are retained as acolytes in the temple. A band of the obese young ladies form a sort of society of vestal virgins, with special religious duties, which, as the embodiment of the national ideal of beauty, they are supposed to discharge with peculiarly propitious effect, and the giants form our regular army. The obese virgins have set me a problem which I confess I have not yet solved. Like all races who set great store by sexual enjoyment, these people have a correspondingly exaggerated reverence for virginity. It therefore occurred to me that if I could apply Jacques Loeb's great discovery of artificial parthenogenesis to man, or, to be precise, to these young ladies, I should be able to grow a race of vestals, self-reproducing yet ever virgin, to whom in concentrated form should attach that reverence of which I have just spoken. You see, I must always remember that it is no good proposing any line of work that will not benefit the national religion. I suppose state-aided research would have much the same kinds of difficulties in a really democratic state. Well, this, as I say, has so far beaten me. I have taken the matter a step further than Bataillon with his fatherless frogs and have induced parthenogenesis in the eggs of reptiles and birds. But so far I have failed with mammals. However, I have not given up yet. Then we pass to the next laboratory, which was full of the most incredible animal monstrosities. This laboratory is the most amusing, said Hascom. Its official title is Home of the Living Fetishes. Here again I have simply taken a prevalent trait of the populace and used it as a peg on which to hang research. I told you that they always had a fancy for the grotesque in animals and used the most bizarre forms. 
in the shape of little clay or ivory statuettes, for fetishes. I thought I would see whether art could not improve upon nature, and set myself to recall my experimental embryology. I only used the simplest methods. I utilized the plasticity of the earliest stages to give double-headed and cyclopean monsters. That was, of course, done years ago in newts by Spearman and fish by Stockard, and I have merely applied the mass-production methods of Mr. Ford to their results. But my specialties are three-headed snakes, and toads with an extra heaven-pointing head. The former are a little difficult, but there is a great demand for them, and they fetch a good price. The frogs are easier. I simply apply Harrison's methods to embryo tadpoles. He then showed me into the last building. Unlike the others, this contained no signs of research in progress, but was empty. It was draped with black hangings, and lit only from the top. In the center were rows of ebony benches, and in front of them a glittering golden ball on a stand. Here I am beginning my work on reinforced telepathy, he told me. Some day you must come and see what it's all about, for it really is interesting. You may imagine that I was pretty well flabbergasted by this catalogue of miracles. Every day I got a talk with Haskum, and gradually the talks became recognized events of our daily routine. One day I asked if he had given up hope of escaping. He showed a queer hesitation in replying. Eventually he said, To tell you the truth, my dear Jones, I have really hardly thought of it these last few years. It seemed so impossible at first that I deliberately put it out of my head and turned with more and more energy, I might say almost fury, to my work. And now, upon my soul, I am not quite sure whether I want to escape or not. Not want to? I exclaimed. Surely you can't mean that. I am not so sure, he rejoined. What I most want is to get ahead with this work of mine. Why, man, you don't realize what a chance I've got. And it is all growing so fast. I can see every kind of possibility ahead. And he broke off into silence. However, although I was interested enough in his past achievements, I did not feel willing to sacrifice my future to his perverted intellectual ambitions. But he would not leave his work. The experiments which most excited his imagination were those he was conducting into mass telepathy. He had received his medical training at a time when abnormal psychology was still very unfashionable in England, but had luckily been thrown in contact with a young doctor who was a keen student of hypnotism, through whom he had been introduced to some of the great pioneers like Bramwell and Wingfield. As a result, he had become a passable hypnotist himself, with a fair knowledge of the literature. In the early days of his captivity, he became interested in the sacred dances, which took place every night of full moon, and were regarded as propitiations of the celestial powers. The dancers all belonged to a special sect. After a series of exciting figures, symbolizing various activities of the chase, war, and love, the leader conducts his band to a ceremonial bench. He then begins to make passes at them, and what impressed Haskum was this, that a few seconds sufficed for them to fall back in deep hypnosis against the ebony rail. It recalled, he said, the most startling cases of collective hypnosis recorded by the French scientists. The leader next passed from one end of the bench to the other, whispering a brief sentence into each ear. He then, according to immemorial rite, approached the priest-king, and after having exclaimed aloud, Lord of Majesty, command what thou wilt for thy dancers to perform, the king would thereupon command some action which had previously been kept secret. The command was often to fetch some object and deposit it at the moon shrine, or to fight with the enemies of the state, or, and this was what the company most liked, to be some animal or bird. Whatever the command, the hypnotized men would obey it, for the leader's whispered words had been in order to hear and carry out only what the king said, and the strangest scenes would be witnessed as they ran, completely oblivious of all in their path, 
in search of the gourds or sheep they had been called on to procure, or lunged in a symbolic way at invisible enemies, or threw themselves on all fours and roared as lions, or galloped as zebras, or danced as cranes. The command executed, they stood like stalks or stones, until their leader, running from one to the other, touched each with a finger and shouted, Wake! They woke, and limp, but conscious of having been the vessels of the unknown spirit, danced back to their special hut or clubhouse. This susceptibility to hypnotic suggestion struck Hascom, and he obtained permission to test the performers more closely. He soon established that the people were, as a race, extremely prone to dissociation and could be made to lapse into deep hypnosis with great ease, but a hypnosis in which the subconscious, though completely cut off from the waking self, comprised portions of the personality not retained in the hypnotic selves of Europeans. Like most who have fluttered round the psychological candle, he had been intrigued with the notion of telepathy, and now, with this supply of hypnotic subjects under his hands, began some real investigation of the problem. By picking his subjects, he was soon able to demonstrate the existence of telepathy by making suggestions to one hypnotized man who transferred them without physical intermediation to another at a distance. Later, and this was the culmination of his work, he found that when he made a suggestion to several subjects at once, the telepathic effect was much stronger than if he had done it to one at a time. The hypnotized minds were reinforcing each other. I'm after the superconsciousness, Hascom said, and I've already got the rudiments of it. I must confess that I got almost as excited as Hascom over the possibilities thus opened up. It certainly seemed as if he were right in principle. If all the subjects were in practically the same psychological state, extraordinary reinforcing effects were observed. At first, the attainment of this similarity of condition was very difficult. Gradually, however, we discovered that it was possible to tune hypnotic subjects to the same pitch, if I may use the metaphor, and then the fun really began. First of all, we found that with increasing reinforcement, we could get telepathy conducted to greater and greater distances, until finally we could transmit commands from the capital to the national boundary, nearly a hundred miles. We next found that it was not necessary for the subject to be in hypnosis to receive the telepathic command. Almost everybody, but especially those of equable temperament, could thus be influenced. Most extraordinary of all, however, were what we at first christened near effects, since their transmission to a distance was not found possible until later. If, after Hascom had suggested some simple command to a largish group of hypnotized subjects, he or I went right up among them, we would experience the most extraordinary sensation, as of some superhuman personality repeating the command in a menacing and overwhelming way. And whereas, with one part of ourselves, we felt that we must carry out the command, with another we felt, if I may say so, as if we were only a part of the command, or of something much bigger than ourselves which was commanding. And this, Hascom claimed, was the first real beginning of the superconsciousness. Bugala, of course, had to be considered. Hascom, with the old Tibetan prayer wheel at the back of his mind, suggested that eventually he would be able to induce hypnosis in the whole population, and then transmit a prayer. This would ensure that the daily prayer, for instance, was really said by the whole population, and, what is more, simultaneously, which would undoubtedly much enhance its efficacy. And it would make it possible in times of calamity or battle to keep the whole praying force of the nation at work for long spells together. Bugala was deeply interested. He saw himself, through this new mental machinery, planting such ideas as he wished in the brain cases of his people. He saw himself willing an order, and the whole population rousing itself out of trance to execute it. He dreamt dreams before which those of the proprietor of a newspaper syndicate, even those of a director of propaganda in wartime, would be pale and timid. 
Naturally, he wished to receive personal instruction in the methods himself, and equally naturally, we could not refuse him, though I must say that I often felt a little uneasy as to what he might choose to do if he ever decided to override Hascom and to start experimenting on his own. This, combined with my constant longing to get away from the place, led me to cast about for means of escape. Then it occurred to me that this very method about which I had such gloomy presentiments might itself be made the key to our prison. So, one day, after getting Hascom worked up about the loss to humanity it would be to let this great discovery die with him in Africa, I set to in earnest. My dear Hascom, I said, you must get home out of this. What is there to prevent you saying to Bugala that your experiments are nearly crowned with success, but that for certain tests you must have a much greater number of subjects at your disposal? You can then get a battery of two hundred men, and after you have tuned them, the reinforcement will be so great that you will have at your disposal a mental force big enough to affect the whole population. Then, of course, one fine day we should raise the potential of our mind battery to the highest possible level and send out through it a general hypnotic influence. The whole country, men, women, and children, would sink into stupor. Next, we should give our experimental squad the suggestion to broadcast sleep for a week. The telepathic message would be relayed to each of the thousands of minds waiting receptively for it, and would take root in them, until the whole nation became a single superconscious, conscious only of the one thought, sleep, which we had thrown into it. The reader will perhaps ask how we ourselves expected to escape from the clutches of the superconsciousness we had created. Well, we had discovered that metal was relatively impervious to the telepathic effect, and had prepared for ourselves a sort of tin pulpit, behind which we could stand while conducting experiments. This, combined with caps of metal foil, enormously reduced the effects on ourselves. We had not informed Bugala of this property of metal. Haskam was silent. At length he spoke. I like the idea, he said. I like to think that if I ever do get back to England and to scientific recognition, my discovery will have given me the means of escape. From that moment we worked assiduously to perfect our method and our plans. After about five months, everything seemed propitious. We had provisions packed away and compasses. I had been allowed to keep my rifle on promise that I would never discharge it. We had made friends with some of the men who went trading to the coast and had got from them all the information we could about the route, without arousing their suspicions. At last, the night arrived. We assembled our men as if for an ordinary practice, and after hypnosis had been induced, started to tune them. At this moment, Bugala came in, unannounced. This is what we had been afraid of, but there had been no means of preventing it. What shall we do? I whispered to Haskam in English. Go right ahead and be damned to it, was his answer. We can put him to sleep with the rest. So we welcomed him and gave him a seat as near as possible to the tightly packed ranks of the performers. At length the preparations were finished. Haskam went into the pulpit and said, Attention to the words which are to be suggested. There was a slight stiffening of the bodies. Sleep, said Haskam. Sleep is the command. Command all in this land to sleep unbrokenly. Bugala leapt up with an exclamation, but the induction had already begun. We, with our metal coverings, were immune, but Bugala was struck by the full force of the mental current. He sank back on his chair, helpless. For a few minutes his extraordinary will resisted the suggestion. Although he could not move, his angry eyes were open, but at length he succumbed, and he too slept. We lost no time in starting, and made good progress through the silent country. The people were sitting about like wax figures. Women sat asleep by their milk pails, the cow by this time far away. Fat-bellied naked children slept at their games. The houses were full of sleepers sleeping upright round their food, recalling Wordsworth's famous party in a parlor. So we went on, 
feeling pretty queer and scarcely believing in this morphic state into which we had plunged a nation. Finally, the frontier was reached, where, with extreme elation, we passed an immobile and gigantic frontier guard. A few miles further on, we had a good solid meal and a doze. Our kit was rather heavy, and we decided to jettison some superfluous weight in the shape of some food, specimens, and our metal headgear, or mind protectors, which at this distance, and with the hypnosis wearing a little thin, were, we thought, no longer necessary. About nightfall on the third day, Haskam suddenly stopped and turned his head. "'What's the matter?' I said. "'Have you seen a lion?' His reply was completely unexpected. "'No. I was just wondering whether really I ought not to go back again.' "'Go back again?' I cried. What in the name of God Almighty do you want to do that for? It suddenly struck me that I ought to, he said, about five minutes ago. And really, when one comes to think of it, I don't suppose I shall ever get such a chance of research again. What's more, this is a dangerous journey to the coast, and I don't expect we shall get through alive. I was thoroughly upset and put out, and told him so. And then, suddenly, for a few moments, I felt I must go back, too. It was like that old friend of our boyhood, the voice of conscience. Yes, to be sure, we ought to go back, I thought with fervor. But suddenly checking myself as the thought came under the play of reason, why should we go back? All sorts of reasons were proffered, as it were by unseen hands reaching up out of the hidden parts of me. And then I realized what had happened. Bugala had waked up. He had wiped out the suggestion we had given to the superconsciousness, and in its place put in another. I could see him thinking it out, the cunning devil. One must give him credit for brains. And hear him, after making his passes, whisper to the nation in prescribed form his new suggestion. Will to return. Return. For most of the inhabitants, the command would have no meaning, for they would have been already at home. Doubtless some young men out on the hills, or truant children, or girls run off in secret to meet their lovers, were even now returning, stiffly and in somnambulistic trance, to their homes. It was only for them that the new command of the superconsciousness had any meaning, and for us. I am putting it in a long and discursive way. At the moment, I simply saw what had happened in a flash. I told Haskam. I showed him it must be so, that nothing else would account for the sudden change. I begged and implored him to use his reason, to stick to his decision and to come on. How I regretted that, in our desire to discard all useless weight, we had left behind our metal telepathy-proof head coverings. But Haskam would not, or could not, see my point. I suppose he was much more imbued with all the feelings and spirit of the country, and so more susceptible. However that may be, he was immovable. He must go back. He knew it. He saw it clearly. It was his sacred duty, and much other similar rubbish. All this time the suggestion was attacking me too, and finally I felt that if I did not put more distance between me and that unisonic battery of will— I should succumb as well as he. Haskam, I said, I am going on. For God's sake, come with me. And I shouldered my pack and set off. He was shaken, I saw, and came a few steps after me. But finally he turned, and, in spite of my frequent pauses and shouts to him to follow, made off in the direction we had come. I could assure you that it was with a gloomy soul that I continued my solitary way. I shall not bore you with my adventures. Suffice it to say that at last I got to a white outpost, weak with fatigue and poor food and fever. I kept very quiet about my adventures, only giving out that our expedition had lost its way and that my men had run away or been killed by the local tribes. At last I reached England, but I was a broken man, and a profound gloom had invaded my mind at the thought of Haskam and the way he had been caught in his own net. I never found out what happened to him, and I do not suppose that I am likely to find out now. 
You may ask why I did not try to organize a rescue expedition, or why, at least, I did not bring Haskam's discoveries before the Royal Society or the Metaphysical Institute. I can only repeat that I was a broken man. I did not expect to be believed. I was not at all sure that I could repeat our results, even on the same human material, much less with men of another race. I dreaded ridicule, and finally I was tormented by doubts as to whether the knowledge of mass telepathy would not be a curse rather than a blessing to mankind. However, I am an oldish man now, and, what is more, old for my years. I want to get the story off my chest. Besides, old men like sermonizing, and you must forgive, gentle reader, the sermonical tone which I now feel I must take. The question I want to raise is this. Dr. Haskam attained to an unsurpassed power in a number of the applications of science. But to what end did all this power serve? It is the merest cant and twaddle to go on asserting, as most of our press and people continue to do, that increase of scientific knowledge and power must in itself be good. I commend to the great public the obvious moral of my story, and ask them to think what they propose to do with the power which is gradually being accumulated for them by the labors of those who labor because they like power, or because they want to find the truth about how things work. End of the Tissue Culture King by Julian Huxley Read by Brian Fullen, Plano, Texas, July 2024Mr. Loneliness by Henry Slazar From Super Science Fiction, February 1957 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman It is lonely out there in space. Very very lonely a man needs to see a human face to hear a human voice so visitors have been sent out somehow by some means mr loneliness by henry slazar there were winds on the asteroid and they blew in threads of heat and cold chilling your feet and dampening your brow with sweat the man shivered and cursed when the winds blew, condemning the freak currents of space, damning the authorities which had anchored him to this lonely outpost. If you could only feel them, he said intensely to the three men on the other side of the room. No, thanks, said Briggs. He laughed, and the sound was like brass. I feel it in my sleep sometimes the man said moodily staring at the floor it does something to your dreams i have the strangest nightmares maybe it's the rations town suggested with a hint of a wink town was a great kidder trouble with you pace said briggs you think too much too many gadgets out here to do your work for you the authority ought to scrap some of these robot controls and get you to use your hands it's a great cure for the doldrums you know murchison the third man looked grave in my opinion he said judiciously we need a better rotation system out here how long have you been observing on gt8 one year five months two weeks three days pace looked at nothing Two hours, forty minutes, and five seconds, eh? Town chuckled. You outposters are all alike. Living clocks, every one of you. He nudged Murchison's side. Watch this, Dino. What time is it now, Pace? No fair looking. Sixteen hundred plus twenty, the man answered dully. Town checked his wrist. On the button, he said gleefully. You've really got a talent for it on this job. 
Use your hands, Briggs insisted. Get out and dig. Plant something. Build something. Make yourself some furniture. Murchison frowned. Not so fast, Freddy. He took a folded paper from his hip pocket and whispered something to the man by his side. Spec sheet, GT8. Never mind, said Pace. I don't expect you to know the specs on every outpost on the belt. Briggs looked embarrassed. Oh, well, okay, so you can't do planting here. But you could find something to do. You know this fellow Morgan on TW1? He's got quite a project underway. He's building a miniature Earth. Town giggled. Ambitious fellow. Not really, Briggs said earnestly. Got himself a plastic shop, and he's making models of every city on Earth. Fabulous thing. Take a lesson, Pace. The man stood up and went to the viewport of the cabin. I am not a child, Briggs. That's a lousy attitude, Town said cheerfully. Besides, Murchison said solemnly, you've lost sight of your purpose out here. Nuts, said Pace inaudibly. We've got reason to be mighty proud of you fellows, you know. You're the real backbone of the space fleet. You're the men who keep the space lanes safe. You're only happy when you're griping, Town said good-naturedly. It's okay with me, pal. That's the American way, isn't it? He grinned at the other two. Just like the army. Gripe, gripe, gripe. He rubbed the flesh around his middle and yawned sleepily. Then there's the radio, of course, Briggs said. You can always hear a friendly voice. Friendly, Pace smiled grimly. Have you listened in on your control stations lately? Those boys are all business. Well, they're pretty busy, Pace. You have to remember that. Murchison folded his hands into his lap. Busy, Pace said enviously. I know what's eating him, Town said wisely. It's the girl. Pace looked away. Laura is very sorry about not showing up, Pace, Murchison said. It's this rotten virus stuff that's going around. You know how she looks forward to these visits. You bet, Town agreed. There's an outposter on G-70 who's really crying in his beer when we show up without her. The sweetheart of space, the man said sardonically. Oh, come on, Briggs said. You like to look at her as much as anybody else, Pace. She's a good kid. All right, Pace said. Everybody likes to look at a pretty girl, Town said archly. Can't blame you for not being happy with only our mugs to look at. That's really the trouble, isn't it? No, Pace answered. Don't kid me, Town said. Don't forget, I'm the personnel affairs officer. I know what you guys are interested in. That's the big beef on the belt. Dames. Not just that, Pace said painfully. Sure? It's not. It's... Pace looked disgusted. He picked up an object from the table and turned it in his hand. What's that, Pace? The man jiggled it in his palm. A carving. I've been doing some carving. Only this coal-type material. Let's see it. Pace concealed it. It's nothing, he said. That's the stuff, Pace, Briggs said, pleased. Keep those hands busy. Keep your mind off space. And Laura, Town said. Murchison stood up. Well, well, what? Pace glanced up anxiously. Time to focus out, Murchison said. Got a lot of space to cover. But it's only 1,600 plus 30. See what I mean, said Town, checking his watch. It's a sort of genius. We'll be back in a couple of months, Murchison said, gesturing toward the others. We'll have a real long chat then. And we'll bring Laura with us, Town said significantly. Don't go yet, Pace pleaded. Really, Pace, tell me about something back home. 
You get the newscasts, Briggs said. What more can we tell you? So long, fella. Town stood up. It's early, I tell you. Pace dropped the object in his hand. The light glittered on the smooth, plain surface as it fell. It was the bust of a woman, with long, flowing hair. Her chin tilted defiantly, her blank eyes somehow vital and seeing. Then it hit the ground. It shattered into a white powder, and the wind leapt upon the fragments like a hungry animal. "'You're lucky we're staying this long,' Town said, speaking now without a smile. "'You're no fun to pay a call on, Buster. Let me tell you. "'Cut it out, Town.' Murchison's tone was sharp. "'There are fifty guys on our itinerary,' Town said. "'They all have the same problem. "'But you're the bleedingest heart of them all, Pace.' The man glowered. He got to his feet. "'Maybe I'll get lucky in two months,' Town said. Maybe I'll get a nice, convenient virus, too. Town! Briggs touched him on the elbow, and Town shook off the finger angrily. I'm sick of this guy, he said bitterly. Sick of all his stupid complaints. Mr. Loneliness. You dirty groundworm, Pace's voice shook. You rotten! His hands clenched into white-knuckled fists. Watch your step, buddy. Cut it out, you guys. I'll kill you. Pace put a stumbling foot forward. I'll kill you, Town. Town stared at the man. Then he laughed. Go ahead, he said. Try. Pace made an ugly noise. His body crouched, and then he sprang at the laughing figure of this visitor. Instinctively, Town threw up his arms in defense. Pace! Don't be an idiot! The man's arms thrust forward like driving pistons, fingers clenched toward the throat of town. His face twisted into a parody of rage. His motion propelled him half a foot off the ground. He realized his mistake too late. His hands went through and beyond town's throat. His arms slipped through town's chest. He fell heavily through the man's body and hit the ground with a sickening abruptness. He lay there, still conscious. He began to cry, and the sound brought a look of disgust to the face of the shadow he had attacked. What a baby, Town said. Briggs looked uncomfortable. Let's focus out, he said. Right, said Town. In a room back on Earth, a dial was spun and a connection severed. In a room on a lonely asteroid, three spectral images, electronic ghosts on the mission of mercy, faded and vanished. The man pulled himself to his feet and looked around. All was silence. The winds blew. The End of Mr. Loneliness by Henry Slazar The Giant's Return by Jerome Bixby, writing as Robert Abernathy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Earth set itself grimly to meet them with corrosive fire, determined to blast them back to the stars but they erred in thinking the old ones were too big to be clever. In the last hours, the star ahead had grown brighter by many magnitudes and had changed its color from a dazzling blue through white to the normal yellow of a geo sun. That was the Doppler effect as the star's radial velocity changed relative to the Quest 3, as for 40 hours the ship had decelerated. They had seen many such stars come near out of the galaxy's glittering backdrop and had seen them dwindle, turn red, and go out as the Quest Three drove on its way once more, lashed by despair toward the speed of light, 
leaving behind the mockery of yet another solitary and lifeless luminary, unaccompanied by worlds where men might dwell. They had grown sated with the sight of wonders, of multiple systems of giant stars, of nebulae that sprawled in empty flame across light years. But now, unwanted excitement possessed the hundred-odd members of the Quest Three's crew. It was a subdued excitement. Men and women, they came and stood quietly gazing into the big vision screens that showed the oncoming star. And there were wide-eyed children who had been born in the ship and had never seen a planet. The grown-ups talked in low voices, in tones of mingled eagerness and apprehension of what might lie ahead at the long journey's end. For the Quest Three was coming home. The sun ahead was the sun, whose rays had warmed their lives' beginning. Noth Ludd, the Quest Three's captain, came slowly down the narrow stair from the observatory, into the big rotunda that was now the main recreation room, where most of the people gathered. The great chamber, a full cross-section of the vessel, had been at first a fuel hold. At the voyage's beginning, 80% of the 1,500-foot cylinder had been engines and fuel. But as the immense stores were spent and the holds became radioactively safe, the crew had spread out from its original cramped quarters. Now, the interstellar ship was little more than a hollow shell. Eyes lifted from the vision screens to interrogate Noth Ludd. He met them with an impassive countenance and announced quietly, We've sighted Earth. A feverish buzz arose. The captain gestured for silence and went on. It is still only a featureless disk to the telescope. Zost Riliul has identified it. No more. But this time, the clamor was not to be settled. People pressed round the screens, peering into them as if with a naked eye they could pick out the atom of reflected light that was Earth. Home. They wrung each other's hands, kissed, shouted, wept. For the present, their fears were forgotten, and exultation prevailed. Noth Ludd smiled wryly. The rest of the little speech he had been about to make didn't matter anyway, and it might have spoiled this moment. He turned to go and was halted by the sight of his wife, standing at his elbow. His wry smile took on warmth. He asked, How do you feel, Lesra? She drew an uncertain breath and released it in a faint sigh. I don't know. It's good that Earth's still there. She was thinking, he judged shrewdly, of Knopf Jr. and Delza, who, save from pictures, could not remember sunlit skies or grassy fields or woods in summer. He said, with a touch of tolerant amusement, What did you think might have happened to Earth? After all, it's only been 900 years. That's just it, said Lesra shakily. Nine hundred years have gone by there, and nothing will be the same. It won't be the same world we left, the world we knew and fitted in. The captain put an arm around her with comforting pressure. Don't worry. Things may have changed, but we'll manage. But his face had hardened against registering the gnawing of that same doubtful fear within him. He let his arm fall. I'd better get up to the bridge. There's a new course to be set now, for Earth. He left her and began to climb the stairway again. Someone switched off the lights, and a charmed whisper ran through the big room as people saw each other's faces by the pale golden light of Earth's own sun, mirrored and multiplied by the screens. In that light, Lesra's eyes gleamed with unshed tears. Captain Ludd found Navigator Guar Den looking as smug as the cat that ate the canary. Guar Den was finding that the actual observed positions of the planets thus far located agreed quite closely with his extrapolations from long unused charts of the solar system. He had already set up on the calculator a course that would carry them to Earth. 
Lud nodded curt approval, remarking, Probably we'll be intercepted before we get that far. Den was jolted out of his happy abstraction. Uh, Captain, he said hesitantly, what kind of a reception do you think we'll get? Lud shook his head slowly. Who knows? We don't know whether any of the other quests returned successful or if they returned at all. And we don't know what changes have taken place on Earth. It's possible, not likely though, that something has happened to break civilization's continuity to the point where our expedition has been forgotten altogether. He turned away grim-lipped and left the bridge. From his private office cabin, he sent a message to Chief Astronomer Zost Reluel to notify him as soon as Earth's surface features became clear. Then he sat idle, alone with his thoughts. The ship's automatic mechanisms had scant need of tending. Knopf Ludd found himself wishing that he could find some back-breaking task for everyone on board, himself included, to fill up the hours that remained. There was an extensive and well-chosen film library in the cabin, but he couldn't persuade himself to kill time that way. He could go down and watch the screens, or to the family apartment where he might find Lesra and the children. But somehow he didn't want to do that either. He felt empty, drained, like a ship. As the Quest 3's fuel stores and the hope of success in man's mightiest venture had dwindled, so the strength had gone out of him. Now the last fuel compartment was almost empty, and Captain Knopf Ludd felt tired and old. Perhaps, he thought, he was feeling the weight of his 900 Earth years, though physically he was only 40 now, 10 years older than when the voyage had begun. That was the foreshortening along the time axis of a spaceship approaching the speed of light. Weeks and months had passed for the Quest Three in interstellar flight, while years and decades had raced by on the home world. Bemusedly, Ludd got to his feet and stood surveying a cabinet with built-in voice recorder and pigeonholes for records. There were about three dozen film spools there, his personal memoirs of the Great Expedition, a segment of his life and of history. He might add that to the ship's official log and its collections of scientific data as a report to whatever powers might be on Earth now, if such powers were still interested. Ludd selected a spool from among the earliest. It was one he had made shortly after leaving Procyon, end of the first leg of the trip. He slid it onto the reproducer. His own voice came from the speaker, fresher, more vibrant, and confident than he knew it was now. One day out from Procyon, the 33rd day by ship's time since leaving Earth. Our visit to Procyon drew a blank. There's only one huge planet, twice the size of Jupiter, and like Jupiter, utterly unfit to support a colony. Our hopes were dashed, and I think all of us, even remembering the Centaurus expedition's failure, hoped more than we cared to admit. If Procyon had possessed a habitable planet, we could have returned after an absence of not much over 20 years' Earth time. It is cheering to note that the crew seems only more resolute. We go on to Capella, its spectrum, so like our own sun's beckons. If success comes there, a century will have passed before we can return to Earth. Friends, relatives, all the generation that launched the Quest ships will be long since dead. Nevertheless, we go on. Our generation's dream, humanity's dream, lives in us and in the ship forever. Presently, Knopf Ludd switched off that younger voice of his and leaned back, an ironic smile touching his lips. That fervent idealism seemed remote and foreign to him now. The fanfares of departure must still have been ringing in his ears. He rose, slipped the record back into its niche, and picked out another, later one. One week since we passed close enough to Aldebaran to ascertain that that system, too, is devoid of planets. 
we face the unpleasant realization that what was feared is probably true, that worlds such as the suns are a rare accident, and that we may complete our search without finding even one new Earth. It makes no difference, of course. We cannot betray the plan. This may be man's last chance of escaping his pitiful limitation to one world in all the universe. Certainly, the building of this ship and its two sisters, the immense expenditure of time and labor and energy stores that went into them, left Earth's economy drained and exhausted. Only once in a long age does mankind rise to such a selfless and transcendent effort, the effort of Egypt that built the pyramids, or the war efforts of the nations in the last great conflicts of the 20th century. Looked at historically, such superhuman outbursts of energy are the result of a population's outgrowing its room and resources, and therefore signalize the beginning of the end. Population can be limited, but the price is a deadly frustration, because growth alone is life. In our day, the end of man's room for growth on the earth was in sight, so we launched the quests. Perhaps our effort will prove as futile as pyramid building, less practical than orgies of slaughter to reduce pressure. In any case, it would be impossible to transport very many people to other stars. But Earth could at least go into its decline with the knowledge that its race went onward and upward, expanding limitlessly into the universe. Hopeless, unless we find planets. Knopf Ludd shook his head sorrowfully and took off the spool. That was from the time when he had grown philosophical after the first disappointments. He frowned thoughtfully, choosing one more spool that was only four years old. The recorded voice sounded weary, yet alive with a strange longing. We are in the heart of Pleiades. A hundred stars show brilliant on the screens, each star encircled by a misty halo like lights glowing through fog. For we are traversing a vast, diffuse nebula. According to plan, the Quest 3 has reached its furthest point from Earth. Now we turn back along a curve that will take us past many more stars and stellar systems. But hope is small that any of those will provide a home for man as have none of the thousands of stars examined already. But what are a few thousand stars in the galaxy of billions? We have only, as it were, visited a handful of the outlying villages of the universe, while the lights of its great cities still blaze far ahead along the Milky Way. On flimsy excuses, I have had Zost Reliul make observations of the globular cluster Omega Centauri. There are a hundred thousand stars there in a volume of space where one finds a few dozen in the sun's neighborhood. There, if anywhere, must circle the planets we seek. But Omega Centauri is 20,000 light years away. Even so, by expending its remaining fuel freely, the Quest 3 could achieve a velocity that would take us there without dying of senility of aging too greatly. It would be a one-way journey. Even if enough fuel remained, there would be little point in returning to Earth after more than 40,000 years. By then, our civilization certainly, and perhaps the human race itself, would have perished from memory. That was why the planners limited our voyage and those of the other quests to less than a thousand years Earth time. Even now, according to the sociodynamic predictions made then, our civilization, if the other expeditions failed also, will have reached a dangerously unstable phase, and before we can get back, it may have collapsed completely from overpopulation. Why go back then with the news of our failure? Why not forget about Earth and go on to Omega Centauri? What use is quixotic loyalty to a decree 5,000 years old whose makers are dead and which may be forgotten back there? Would the crew be willing? I don't know. Some of them still show signs of homesickness, though they know with their minds that everything that was once home 
has probably been swept away. It doesn't matter. Today I gave orders to swing the ship. Savagely, Knopf Ludd stabbed the button that shut off the speaker. Then he sat for a time with head resting in his hands, staring into nothing. The memory of that fierce impulse to go on still had power to shake him. A couple lines of poetry came into his head as he read them once in translation from the ancient English. For my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the western stars until I die. Lud sighed. He still couldn't say just why he had given the order to turn back. The stars had claimed his heart, but he was still a part of Earth and not even 900 years of space and time had been able to alter that. He wondered if there would still be a quiet stream and a green shady place beside it where a death-weary man, relieved at last of responsibility, could rest and dream no more. Those things went on, if men didn't change them, and a pine forest where he and young Knopf could go camping and lie on their backs at night and gaze at the glittering constellations far away, out of reach. He wasn't sure he would want to do that, though. Suddenly, a faint cushioned jar went through the great ship. It seemed to falter one moment in flight. The captain was on his feet instantly, but then his movements became unhurried. Whatever it was, was past and he had a good idea what it had been. A meteoroid. Nothing unusual in the vicinity of the sun. Though in interstellar space and around planetless stars, such collisions were rare to the vanishing point. No harm could have been done. The Quest Three's collision armor was non-material and for practical purposes invulnerable. Just as he took his finger off the button that opened the door, the inner communication phone shrilled imperatively. Knopf Ludd wheeled, frowning. Surely a meteorite impact wasn't that serious. Coincidence, maybe. It might be Zost Raleul calling as instructed. He reached the phone at the moment when another, heavier jolt shook the vessel. Ludd snatched up the receiver with the speed of a scalded cat. Captain? It was Guardin's voice, stammering a little. Captain, we're being attacked! Sound the alarm. Emergency stations. He said it automatically, then felt a curious, detached relief at the knowledge that after all these years he could still respond quickly and smoothly to a crisis. There was a moment's silence, and he heard the alarm start. Three short buzzes and repeat, ringing through all the great length of the interstellar ship. Knowing that Guardin was still there, he said, Now, attacked by what? Ships? said Guardin helplessly. Five of them so far. Nope, there's a sixth now. Repeated blows quivered the Quest Three's framework. The navigator said, obviously striving for calm, They're light craft, not 50 feet long, but they move fast. The detectors hardly had time to show them before they opened up. Can't get a telescope beam on them long enough to tell much. If they're that small, said Knopflod deliberately, they can't carry anything heavy enough to hurt us. Hold the course. I'll be right up. In the open doorway, he almost fell over his son. Young Knopf's eyes were big. He had heard his father's words. Something's happened, he judged with deadly 12-year-old seriousness, and without wasting time on questions said, can I go with you, Hunt Dad? Lud hesitated, said, All right, come along and keep out of the way. He headed for the bridge with strides that the boy could not match. There were people running in the corridors, heading for their posts. Their faces were set, scared, uncomprehending. The Quest Three shuddered again and again under blows that must have had millions of horsepower behind them. But it plunged on toward Earth, its mighty engine still steadily breaking its interstellar velocity. To a man, the ship's responsible officers were already on the bridge, most of them breathless. To a man, 
they looked appeal at Captain Knopf Ludd. Well, he snapped, what are they doing? Guardin spoke. There are 13 of them out there now, sir, and they're all banging away at us. The captain stared into the black, star-strewn depths of a vision screen where occasional blue points of light winked ominously, never twice from the same position. Knopf Jr. flattened himself against the metal wall and watched silently. His young face was less anxious than his elders. He had confidence in his father. If they had anything heavier, surmised the captain, they'd have unlimbered it by now. They're out to get us, but at this rate, they can't touch us as long as our power lasts or until they bring up some bigger stuff. The mild shocks went on. Whether from projectiles or energy charges would be hard to find out, and it didn't matter. Whatever was hitting the Quest 3 shell was doing it at velocities where the distinction between matter and radiation practically ceases to exist. But that shell was tough. It was an extension of the gravitic drive field which transmitted the engine's power equally to every atom of the ship. Forces impinging on the outside of the field were similarly transmitted and rendered harmless. The effect was as if the vessel and all space inside its field were a single, perfectly elastic body. A meteorite, for example, on striking it rebounded, usually vaporized by the impact, and the ship, in obedience to the law of equal and opposite forces, rebounded too. But since its mass was so much greater, its deflection was negligible. The people in the Quest Three would have felt nothing at all of the vicious onslaught being hurled against them, save that their inertialist drive at its normal thrust of 200 gravities was intentionally operating at one-half of 1% 1 efficiency to provide the illusion of earthly gravitation. One of the officers said shakily, It's as if they've been lying in wait for us. But why on earth? That, said the captain grimly, is what we have to find out. Why on earth? At least, I suspect the answer's there. The Quest Three bored steadily on through space, decelerating. Even if one were no fatalist, there seemed no reason to stop decelerating or change course. There was nowhere else to go, and too little fuel left if there had been. Come what may, this was journey's end perhaps in a more violent and final way than had been anticipated. All around wheeled the pygmy enemies, circling, maneuvering, and attacking, always attacking with a senseless fury of maddened hornets. The interstellar ship bore no offensive weapons, but suddenly on one of the vision screens a speck of light flared into nova brilliance, dazzling the watchers for the brief moment in which its very atoms were torn apart. Knopf Jr., whooped ecstatically and then subsided warily, but no one was paying attention to him. The men on the Quest Three's bridge looked questions at each other as the thought of help from outside flashed into many minds at once. But Captain Ludd said soberly, it must have caught one of their own shots reflected, maybe its own if it scored too direct a hit. He studied the data so far gathered. A few blurred pictures had been got, which showed cylindrical spaceships much like Quest Three, except that they were rocket-propelled and of far lesser size. Their size was hard to ascertain because you needed to know their distance and speed. But detector beam echoes gave the distance, and likewise, by the Doppler effect, the velocity of directly receding or approaching ships. It was apparent that the enemy vessels were even smaller than Guardin had first supposed, not large enough, to hold even one man. Tiny, deadly hornets with a colossal sting. Robot craft, no doubt, said Knopf Ludd. But a chill ran down his spine as it occurred to him that perhaps the attackers weren't of human origin. They had seen no recognizable life in the part of the galaxy they had explored, but one of the other quests might have encountered and been traced home by some unhuman race that was greedy and able to conquer. It became evident, too, that the bombardment was being kept up by a constant arrival of fresh attackers, 
while others raced away into space, presumably returning to base to replenish their ammunition. That argued a planned and prepared interception, with virulent hatred behind it. Elsa's lug, the gravitic engineer, calculated dismally, At the rate we're having to shed energy, the fuel will be gone in six or eight hours. We'll have reached Earth before then, Guarden said hopefully. If they don't bring out the heavy artillery first. We're under the psychological disadvantage, said the captain, of not knowing why we're being attacked. Knopf Jr. burst out, spluttering slightly with the violence of a thought too important to suppress. But we're under a psychological advantage, too. His father raised an eyebrow. What's that? I don't seem to have noticed it. They're mad, and we aren't yet, said the boy. Then seeing he hadn't made himself clear. In a fight, if a guy gets mad, he starts swinging wild, and then you nail him. Smiles splintered the ice of tension. Captain Ludd said, Maybe you've got something there. They seem to be mad, all right, but we're not in a position to throw any punches. He turned back to the others. As I was going to say, I think we better try to parley with the enemy. At least we may find out who he is and why he's determined to smash us. And now, instead of tight beam detectors, the ship was broadcasting on an audio carrier wave that shifted through a wide range of frequencies, repeating on each the same brief recorded message. Who are you? What do you want? We are the Interstellar Expedition Quest Three, And so on, identifying themselves and protesting that they were unarmed and peaceful, that there must be some mistake, and querying again, Who are you? There was no answer. The ship drove on, its fuel trickling away under multiplied demands. Those outside were squandering vastly greater amounts of energy in the effort to batter down its defenses, but converting that energy into harmless gravitic impulses was costing the Quest 3 too. Once more, Nothlud had the insidious sense of his own nerves and muscle and will weakening along with the power sinews of his ship. Zost Reliel approached him apologetically. If you have time, Captain, I've got some data on Earth now. Eagerly, Ludd took the sheaf of photographs made with the telescope, but they told him nothing. Only the continental outlines were clear, and those were as they had been 900 years ago. He looked up inquiringly at Zost Reliel. There are some strange features, said the astronomer carefully. First of all, there are no lights on the night side. And on the daylight face, our highest magnification should already reveal traces of cities, canals, and the like. But it doesn't. The prevailing color of the land masses, you see, is the normal green vegetation. But the diffraction spectrum is queer. It indicates reflecting surfaces less than one-tenth millimeter wide. So the vegetation there can't be trees or grass, but must be more like a fine moss or even a coarse mold. Is that all? demanded Lud. Isn't it enough? said Zost Reliul blankly. Well, we tried photography by invisible light, of course. The infrared shows nothing, and likewise the ultraviolet up to the point where the atmosphere is opaque to it. The captain sighed wearily. Good work, he said. Keep it up. Perhaps you can answer some of these riddles before. We know who you are, interrupted a harshly crackling voice with a strange accent. And pleading will do you no good. Nothlud whirled to the radio apparatus, his weariness dropping from him once more. He snapped, but who are you? And the words blended absurdly with the same words in his own voice on the still-repeating tape. He snapped off the record. As he did so, the speaker, still crackling with space static, said, It may interest you to know that you are the last. The other two interstellar expeditions that went out have already returned and been destroyed. 
as you soon will be, the sooner if you continue toward Earth. Nofflud's mind was clicking again. The voice, which must be coming from Earth, relayed by one of the midget ships, was not very smart. It had already involuntarily told him a couple of things. That it was not as sure of itself as it sounded, he deduced from the fact it had deigned to speak at all. And from its last remark, he gathered that the Quest Three's ponderous and unswerving progress toward Earth had somehow frightened it. So it was trying to frighten them. He shoved those facts back for future use. Just now, he had to know something so vitally that he asked it as a bald question. Are you human? The voice chuckled sourly. We are human, it answered. But you are not. The captain was momentarily silent, groping for an adequate reply. Behind him, somebody made a choked noise, the only sound in the stunned hush, and the ship jarred slightly as a thunderbolt slammed vengefully into its field. Suppose we settle this argument about humanity, said Knopf Ludd woodenly. He named a vision frequency. Very well. The tone was like a shrug. The voice went on in its language that was quite intelligible, but alien-sounding with the changes that 900 years had wrought. Perhaps if you realize your position, you will follow the intelligent example of the Quest One's commander. Nofflud stiffened. The Quest One, launched toward Octurus and the star cloud called Bernice's Hair, had been after the Quest Three, the most hopeful of the expeditions, and its captain had been a good friend of Ludd's, Nine hundred years ago. He growled. What happened to him? He fought off our interceptors, which are around you now for some time, said the voice lightly. When he saw that it was hopeless, he preferred suicide to defeat and took his ship into the sun. A short pause. The vision connection is ready. Nofflud switched on the screen at the named wavelength and a picture form there. The face and figure that appeared were ugly, but undeniably a man's. His features and his light brown skin showed the same racial characteristics possessed by those aboard the Quest Three, but he had an elusive look of deformity. Most obviously, his head seemed too big for his body, and his eyes, in turn, too big for his head. He grinned nastily at Nofflud. Have you any other last wishes? Yes, said Ludd with icy control. You haven't answered one question. Why do you want to kill us? You can see we're as human as you are. The big-headed man eyed him with a speculative look in his great eyes, behind which the captain glimpsed the flickering, raw fire of a poisonous hatred. It is enough for you to know that you must die. Lud frowned darkly. Then an incredible light burst in his brain. He stared at the pictured figure with quite new and indescribable sensations. You, he said slowly, are not on Earth, as I was assuming. If you were, there'd be a time lag of quite a few minutes in this conversation. You must be on one of those miniature ships out there, which aren't big enough to hold a man. He saw the uncanny hate flare closer to the surface this time. You are clever, said the big-headed man spitefully. Very well, then. In your screen, you see some of the differences between me, who am human, and you, who are not anymore. The main difference which you do not see, is I am 3.62 millimeters high, and you are more like two meters. Nof Ludd was speechless. The man who had just said he was an eighth of an inch tall grinned unpleasantly again at his amazement. Yes, he said. I am one of the new humanity, 
which has replaced your kind on the earth. You are the last of the old subhuman race of giants, which will very shortly be extinct. It's impossible, whispered Lud. But he had to remember that he had been on the verge of deducing the thing himself. The little man folded his arms and gazed at him with mocking superiority. You have the mentality of 900 years ago. Your age would have called size reduction impossible, even though they already had most of the biophysical and genetic knowledge needed. They suffered from increasing overpopulation, but they were blind to the obvious answer. So Earth went through the wasteful folly of launching the interstellar ships. We are descended from dull-witted giants like you. Cautiously, out of sight of the screen, Lud extended a hand and found a pair of memo blanks and a pencil. Without taking his eyes off the magnified, bragging image, he began to write. He thought he had the answer now to this murderous welcome. We have found the solution of the problem of growth, the image was saying. For 700 years now, each generation has been smaller than the one before, so that there is constantly more room on the planet, relatively speaking. And the process still goes on. There are 600 trillion of us on Earth now. In another two generations, there will be a quadrillion human beings only two millimeters tall and no overcrowding. But, the little man snarled venomously, we have no room for you giants. Nauflud sighed. The sagging lines of his face were calculated to reassure the other and his superiors on Earth to whom the sight-sound conversation was undoubtedly being relayed. Lud said tiredly, But you don't have any reason for destroying us. Why not let us land on one of the worthless outer planets and make an attempt to live there? Or, if you will give us a little atomic fuel, we will leave the solar system again and trouble you no more. In exchange, we have a great deal of knowledge, data on the stars of the Taurus Cluster and beyond, to offer. As he spoke, he was beckoning Guar Den to him, handing the navigator the brief order he had scrawled on the pad. The little man laughed shortly. As if we could trust you or wanted your worthless knowledge of stars. No, we will not bargain with giants. The captain said slowly, for there was still time to be gained in order that the gamble he had decided on might have its chance. You're very sure that you can smash us? Remember, we control gravitic forces, a science you have evidently lost. He saw the look of sneering triumph waver a little. Then the image snapped. We destroyed the others. Your screen, whatever it is, is not impenetrable. We have power to break through it. That was true, of course. The dry field would collapse when the fuel ran out, desperately soon now. Lud started to speak again. Then he felt the nearly imperceptible lurch that meant the Quest Three had applied a terrific acceleration at an angle to its line of flight. Guardent had done a quick job. The impacts of enemy fire ceased. The ship's abrupt swerve had temporarily shaken off its rocket-driven tormentors. Almost simultaneously, the image on the screen looked startled. The man turned, as if listening to someone else. So, you've begun a frantic attempt to dodge. It won't help you. His jaw dropped, and he listened again. This time, he was a little longer overcoming his surprise. Knopf Ludd knew what the second message had been as surely as if he had been there, that the Quest Three, far from doubling back, was still heading for Earth from a slightly different angle and was even accelerating. The side thrust had already ceased. That expenditure of fuel reduced the chances, but it had to be risked. The little man faced Knopf Lud again and smiled savagely. 
Whatever you're trying, we're ready for you. No doubt, thought the captain with some satisfaction. He sat up straighter and gazed at the little man. His discouraged air was gone, and the look in his eyes was a distillate of cold, searing scorn. He said, biting off the words with deliberate emphasis to that one and the others who would be listening, You pitiful pygmies. The face in the screen grew darker with rage. It opened its mouth and closed it with a snap. You pitiful pygmies, repeated Nofflud. You're pygmies, not only in physical size, but in everything else. You've thrown away everything that made being human worthwhile, all for the sake of your one pygmy ambition, to multiply your crawling little lives and become more and more at the same time that you become less and less. You've shrunk into vermin. In the end, you'll probably shrink away to nothing and good riddance. With sudden change of pace, he shot out a question. What's the longest wave of visible light? 2,100 angstroms. The answer was mechanical. Then, you. The captain smiled, a smile of weary disdain. I thought so. 600 trillion of you, eh? Crawling around down there in the dark, because you see in the far ultraviolet, and the atmosphere stops those frequencies. You can't see the stars. For thousands of years, men watched the stars and wanted them and were kept trying by sight of them. But you can't see the stars anymore. The face stared at him with great eyes, full of unspeakable hate, and spat a word which had not been in the language when the Quest Three was launched. The screen went suddenly blank. Nofflud turned away, and his eyes fell on another vision screen. Earth was clear in it, dead ahead, a disk so near that land and sea were distinguishable with the naked eye and coming rapidly nearer. The sight cost him a moment's nostalgic pain. Then he thought of the little men swarming ant-like over every square foot of habitable land. Vermin, he had called them. Vermin they were. He found himself, for no sensible reason, counting seconds. He had got to 17 when the screen that showed Earth dissolved into a featureless and blinding glare. At the same instant, a force too tremendous for the senses to register smote the Quest Three. The interior of the ship, everything and everyone in it, seemed to stretch and distort like rubber, as the graphitic field was strained beyond its elastic limit. The lights went out as the drive units claimed the last erg of available energy and shrieked their overloaded protests through the crushing and twisted darkness. But then the lights went on again, and the ship was hurtling free in space. Its people picked themselves up dazedly and tried to understand why they were still alive. Gee, Dad! Young Knopf said admiringly as he dabbed at a blackening eye. What did you do? I didn't do much, said the captain. The fireworks were from our little friends. I just took your advice about getting the other fellow mad, and it worked. They just shut their eyes and swung with everything they had. The boy gazed at the vision screen where the sun was already a star again. He whistled. They had plenty. I thought the heavy artillery must be ready on Earth in case we kept going that way. It was. Enough of it to knock us right out of the system at close to the speed of light. Just how close, I don't know yet. Ah. He took a couple of sheets of figures from the hands of Guarden and devoured them rapidly. He nodded with satisfaction to the anxious faces around. We must have been hit simultaneously by fire from all over one hemisphere and the forces resultant, which is now our course, came out as I had hoped. Our velocity is close enough. The journey will take about 14 years ship time, but most of us can expect to live that long. Where are we going? demanded Knopf Jr., unable to contain his curiosity. Captain Knopf Ludd smiled down at his son with a touch of wistfulness. The memory of Earth 
dwindling into infinite smallness behind, still hurt him. But young Knopf would never know that hurt. And after 14 years, the captain would be about ready to leave his dream in younger hands. He laid an arm about the boy's shoulders and pointed silently to the forward vision screen, to a faint, blurred light dead ahead in its center. Omega Centauri, he said. And there was a new confidence in his voice. End of The Giant's Return by Jerome Bixby Read by Paul Hampton Mr. Penny's Aerial Submarine by E.J. Rath This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mr. Penny's Aerial Submarine by E. J. Rath Again did Theocritus Penny lay down his hammer, so that he might divert both hands to the mopping of his forehead. Mechanically he drew a soiled forefinger along the broad, perpendicular expanse between his eyebrows and his faded brown hair, and then, with a flirt of his wrist, caused it to snap smartly against his thumb and middle finger. After that he took a red handkerchief from his hip pocket and completed the work. "'It's hot, all right,' he said aloud. Particularly was it hot in the back lot, where he sat astride of a tubular thing whose iron plates made the air quiver with their radiation. "'But it'll be cool down there,' added Theocritus, with a friendly glance at the pond that lay lifeless, only a little way off. Then he resumed the hammer, beating noisily and happily on the resounding plates. Now and again he would pause long enough to squint, alternately with each eye, at the sea lion. She was shaping fast. It was altogether likely that she would be ready in a week. Theocritus Penny hoped so, at any rate, because there was no prospect of a let-up in the hot spell. He longed for the inviting coolness of the pond, where he knew there were quiet and comfort, and, best of all, vindication. He felt the need of vindication, especially in the eyes of Mrs. Penny. There was nothing optimistic or imaginative about Mrs. Penny. Although she admitted that the sea lion might go down, probably would, she entertained no hope that it would come up again. Cleaving to that opinion, she was unable to figure how she would be able to keep the farm going, besides keeping house and taking care of five children. Of course, she would say bitterly, it is all right for you to spend your days hammering on top of that thing and cracking all our eardrums to pieces. But it's not digging potatoes, nor hoeing corn, nor educating your children. When she said anything like this, Theocritus would gaze compassionately upon his offspring, collectively known in the Spriggsville school as the Nickel, sigh softly, pick up a hoe, a shovel, or a rake, whichever was nearest, and work the farm. But if Mrs. Penny was called away to the village, something stronger than his own will would decoy him to the back lot, thrust into his hand his ear-splitting hammer, and set him astride of the sea-lion, where, amid the waving billows of uncut hay, he would resume the building of his fortune. Mr. Penny was not indigenous to Spriggsville. He properly belonged in the city, where he made boilers for a living. The country got him merely because the city would not give his lungs a fair chance. Nobody knew better than Theocritus his shortcomings as a tiller of the soil, that is, nobody except his wife. She came from a place where people farmed. She made no particular objection when he built himself a little workshop in the barn, because she thought it would make him more content with his new lot. It was only when Theocritus invested all the cash reserve in a load of second-hand sheet iron that she indicated her disapproval. And when Mrs. Penny indicated anything, no explanations were required. Sheet iron could neither be cooked made into children's clothes, nor employed as a fertilizer for an impoverished earth, however durable it might be. And in Mr. Penny's investment she could see nothing but a harking back to the things which she hoped had been left behind. He was very meek about it all, and tended the farm for almost a week after the sheet iron had been stowed away in the barn, in a contrite effort to restore to the treasury that which had been taken from it. But all the while Theocritus had ideas. 
The sea lion was really an afterthought. In the line of descent, she was a granddaughter. Her original ancestor was a turbine engine by which Theocritus planned to produce an untold amount of power with so little coal that the fuel problem was too silly to consider. The turbine was outwardly a plain cylinder, very neatly riveted. Nobody could beat Theocritus at riveting. His engine was almost finished when he learned that nobody in Spriggsville burned coal, mainly because there was no coal yard in the village, and that it would cost a year's farming to obtain enough coal for a proper series of experiments. Then, too, there was nothing in Spriggsville that needed to be run by a turbine anyhow. So the turbine became father to a water motor, and the transition from a structural standpoint was quite easy. But Spriggsville was also barren of water power, and there was nothing to be hoped for from the lazy pond in the back lot. Mr. Penny was not dismayed, because he had ideas in reserve. For a few days he contemplated the employment of solar energy, but he soon acquired a distaste for that, because his wife was insistent that the only kind of solar energy that would be tolerated around the place was that which made things grow. So he was virtually forced to the building of the sea lion. It was plain to him that there was an enormous demand for submarines. The United States, and the world at large, clamored for them. Not for the militant or defensive things that were as likely to remain on the bottom as come to the top, but for the safe, reliable, commercially economic, and practical ones. That was the word that Theocritus liked, practical. Mrs. Penny sniffed at this clamor of the world, and set against it the requirements of the Penny family, as estimated in vegetables, cordwood, and shoes for the children. "'But don't you see? I'm going to get all of them things,' said Mr. Penny. She did not see. But nevertheless she could not keep the sea lion from coming into being. Even before Theocritus took out the ends of his water motor, he had her named. Sea lions lived out of the water, on it, and in it. And what more appropriate than that she should be built out of it, launched upon it, and plunged under it. He built her somewhat, after some pictures he had seen, but with improvements. She was not more than twenty feet long, and when he put tapering ends on her she had looked like a fat pointed egg. In her middle he cut a manhole big enough to admit his body, and inside of her he built tanks. He made a keel for her so that she would ride with the manhole uppermost, and he manufactured a propeller that could be worked from the inside by hand power. All these things he performed with much devotion and pains. The Penny children were highly pleased, too, for each one of them had the promise of a dip into the depths of the pond in the back lot, into which they had as yet been unable to fall without getting wet. Naturally, Spriggsville kept an eye on the progress of the sea lion. A considerable part of it went down to the Penny farm on the day set for the launching and trial trip, where it sat on the fence, saying little, and watching Theocritus giving his heart's desire the final loving attentions. It was not until the sea lion seemed reluctant to leave the ways that anybody volunteered to lend a hand. She did not slide, as Mr. Penny had planned, but had to be pried into the pond, a tiny American flag waving bravely at her prow. The nickel were the only persons who cheered. The sea lion rode like a cork, yet steadily, because her keel kept her from such frivolities as turning turtle. Mr. Penny could scarcely be blamed for a pleasant feeling of vanity, as he shoved off in a skiff and towed her out to the center of the pond. The Spriggsville people, who had assisted in the immersion, sat on the bank and watched him clamber up her round side after he had hitched the skiff to a ring-bolt. It looked a good deal like riding a barrel when Mr. Penny bestrode the sea lion, but this appearance was speedily dissipated when he slipped down through the manhole and stood for a moment with only his head and shoulders visible. He waved his hands and the nickel cheered again. Mrs. Penny came out of the back door of the house, but when she saw that the children were safe, she disappeared again, thereby disclosing the extent of her interest in the matter. With a final wave of his hand, Mr. Penny sank from sight through the manhole and drew the cover over his head. The Spriggsville people could distinctly hear him clamping it down, and a few shook their heads. Then the sea lion rocked gently, and they knew that Mr. Penny was moving about in her, preparing for the descent. The secret of this descent he had disclosed to nobody except his children, who were really too young to appreciate it. 
In places where they had shipping, it might not have been a secret, but Spriggsville was not maritime, and was, therefore, mystified. Yet, it was all quite simple. Mr. Penny would simply admit water into the tanks, and down he would go. As she rode now, the propeller of the sea lion was more than a foot above the water, but the tank capacity would soon remedy that. Mr. Penny had built the tanks large, for he rightly estimated that the sea lion was almost as buoyant as a big rubber ball, and this left very little room for himself and the crank which worked the propeller. He did not mind, however, being cramped for a while. The trickle of the water in the tanks was music to him. Very gently the sea lion began to settle in the water. The Spriggsville people stood up, inversely as she went down. They watched her until her propeller almost touched the surface, and then the descending movement ceased. Presently the brass pinwheel at the stern began to revolve jerkily, then more steadily and faster as the navigator warmed up, but all the while it was exerting its power against the air, being quite clear of the element in which Mr. Penny had intended it to work. He did not start the propeller until the sound of inflowing water had ceased, and if Spriggsville could have looked through the iron sides of the sea lion, it would have seen him perspiring and puffing and hopeful. But even Mr. Penny, despite his unfavorable point of view, soon became conscious that the sea lion was not moving ahead. There was a lack of resistance as he bent heroically to the task of grinding the crank. It went around so fast that he could hardly keep pace with it. He decided that it would be well to look about before he ran her into some hidden reef. That, of course, on the supposition that she might be moving ahead after all. For the purpose of taking observations, he had provided a little glass window in the combing of the manhole, and now he straightened up and took a peep. The first thing that met his gaze was the placid surface of the pond, and then beyond it he saw the familiar landscape. This was certainly odd, for what he really expected to see was the fauna and flora of his private lake. The interior of the sea lion was stuffy, and he decided to get a breath of fresh air. There was a murmur from the bank as Mr. Penny's head emerged from the manhole, and he looked about. First he swept the horizon with a disappointed glance, and then he craned his neck and gazed over the side. The sea lion was still riding high and securely. He could see at a glance that she had not moved. Yet he was sure that the water tanks were full, and that puzzled him. "'Ain't you going down?' inquired a voice from the bank. "'Oh, yes,' replied Mr. Penny. "'I'm just getting my bearings.' Then he vanished again, and the trapdoor slammed noisily. After an interval of five minutes the lid rose for a second time, and immediately reappeared the head of the navigator. "'Got to enlarge her water tanks,' observed Mr. Penny addressing nobody in particular. Yet he wondered how he was going to do it and still leave room for himself. Silence followed for half a minute, to be broken by the voice of the eldest citizen of Spriggsville. "'What you want to enlarge,' said he, "'is the bottom of the pond.' Mr. Penny stared at him. "'What do you mean?' he asked huskily. "'You're on the bottom,' said the eldest citizen briefly. Mr. Penny's expression plainly indicated his doubt. "'There ain't more than three foot of water in any part of this here pond,' added the voice from the bank, as its owner turned slowly on his heel and started up the hill to the road. Spriggsville followed him, grinning amiably. From his post in the manhole, Mr. Penny watched his fellow citizens trudge up the hill. When the last one had disappeared over the top of the rise, he looked over the side of the sea lion cautiously. The water told him nothing, for it was brown and murky. He climbed out on the deck and slid off into the skiff, where he seized an oar and thrust it downward over the side. Half its length was still above the surface when the mud on the bottom refused to swallow any more of it. There was something drooping in Mr. Penny's figure when he pulled out the oar, almost with an air of impatience, and cast off the skiff. Then he made a little voyage, criss-crossing the pond and circumnavigating it, and every little while plunging the oar downward. After half an hour he agreed with the eldest citizen of Spriggsville. There was no doubt that Mr. Penny's pond made no demand for the services of a submarine. He rested his oars and viewed the sea lion, which lay perfectly still and docile, her flag gently waving at the prow, her manhole yawning to the sky, 
and her propeller looking very obliging but impotent as it glistened in the sunset. "'There's something useful all gone to pot,' observed Mr. Penny with a sigh. "'I certainly can't afford to get this pond dredged.' He heard Mrs. Penny calling from the house and rowed ashore, where the nickel met him and escorted him. "'If you're all through foolin' for the day,' said Mrs. Penny, "'I want some potatoes.' "'Yes, Myra,' said Mr. Penny quietly. He dug a dozen potatoes in silence, and then a second dozen, and a third to the accompaniment of a joyful whistle. Mrs. Penny came to the door and looked at him suspiciously when the whistling began, because she knew that it did not bode any good. She recognized it as a symptom of Theocritus's desire to get back to the workshop. "'I hope,' she said, when Theocritus brought in the potatoes, "'that you've thrown that business to the four winds of heaven.' Mr. Penny looked at her mildly for a few seconds. "'That's just what I'm going to do, Myra,' he said slowly. The next time a Spriggsville citizen visited the Penny farm, he found that the sea lion had come out of the pond. Mr. Penny had accomplished this difficult feat unaided, save by a homemade windlass, and now he had her high and dry. In fact, she hung clear of the ground, either end resting on a scaffolding. Mr. Penny was engaged in boring a hole in the underside and was having a breathless time of it. Mr. Bumble, his visitor, watched for some time before speaking, as if casting about for a suitable remark. "'Too bad about that there pond,' he ventured at last. "'Best thing that ever happened,' said Mr. Penny cheerfully. "'I'm glad you're coming round to look at things that way,' said Mr. Bumble. "'We don't like to have no drowning cases round Spriggsville.' and they ain't much call for anything besides skiffs, anyhow. Mr. Penny smiled mystically and crawled out from under his invention so that he could converse more comfortably. Mr. Bumble, he said, I'm a fortunate man. Mr. Bumble nodded, although he did not understand. The depth of that pond was made just for the purpose of keeping me from throwing away fame and fortune, added Mr. Penny. Going to farm now, are you? said Mr. Bumble who was pitiably devoid of imagination. Mr. Penny ignored the remark and replied, impressively and irrelevantly, Transportation, Mr. Bumble, transportation. What do you mean about transportation? Why, it's the thing, it's everything. Railroads, steamships, wagons, horses, ox teams, people's legs, everything's transportation, understand? Mr. Bumble looked at his legs, which for threescore years had transported him acceptably, and nodded. "'The theory of the world,' said Mr. Penny, sitting down on a box and emphasizing his words with his forefinger, "'is moving things round from one place to another. That's what people get rich at, moving things. That's transportation, and those that can provide it quick and cheap and safe are going to get rich in spite of all they can do to prevent it.' I tried submarine transportation. That's all right. It's a business proposition. She was a success. And Mr. Penny jerked his thumb in the direction of his craft. No doubt about it, she was a success. But she never had no chance in this pond. And it's a blessed good thing she didn't, because, Mr. Bumble, she's been saved by kind providence for a greater field. The bottom of that there pond fooled me, I admit. I didn't have no room to do what I wanted to do. Mr. Penny turned his gaze upward and pointed at the sky above him. But there ain't nothing can cheat me out of plenty of room up there, he said, and he looked at Mr. Bumble in such a knowing way that the gentleman fell into immediate confusion. I don't know what you mean, he said. Aerial transportation, cried Mr. Penny. Mr. Bumble looked at the sea lion, then at her author, and then he shook his head. "'I don't catch on,' he said. Mr. Penny arose and took his visitor by the arm. He led him around under the overhanging stern of the iron craft and pointed upward. "'S-E-A-B-I-R-D,' spelled Mr. Bumble aloud. "'I only had to paint out three letters,' said Mr. Penny, in a pleased tone. "'I was going to call her Sea Gull, but then by calling her Sea Bird I could save the eye,' out of the other name. Besides, it made the name kinder, more general, and impressive. 
Does it suggest anything to you, Mr. Bumble? That gentleman shook his head stupidly. Think, said Mr. Penny. It has a meaning. Sea lions swim in the water, don't they? Well, what do sea birds do? They swim in it too, said Mr. Bumble, brightening. They fly, shouted Mr. Penny, almost losing his patience. Mr. Bumble's jaw dropped, and he regarded Mr. Penny with serious eyes. You don't expect to fly in that there sheet-iron business, he demanded. I do, said Mr. Penny calmly. Inside of it? No, underneath it. Hanging on to it? Riding in a car, said Mr. Penny loftily. I never seen a balloon made out of sheet-iron, said Mr. Bumble. They build them out of cloth or paper or something light. Yes, that is the old-fashioned way, said Mr. Penny graciously. But it ain't my way. But how are you going to make sheet-iron fly? demanded Mr. Bumble. Now that you ask, I don't mind telling, said Mr. Penny, sitting down on the box again. There ain't no problem in making airships float. Gas'll do that. The thing is to get speed out of them. If you try to drive these here flimsy ones more than twenty-five or thirty miles an hour, they'll bust. Cloth won't stand it. They just crumple up. Why? Cause of the wind resistance. They can't stand being pushed against the wind. Now, if you want to get high speed out of airships, they got to stand wind pressure. Paper won't do it. Silk won't do it. What you want is something that won't cave in when you're going a couple of hundred miles an hour or maybe a little faster. Hence, and Mr. Penny poised his finger impressively, iron airships. But you can't get enough gas into that thing to lift a fly, expostulated Mr. Bumble. A popular error, said Mr. Penny. Merely a popular error. This is right where my invention comes in. The reason you have to make them cloth balloons so big is to get enough gas into them to float. So much gas to so much weight, and the gas takes up a terrible lot of room. The thing is to get all the gas you want without taking up too much room, and the way to do that is compress your gas. Mr. Penny paused to watch the effect of his words, and then resumed, Of course, a child knows you can't compress gas into a silk bag without busting the bag, but you couldn't bust that, could you? and Mr. Penny hit the fat side of the seabird a resounding whack. Yes, he added thoughtfully, I figure there's a very large fortune in it. You see, it don't cost much. No railroad tracks to lay, no roads to build, no channels to dredge, just air and plenty of it, and that don't cost nothing. But as Mr. Bumble went off muttering, Mr. Penny knew that the initial cost of the seabird was indeed a very serious matter, particularly if Mrs. Penny got an inkling of it. The ship herself was economical enough because he intended to keep the propeller and the steering and diving rudders just as they were. But there was the gas. Spriggsville had no gas works. It burned kerosene and cordwood. Mr. Penny had to manufacture his own gas, and the raw material would cost him two or three weeks' labor on the farm. He ordered the materials from the city without saying anything about it to his wife, and when they came he smuggled them into the barn. It took quite a while to contrive a compressor, but he finally built one out of an old air pump and set about the task of filling the seabird with the elixir of life. It was a tedious and ill-smelling job, for some of the gas was bound to escape no matter how careful he was and it was a positively back-breaking task to compress it. He had to work by hand power only. Every little while he would go all over the seams of the seabird with a lighted candle to make sure there were no leaks. Before he began to fill her, he took the precaution to tie her fast to the earth, for he did not want her sailing out of the back lot until he was ready to get aboard. He passed stout ropes over her, fore and aft, and fastened them to deeply driven stakes. He planned to give the seabird a reserve supply of buoyancy. When he started, he would let her shoot up straight for five or six miles, and then, if he found the air too rarefied, he would let out some gas and seek a more comfortable level. He figured that she would navigate best at the height of a mile or so, 
because that would give him a free sailing radius of several hundred miles. Nothing within that area stood more than a mile above ground, not even Bullhead Mountain. The day of the start found Spriggsville again at the Penny Farm, watching Mr. Penny making the final preparations. He told off four assistants who were to let go the ropes when he gave the signal, and he cautioned them not to get entangled when the seabird shot skyward at the instant of her release. The frail, lattice-like car that hung from the underbody of Mr. Penny's airship quivered alarmingly as he took his seat in it, but he assured the Spriggsville folks that it was quite strong enough to carry him. He tried the propeller and the rudder and found them working perfectly. The crowd gathered closer as the final moment approached. Mr. Penny's assistants loosened the ropes from the stakes, each keeping a hitch around a peg that could be let go when the word came. The nickel stood in a row, wide-eyed. "'Are you ready?' called Mr. Penny. "'Yep,' said the assistants in concert. One, counted Mr. Penny. The men at the ropes braced their feet. Two, you could have heard a feather drop. Three, Mr. Penny's four assistants cast loose their hitches and jumped back smartly. The forward rope slipped over the nose of the seabird and fell to the ground. The after one also slid off her rounded back, but it caught on the propeller and hung in the loop. The seabird seemed instinctively to know that this was not right, for she did not move. Mr. Penny glanced over his shoulder and saw in an instant what the trouble was. "'Cast off that rope!' he shouted. "'Quick!' A score of Spriggsville citizens jumped forward. Half of them seized one end of the rope, and half laid hold of the other. Simultaneously they bent their backs to the task of releasing the seabird from bondage. The rope tautened, and the seabird quivered. "'Hey, there!' yelled Mr. Penny. The crowd pulled harder, and more people joined it. "'No, no!' roared Mr. Penny, standing up in the car. "'Let go of—' The seabird trembled violently, and the aeronaut was shaken back into his seat. There was a groaning of timbers, then a splintering. Spriggsville gave a final mighty heave. Each group that held one end of the rope determined not to be outpulled by the other. "'Stop!' cried Mr. Penny. "'That ain't—' The remainder of the sentence was lost in a crashing of wood. The scaffolding under the seabird swayed and toppled, and the fat, black body of Mr. Penny's airship hit the ground stern first. Her propeller bit deep into the soil, and she seemed to poise for an instant, her nose skyward, as if irresolutely considering her course. Then she rolled over on her side with a hollow bump, rock backward and forward two or three times, and came to a rest. They unraveled Mr. Penny from the timbers and propped him up against the side of the seabird. He was very white and shaky, but he did not appear to bear the marks of serious damage. Slowly he passed his hand across his forehead, as if trying to recollect something. Then the contact of the iron body of the seabird awakened him with a start. "'Hey, you! Quick!' he called tremulously. Get up on her there, some of you. Don't let her get away. A dozen citizens of Spriggsville swarmed over the seabird and sat astride of her, so that she might not leave the earth without Mr. Penny. Now make fast them ropes again, he ordered. Ah, oh, what's the use, said a man who sat amidships, dangling his legs. They ain't no gas into her. How's that? demanded Mr. Penny sharply. "'Why, look a-here,' said the citizen, and he thrust his arm up to the shoulder into the manhole of the seabird. "'I—I I couldn't have left that open,' said Mr. Penny, flushing. "'Seems to me I remember closing that.' "'Don't believe she ever had any gas into her,' said the citizen cheerfully, as he bent his nose over the manhole and sniffed. "'They ain't no smell of gas.' Mr. Penny fumbled for his bandana and wiped his face. He tried his legs and found that they carried him, although somewhat unsteadily. He viewed his fellow citizens with an air that indicated mild resentment. Then his eyes wandered over the wreck of the scaffolding and the wounded seabird lying inert, and he drew a deep breath. Finally he gazed at the skeptical man who was still sniffing at the manhole. "'All kinds of gas don't smell,' said Mr. Penny contemptuously. "'You come down often there.' 
That was as near to being angry as anybody ever saw the inventor of the aerial submarine. There ain't going to be no ascension today, he added suggestively, so I guess none of you gentlemen needs to wait. Spriggsville remembered its dignity and withdrew, leaving Mr. Penny alone with the seabird and the nickel. It was a week before even Mr. Bumble called around at the Penny Farm. He discovered a surprising thing right in the backyard of the house. There was a great hole in the ground, and in it lay the seabird. Her yawning manhole, its cover removed, came flush with the level of the ground. Mr. Penny was busy with a shovel filling it around her. Mr. Bumble viewed the scene with a puzzled air for a moment, and then his face cleared. I've read about them subways, he began. Mrs. Penny stepped out of the back door and regarded him with displeasure. Maybe you've read about cisterns, too, she said, and then she turned on her heel and disappeared. Mr. Penny climbed out of the excavation and led Mr. Bumble around the side of the house. I'm a-going to let her use it for a cistern for a while. It won't hurt it none, he said in a half-whisper. But what you just said about subways sets me a-thinkin'. There's something in that, Mr. Bumble. Yes, sir, I believe there's a fortune into it. Why, just think a minute. A subway running from here to... Mr. Bumble hurriedly disengaged his arm. I got to do a errand in the village, he said. End of Mr. Penny's Aerial Submarine by E. J. Rath Read by Ted Perkins Magdalen Islands, Canada, July 2024. Super Joe Malloy by Scott F. Grenville. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Super Joe Malloy. Joe Malloy lounged in the plushest chair in his luxurious office. All around him, on the walls, on the ceiling, even in strategic spots all over the floor, there were mirrors. Joe sneered at the place where the mirrors were most profuse. Twenty or thirty perfectly identical Joes sneered back at him. He admired his sneer from every angle, shaping and changing the contemptuous look on his face with his hands, stroking it, much as other young men in a far earlier age had stroked and twisted their fine mustachios. As usual, Joe Malloy was engrossed in his two favorite hobbies, narcissism and indolence. Joe's friends, of which there were very few, could have given you a fairly accurate resume of his character in five words, his sneer and his indolence. In the first respect, they would have been right. Joseph Malloy had been born with a sneer on his face. His whole early life had been centered around that sneer. It had enraged his father, distressed his mother, driven his teachers to tears, his playmates to tantrums. He stopped doing homework at the age of eight, but the teachers passed him on anyway to avoid complete mental breakdown. Gradually, Joe Malloy began to get his way in everything by virtue of his sneer. It was not merely openly supercilious. That was the beauty of it. It was so subtle, so faint, and yet such an open avowal of contempt for the entire human race that try as the people he tormented would to find something in his sneer to charge him with, they never found anything. In a very few years, registration day at Joe's elementary school became a game of Russian roulette, having as the loaded chamber the question, who's going to get little Joey Malloy in his class this year? Finally, when Joe Malloy was 15 years old, the local board of education wisely decided to end Joe's formal education rather than make screaming memes an occupational disease at the local high school. Joe's father welcomed the expelling as an excuse to beat him to a pulp and kick him out of the house. It was not until three days later that the memory of Joe's sneer, enduring through all the punishment he had received, 
made the father blow his brains out with the most accurate German Luger he could buy at the pawn shop on short notice. But Joe's friends would have been wrong in the second instance, for Joseph Malloy was not chronically indolent. In his own profession, Joe Malloy was the most industrious man imaginable, for Joe Malloy was a robot builder. Disinherited by his father, he had made a beeline for the nearest positronics laboratory. The personnel manager had flatly refused him the job when he had told her he had absolutely no qualifications, but she was so disconcerted by his persistent sneer that she had to give him the job just to get him out of her sight. Once in the laboratory, He had gone right to work learning everything there was to know about robots, scorning all help from the other technicians. Since he held other scientists, past or present, in an ineffable contempt, he had to learn everything by experience instead of studying what his merely human predecessors had done. He was so empirical that he learned all about alternating current by deliberately sticking a wet finger in a light socket again and again. He made mistakes at first, of course. In fact, he ruined several thousand dollars worth of laboratory equipment during his apprenticeship. But his amazing sneer conquered all, and he was soon recognized as the most brilliant and the most conceited man in the field of positronics. Now Joe Malloy was lounging in a plush office chair, cultivating to near perfection his already mature sneer, and suddenly feeling maddeningly thirsty. Robot, he said. A startlingly human-looking robot seemed to materialize instantaneously from nowhere. How might thy humble servant serve thee, O magnificent master? It inquired, bowing so low that it's partially but metallic nose scratched the rich mahogany floor. "'What took you so long, you damned fool?' asked Joe. "'I apologize, gracious master. I am incompetent and worthless.' "'Get me a drink, you bucket of bolts,' said Joe. "'I am grateful for a chance to serve thee, benevolent master.' replied the robot in its monotonous Uncle Tom patter, and made another floor-scratching bow. Then it groveled out of the room. That robot is getting too slave-like, said Joe to himself after the robot had left. All my robots seem to be that way. They do exactly what I tell them to, and degrade themselves sickeningly before me. All the people I've ever known seem to be that way, too. I wish I could find at least one mind equal to my own to clash with. Then I could have a real fight for once. None of this bowing and scraping. Just then the robot entered with a Manhattan, made its usual floor-gouging bow, and scraped its metal feet to get Joe's attention. Joe turned to glare at the mechanical minion. Robot? Yes, omnipotent maths. The robot began but Joe cut it off. Get over to the laboratory and blow yourself up, and find an empty corner where you won't do too much damage. Master, I am happy for the chance to give my life. Never mind that, you glorified erector set. Do as I say. Yes, master. The robot hazarded a slight bow but forgot to crawl out of the room on its hands and knees in its eagerness to follow its master's orders. Joe Malloy leaped to his feet. In the moment of his excitement, he forgot that melodrama is a human weakness, and he became melodramatic himself. Even his incorruptible sneer faded slightly as his excitement grew. I must find someone with a mind equal or superior to mine, he told himself. Now, who has a mind equal to mine? Obviously no one but me. Therefore, I must find someone with a mind superior to mine. Now, who is superior to me? For the first time in his life, Joe Malloy was confronted by what seemed an unanswerable question. 
Joe's train of thought was interrupted by a deafening explosion from the laboratory as his latest robot jubilantly committed suicide. The building shook violently for a few seconds, then subsided. To his great surprise, he was able to answer his question. Of course, since the only thing equal to me is me, the only thing superior to me would be a super me, a super ego. I'll build a super robot with all my magnificent qualities, only magnified a thousand times. I'll build a super Joe Malloy. He ran the letters together to make it one word. Super Joe Malloy. He dashed up to his laboratory, cleaned up the mess his over-eager robot had made in killing itself, and went feverishly to work on his new project, learning the necessary techniques by experience, of course, and applying them to his super robot. He made some mistakes at first, of course, but in three weeks and six days, Super Joe Malloy was ready for its debut in robot society. Not one to miss a chance to impress mere humans with his genius, Joe invited the world's greatest positronics experts to the unveiling of Super Joe Malloy. There was a tense air of excitement as Joe pulled the lever that removed the big black curtain in front of the robot and started the activation machine. When they saw Super Gemeloid, the experts gasped with envy. It was impossible to tell the super robot from a human. Its limbs, torso, and head were so well proportioned and done in such fine detail that anyone in the room not in the know would have sworn that it was a human being. There were even fingerprints delicately cut into the super robot's artificial hands. And Super Joe Malloy looked exactly like Joe Malloy, except for the sneer. It was twenty times better even than Joe's own. It was a super sneer. But although the activation machine was working its hardest, nothing happened. The super robot refused to move one solitary mechanical muscle. Joe's guests began to file out once the novelty of the robot had passed. Joe left the room in disgust and went downstairs for a drink. When he returned to the laboratory, Super Joe Malloy was on its feet, examining the laboratory equipment with obvious disgust. In the preceding few minutes, the Super Robot's Super Sneer had grown more perfect, and the robot was fast becoming the very personification of contempt. Why didn't you move around when my friends were here, you heap of junk? Joe asked the super robot. Super Joe Malloy turned to him. I didn't want to display my perfection before mere humans, you distorted blob of protoplasm, it said. Joe Malloy was becoming angry, but he tried not to show it. He downed his drink. Get me another, he told the robot, holding out his glass. The hell with you said Super Joe Malloy. What do you think you are, God or something? Just because you slapped me together with your clumsy butterfingers doesn't give you the right to order me around like some common servant. Now that you've created me, I could do a better job of robot building myself. Now get the hell out of here. Joe Malloy turned on his heel and stomped out of the room. No robot was going to talk to him like that. No, sir. The super robot quietly followed Joe to the door and gave him a kick that sent him sprawling down the stairs. At the bottom of the staircase, Joe whacked his face against the solid oak of the banister. He turned groggily to look at the blurred image of the robot standing defiantly at the top of the steps, with its hands on its hips. For a brief second, the sneer faded from Super Joe Malloy's face and was replaced by an evil, sadistic leer. Joe Malloy recalled the last line of Father William. Now be off, or I'll kick you downstairs. But the super robot was far worse than Father William, a conceited, contemptuous monster. It was totally unlike Joe's warm, humble, self-effacing self. The sneering monster must be destroyed. Joe cunningly enticed the robot to leave the laboratory for Joe's office, where it could admire its sneer in all the mirrors. Sneeringly, Joe wondered why anyone could admire a sneer so much. Without thinking, he used his hand to smooth out the wrinkles in his now slightly worn sneer. 
Then he crept upstairs to his laboratory to barricade himself in there to think of a way to destroy Super Jumbo At last he hit on the answer. A hypnosis machine. The robot is mechanical, so I'll have to hypnotize him by mechanical means, Joe reasoned to himself. He worked day and night, learning the necessary techniques as he went along. He made some mistakes at first, of course, but in four days the mechanical hypnosis machine was complete. Joe found the super robot in the mirror-lined office, where it had been admiring and improving its sneer for the last four days. The sneer was magnificent, but it still lay just one iota short of absolute perfection. Try as the robot would, perfection in a sneer still lay without its grasp. Genius, shouted Joe, to get the robot to turn its head. He turned the dial on the mechanical hypnosis instrument up to full power. You are now in my power. But now, Super Joe Malloy's sneer was completely perfect. With a look of sublime contempt on its plastic face, it took the hypnosis machine, turned it around, and aimed it right back at Joe Malloy. Joe Malloy bowed so low that he skinned his nose on the rich mahogany floor. Yes, master, he said. Bring me a drink, you blot of living tissue, said Super Joe Malloy. Joe Malloy made another nose-skinning bow and groveled out of the room. This human is getting too slave-like, said Super Joe Malloy to himself. I suppose I could rebuild him, though. Joe returned almost instantly with a Manhattan, made his usual nose-damaging bow, and scraped his leather shoes to get Super Joe Malloy's attention. The super robot turned and glared at him. Human? Yes, master? Get up on that slab in the corner. Joe Malloy obeyed. With all the skill of an experienced human builder, Super Joe Malloy began to take Joe's body apart. Joe screamed, but the super robot ordered him, by hypnotic command, to shut up. And Joe obeyed. Super Joe Malloy began to put together a Super Super Joe Malloy out of what had once been Joe Malloy. He made some mistakes at first, of course. End of Super Joe Malloy Read by Brian Fullen, Player of Texas, July 2024The Yes Men of Venus by Ron Goulart. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. The Yes Men of Venus by Ron Goulart. Introductory Note Let me begin by expressing my thanks to the executors of the Arthur Wright Bemis estate for choosing me to complete his unfinished stories of which this is to be the first. Like so many others, I have long been an admirer of the books of the venerable fantasist. Nothing has ever given me the thrill that reading his first novel, Rousseau of the Jungle, in installments of varying length in the old Thursby's All-Star Electrical Fiction Weekly did, unless it was reading the 23 sequels, especially Rousseau's Revenge and Rousseau, Friend of Animals. This present story belongs with Bemis's Planet Adventure Yarns, it was in the winter months of 1929 that Arthur Wright Bemis penned the first of his many science fiction novels. In an era when space travel was little known or speculated on, Bemis had his likable two-fisted hero, Hyacinth Robinson, travel between planets with ease. Hyacinth Robinson, as you may remember, had been standing too near a reservoir in upstate New York, and when the water evaporated, he went with it, eventually drifting to Venus where most of Vandals of Venus takes place. This story was an instant hit, and was soon followed by Vagrants of Venus, Murmen of Mars, Misfits of the Moon, Plundered on Pluto, and many more. Now that many of Bemis's books are freely available, it was felt by his estate that his unfinished work should also be given to the public. So here is the new Bemis we have all been waiting for. Chapter 1. A Minor Cataclysm my heart was heavy as I drifted over the remote reaches of the Pacific Ocean in the atomic-powered Zeppelin the World League of Peaceful Governments had thoughtfully allowed me to borrow in order to show their gratitude for my having ended the Fourth World War several weeks ahead of time. With my lucky discovery of a powerful ray that made gunpowder ineffectual, 
This balloon cruise, as pleasant as it was, had been planned as more than just a dedicated scientific attempt to map the migratory routes of the Arctic curlew. It was to have been, too, my wedding journey. As I followed with my binoculars, the happily paired curlews flapped to warmer climes. I tried to think of some reason for the unpleasant turn events had taken. When I had called for my beloved Joanna on the prior morning, her father, the noted munitions tycoon, John Plunderbund Brimstone, had left not his best wishes for a safe honeymoon, but rather orders for myself and my zeppelin to be thrown unceremoniously from the grounds. All my leaden heart could be sure of was that I would never again walk hand in hand with the handsomest, most athletic, and yet feminine girl in the state of New Jersey. The thought of what I was doing would have brought tears to my eyes had I not been as masculine and manly as I am. For the curlew was the one bird that my Joanna and I always thought of as our bird. But the rapid deflation of my zeppelin vanquished all self-pity from my mind. I was galvanized into action. Placing my binoculars back in their case, I dived without further thought from the gondola of the falling zeppelin and into the placid waters of the Pacific Ocean. Perhaps some well-placed parting shot from one of the minions of Joanna's father had done its slow work and been the cause of the untimely cessation of my means of transportation. I am an excellent swimmer, and so there was no dread on my part of the long swim ahead. However, I had barely covered a mile when I became aware that something was tugging rather forebodingly at my ankle. My impression was that I had caught my foot in the compelling maw of some great clam. Before I could reflect more, the creature had pulled at me so forcefully that my head, the hair of which I wore in a somewhat long, though manly fashion, was yanked below the breath-stopping waters of the ocean in which I had so recently found myself. I fought bravely, being an excellent boxer. An old ring axiom has it that a good big man can beat a good little man. However, most rules of honest boxing were not made with giant clams in mind. For one thing, I could not be sure if I was fouling the creature or not. As I struggled, I became more and more light-headed and giddy. As I drove an excellent jab home to what I hoped was a vital spot of the clam, I suddenly lost consciousness. Chapter 2. The Mysterious Host I came to in a clean white bed with a large handsome man looking down at me. He was a striking fellow. To give you some idea, I will simply say that this man, whose name I soon learned was Lowell Hawthorne, was even better developed and more manfully handsome than myself. "'You've had a bit of a close shave, old man,' he said, gripping my shoulder in a perfectly manly way. "'American, aren't you?' "'Right you are, old man,' he said. "'Mabu, my native boy, Numba, his native boy, fished you out of the briny. "'Scared the simple fellows a bit at first. "'They're not used to finding chaps such as yourself inside giant clams. "'I had some talking to do to convince them you weren't a large pearl or some such thing. "'I believe it is oysters rather than clams that are best known for their pearls,' I said good-naturedly, "'for I took to this handsome, though mysterious, American almost at once. "'Who can tell a native anything?' was his honest reply. "'I suppose I am to be laid up here for a time,' I said. "'A few days,' said Hawthorne, drawing a bamboo chair near to my side. "'If you don't object, I'd like to tell you a few of my adventures. For, if I do say so myself, my life has been both curious and strange.' "'By all means,' I encouraged, being anxious to learn more of this enigmatic man who apparently lived contentedly here among savages and giant clams. "'I can tell by your look,' he began, that you are a man of science, and that you may at first be a bit skeptical. Let me begin by saying that for the past five years, I have been in close radio contact with a man living inside the planet Venus. Inside? I asked. Come, Hawthorne, science is well aware that people live on the outside of that damp, jungleless planet, but inside? Put aside all your scientific learning for a moment, my new friend replied. If you do, you may learn something. At least you will have whiled away your convalescence. So he began the odd and compelling narrative that you will read in the next chapter. Chapter 3. Down and Out on Mars I am the reincarnation, began Hawthorne, of an English priest whose name, if I were to mention it, you would recognize as being as familiar to you as your own. Having lived several lives, I reached this one with more than the usual sense of ennui. I tried many things, shopkeeping, the cavalry, gold prospecting, writing for the magazines. None of these helped, nor could love. For in ancient Egypt I had loved a handsome and sporting priestess named Isis. After her, all other women were anticlimactic. As fate would have it, 
She whom I sincerely and respectfully loved never seemed to get reincarnated during the same era as myself. You know how women are about keeping appointments. One evening toward the end of 1970, I was strolling through Central Park long after the hour when most men thought it was safe. To a man such as myself, a man who fought the Red Indians without a qualm, the worst terrors of Central Park after dark held no dread. Still, I was taken aback when seven youths fell upon me with baseball bats. You have perhaps found, as I did that night, that even a superb physical being is no match for seven men with little respect for the correct way of life, and large clubs. Though I maimed and injured a good number of them, I was nevertheless knocked unconscious. When I awoke and took a step, I bounced twelve feet into the air. Some reappraisal of my surroundings seemed in order. Central Park had surely changed considerably. It was now a great red desert. I took another step and bounced again. Then the awesome truth came home to me. I was no longer in Central Park. I was on Mars. I'm aware that you scientifically inclined chaps talk of space travel as being a remote possibility. You will realize, of course, that in 1970, no such thing was even at the experimental stage. Therefore, I knew I had been transported to the Red Planet by some mystical means there is no way to explain. I was still engrossed in seeing how high I could bounce when three large green men rode toward me, mounted on gigantic hairy horses that boasted two extra sets of legs. The green men themselves were twenty feet high and turned out to have, now that I noticed, an extra set of green arms. This is not the sort of sight someone who has only recently been battered with wooden clubs wishes to see on awakening. But appearances are not always the best indication of the man, and I soon found my green welcomers to be quite decent. By means of a method too complex to burden you with, we soon taught each other our respective languages. The green men were named Jarl Zun, Zin Yurg, and Yex Zurb. I explained to them that I had apparently transmigrated to Mars by some strange means. You picked a bad time to transmigrate, said Jarl Zun, shaking his great green head. Why is that? The three of them proceeded to explain to me as we shared a breakfast of keks, which is rather like our cold oatmeal, that Mars was in the midst of a great depression. It seemed that the head of their government, the Dactor, who is roughly equivalent to two of our presidents, had been wooed into the camp of the more radical element in the Martian society, and instead of listening to his yaks dactros, or well-wishers as we would like to call them, and building up comforting supplies of zog beams, or what we would call death rays, he had foolishly poured the taxpayers' money into Yerb, which is something like our social security. The result was rampant radicalism and poverty, with little or no respect for Goomba, roughly equal to our patriotism. The upshot of this enlightening political indoctrination was that I would have a tough time making my way on Mars at the moment. Zin Yerg and the rest helpfully offered to bat me over the head with zoobs, roughly equivalent to our baseball bats, in the hope that I might then transmigrate back to Earth. I, though having been an optimist in nine out of ten of my previous reincarnations, decided to brazen it out. Stick I would, and albeit I was down and out at the moment I felt I would not be for long. Such was indeed the case, as I will next relate. Chapter 4 The Great Games of Maroom I threw in my lot with the green men who were, it evolved, en route from Maroom, the capital of this country, to enroll in the Great Games. It is difficult for me to find a parallel on our own planet for these Great Games. What transpired at them, as I was to learn only too well and shortly, was this. The bloodthirsty citizens of Maroom flocked to a large stadium, and there witnessed various fellows fighting one another, and also great and ferocious beasts, of which there are many on this depression-torn planet. Should a poor mendicant triumph in one of these gruesome contests, he is awarded a cash prize. This explains why the down and out of Mars flock to Maroom. To Maroom, then, my new friends and I made our way. For, although on Mars I was now called Yar Sud, or Shorty, I still vowed that I would beat any man or beast I came up against in fair combat, especially if there was money involved. We had hardly reached the suburbs of the great and decadent capital when I heard a girl screaming in a tone that indicated her very honor was at stake. Borrowing a sword from Yex Zurb, I jumped from my riding position just to the rear of his saddle and ran toward the scene of the struggle. My green acquaintances had informed me that the green men were not the only race on Mars. There was also a pink-skinned human type, much like myself, only taller. 
Still, I was not prepared, as I dived into the murky, sward-choked alley between two crumbling ruins, to see before me a girl of striking beauty of figure, being pummeled by a large pink man in a leather suit. "'One kiss is all I request,' the man pleaded in a slimy voice that was far from manly. "'One will lead to another,' the girl responded in a tone I admired. "'Soon you will require other favors.' "'One little kiss by Zog.' their idea of God. If you don't kiss me quickly, Dida Taurus, I will have you locked away where kissing is out of the question. Lock if you will, said the brave girl, for kiss you I never shall. I waited to hear no more. Stand, sir, I cried. The young lady does not wish to be kissed. The man was nearly eight feet high, though it was evident that his pursuit of physical gratification left little room for a careful program of physical fitness. "'Beat it, Yar sud he bellowed. "'Do you dare to interfere with a Yak's Tarkas on his appointed rounds?' "'I don't know what a Yak's Tarkas is,' I replied. "'But I know that my blade will cut you down if you don't depart this woman's sight at once.' His only reply was an angry grunt. He then came at me with sword drawn. In my student days in Paris, I'd astounded my teachers with my ability as a foilsman. Fortunately on Mars, they fence in the Parisian manner, and I was soon able to run the pleasure-bent Yaks Tarkas through and then dispose of his body in a pit beneath the ruins. When I returned to the heavy-breathing girl, I suddenly gasped. Isis! I cried, for she indeed it was. My name is Dinotaurus, she replied. I do thank you for aiding me, for your kind act, though. I fear you will incur the wrath of all Maroom. My own Isis, I continued, whom I have not seen for nearly two dozen reincarnations. Don't you remember me? Have you forgotten Egypt, my love? You speak, sir, of love, the girl said in a tender voice. I was about to bring up the topic myself. I feel somehow that even though you are shorter than most, you are a man I could some day marry and kiss freely. I fear I have never met you before. Look, look, I said, beginning to draw a map of the solar system in the dust of the alley with the tip of my recently engorged sword. Look there, I proceeded to explain where the planet Earth was in relation to Mars, and then where Egypt had been. I told of our great love on that spot. No wonder I haven't been able to find you again, I concluded. You've been reincarnating here on another planet. Be that as it may, Isis, we are together again. As you talk, and as I look at your... Handsome face, it comes upon me more strongly that I am fond of you. Isis, however, I am not. Dinah Taurus, a simple shop girl, is who I am. As Dinah Taurus, I sincerely hope you will find your way clear to love me. She was my own Isis, and yet she had no recollection of it. I determined to court her under whatever name she was using. Once you have loved a woman such as Isis, it is hard to shake the habit. Dinah Taurus, you shall be. I smiled. Dinotaurus, I love you and ask your leave to pay court to you. My leave you have had since the moment you leapt into this fetid alley, she replied tenderly. Tell me, by the way, what is your name? My name is Lowell Hawthorne. From behind us, a grim voice spoke. Lowell Hawthorne, we take you prisoner in the name of the city and county of Maroom. A dozen heavily armed men had approached us quietly while we had talked of love. What is the charge? Killing a yak's Tarkas and throwing him in a pit. Come along with us. To my newfound Dinotaurus, I whispered, Just what is a yak's Tarkas, my love? The talent agent for the great games, she gasped as the lawmen carted me away. That is how I came to be sentenced to fight in the arena of Maroom. Chapter 5 In the Dungeons my cellmate in the dark stone room under the arena was a handsome tanned man named Joel Lars. We soon became fast friends, not merely because we were padlocked together, but because we shared a great community of interests, and also believed in the manly virtues and a planned program of daily exercise. We will not be called into the arena for many days, Joel Lars told me. Unfortunate, I said, for I have only now remet a girl for whom I have searched many centuries on many worlds. Too bad, he replied with real sympathy. Speaking of girls, would you care to hear my story? It would help pass the dark hours here. It took place on Venus, which, as you may know, is a planet in this system of ours. 
I am a great admirer of that planet, I said. Please to continue. Of the overall surface of that planet, I know little. Went on Joel Lars. Of its interior, I know only too much. For it is there that the only woman I will ever love, Verl Yonk, is at this moment a captive of the fiendish Yasmin of Venus. How does she happen to be inside Venus? I asked. Let me go back a bit, said Joe Lars. My parents were missionaries, and one fine day they took their spaceship to Venus. Our crewmen proved disloyal, and in a dispute over shorter hours they threw my beloved parents and myself over the side. We were stranded in the steamy jungles, and my parents soon succumbed to the moist living. I, a mere boy of seven, survived and was raised to manhood by the Boogdabs, what the Martians would call Yarsnigs, roughly equivalent to the Earth's great apes. What of the cursed yes-men and your dear Viril Yank? Being raised by great apes has a strange effect on one, answered Joel Lars. It took several years of therapy to completely rid me of the idea that I might be an ape myself. I still dream sometimes that my mother was. Now, as to the yes-men... His narrative was cut short at this point by the arrival of a group of guards who flung our cell open and pulled us to our feet. There has been a last-minute cancellation, one of them, a coarse, hairy fellow, explained. The star gladiator is ill, and you two will have to go on in his place. Closing note. What transpired next would fill a book itself, and that is exactly what my agent has advised me to do with it. End of the Yes Men of Venus by Ron Goulart The Wounded by Philippe Jose Farmer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Wounded by Philippe Jose Farmer. Those Polaroid glasses they give you at the 3D movies were the cause of my downfall. When the show was over, I went into the lobby and stood there a moment while I studied my schedule. I was supposed to go to a big party, given by one of the prime numbers of the 400. I didn't have an invitation, but that never bothered me. Biggest gate crasher in the world, that's me. I heard a gasp, and looked up to see this beautiful young woman staring at me. She had forgotten to take off her 3D glasses, and that, I instantly realized, was the trouble. Somehow, the polarization was just right to make me visible, or, let's say, that I was always visible, but nobody recognized me. The view she got enabled her eyes to make that subtle but necessary shift and see me as I really am. I thought, I'd have to tell mother about this. Then I walked out fast. I ignored her calls. She even addressed me by the right name, though the accent was wrong. And I hopped into a taxi with my violin case under my arm. I told the cabbie to lose the taxi in which she was tailing me. He did, or seemed to. As soon as I entered the penthouse, a house detective seized my arm. I pointed to the violin case under my arm. His piggish eyes roved over it as he munched upon a sandwich he held in his other hand. He was one of the wounded, always eating to stuff the ache and the hollowness of it. Listen, kid, he said, aren't you sort of young to be playing in an orchestra? I'm older than you think, I replied. Besides, I'm not connected with this orchestra. Oh, a soloist, eh? A child prodigy, eh? He was being sarcastic, as many of the wounded are. I could pass for twenty-five any day or night. You might call me that, I said truthfully. One of our hostess's cute little surprises, eh? He growled, jerking a thumb at the tall, middle-aged woman standing in the middle of a group of guests. She happened at that moment to be looking at her husband, he had a beautiful young thing backed into a corner and was talking in a very intimate manner to her. The light was just right, so I could see the flash of green deep within my hostess's eyes. It was the green of a long, festering wound. Her husband was one of my casualties, too, but his clothing covered the swelling of the injured spot. The girl he was talking to was pretty, but she was one of the half-dead. Before the party was over, however, she would come to life with the shock of pain. When I hit them, they know it. I glanced around at the party-goers, many of whom exhibited the evidences of their wounds like the medieval beggars 
who hope to win sympathy and alms by thrusting their monstrous deformities under your nose. There was the financier, whose face-twisting tick was supposed to spring from worry over business. I alone knew that it wasn't business that caused it, that he looked to his wife for healing, and she wouldn't give it to him. And there was the thin-lipped woman whose wound was the worst of all, because she couldn't feel it, and would not even admit it existed. But I could see her hurt in the disapproving looks she gave to those who drank, who laughed loudly, who spilled cigarette ashes on the rug, who said anything not absolutely out of Mrs. Grundy. I could read it in the tongue she used as a file across the nerves of her husband. I wandered around a while, drinking champagne and listening to the conversation of the wounded and the unwounded. It was the same as it was in the beginning of my profession. A feverish interest in themselves, on the part of the unwounded, and a feverish interest in their healers, on the part of the wounded. After a while, just as I was about to open my violin case and go to work, I saw the young woman enter, the one who had recognized me. She still had the 3D glasses. She carried them in her hand now, but she put them on to glance around the room. It was just my luck for her to be one of the invited. I tried to evade her search, but she was persistent. She swept triumphantly towards me finally. She carried a large cardboard box in her arms. She halted in front of me and set the box at her feet. Certain she could identify me from now on, she then removed her glasses. She was very beautiful, healthy-looking, and with no outward signs of her wounds. If it hadn't been that her eyes were so bright, I'd have thought she was one of the half-dead. But there was no mistaking the phosphorescent glow of the warm wound deep within her eyes. I glanced at my watch and said coolly, "'What's on your mind, miss?' "'I'm in love with you,' she said it breathlessly. I had trouble suppressing a groan. "'Why?' I said, though I knew well enough. "'You're the one who did it,' she replied. "'Did you think, recognizing you, I would ever let you go? "'What do you want me to do about it? "'Marry me.' "'That'd be no good for you,' I said. "'I would never be at home. "'I keep all kinds of hours. "'Your life would be worse than that of the wife of any traveling salesman.' Besides, I added, I don't love you. Usually that floors them, but not this one. She rocked with the punch and calmly pointed at my violin case. You can remedy that, she said. Why in Hades should I? Do you think any sane person would deliberately hurt himself in that manner? Am I not desirable, she asked. Would I not be good to come home to? Don't you often long for somebody you can talk to? Somebody who will get your meals and listen to your troubles? Somebody who cares? Well, of course, I've heard those exact words a billion or more times before. Not that they were always directed at me. Nevertheless, there was nothing new in them. And, she repeated, am I not desirable? Yes, I said, looking at my wristwatch and getting uneasy because of the delay. But that has nothing to do with it. When my marriage was annulled, Oh, somewhere back in the eighteenth century, or was it the sixteenth? I swore by all the gods I'd never marry again. Moreover, mother says I'm too busy. Are you man or mouse? she flashed. Neither, I flashed back. Besides, mother is my employer. What would I do if she fired me, become like one of those? I glanced contemptuously at the guests. She knew what I was thinking, for she cried, Look at me, I'm wounded. But am I like them? Am I one of the halt, the lame, the blind? Am I like that detective who swells himself into a gross human balloon because he stuffs the growing void of his hurt with food? Am I like our hostess whose green wound caused her to drive away two husbands because it festered so deep she went into a delirium of unfounded imaginings about them and then got a third who fulfilled the image she'd built up for the first two? Am I like that thin-lipped woman who deep-freezes her wound because she is mortally afraid of pain? And do I behave as some of these women here who throw themselves at every man who might give temporary healing, all the while knowing deep within them that the wound will become more poisonous? Is it my fault if most of these people don't cultivate their wounds, if they grow sickly and twisted and ill-smelling plants from them, instead of the lovely and colorful and sweet flower that grows in me? She seized my shoulders, said, Look me in the eye. 
Can you see what you and you alone did? Is it disgusting, gangrenous, or is it beautiful? And if it does turn poisonous, whose fault is it? Who refused to heal me? Her eloquence was overwhelming. I trembled. I wasn't affected when I overheard other wounded addressing their potential healers thus. But when I was talked to in such a manner, I shook, and I remembered the early days when my first wife and I had tended each other's injuries. Sorry, I mumbled, abashed before this raging yet tender mortal. I must be going. No, you don't, she said firmly. She stopped and lifted the lid from the paper box. I saw it was crammed with those damned 3D glasses. After I tailed you here, she said, I returned to that theater and bought a hundred tickets and with them got these. Now, if you don't come with me where we can at least talk, I'll pass them out and everybody will see you for what you are. And don't think for a moment that those who've suffered because of you won't tear you limb from limb and string you up to the highest chandelier. Nonsense, I mumbled. I felt suddenly shaky, and so unnerved was I that I rushed away from her and out into the hall. All I wanted to do was to get into the elevator, alone and unobserved, and speed away with the speed of light halfway around the world. Do you know, I think that that clever young wench had planned that very move. She knew I'd be so upset I'd forget my violin case, for as I stood fretting before the elevator door, she stepped into the hall and called, Lover! I turned. Then I screamed. No! No! I backed away, my hands spread despairingly before me. No use. The bow she'd taken from my case strummed. The arrow struck me in the heart. Later, when I tried to explain to Mother, I found myself forced to defend myself against her contention that I had wanted the mortal to wound me, that I was putting my own selfish desires above my duties to her and our profession. My argument was weakened by my secret belief that she might be right. Mother raged, but my clever wife, those modern women, showed Mother that she and her son could not alone keep up with the expanding population. A good part of the world belonged to the half-dead, and they would continue to take it over unless we got some speed and efficiency into our work. Mother became convinced. This is why I now have so many helpers hired through a detective agency, and why we all now carry submachine guns in our violin cases, instead of the picturesque but obsolete bow. Modern times demand modern methods. There are so many to be wounded that we just simply must use the spray gun technique. There is no more individual attention, true, but then that never really mattered. What you do with your wound is up to you. Find your own healer. I, Cupid, have found mine, and it truly pleases me. End of the Wounded by Philippe Jose Farmer Farewell Message by David Mason This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barry Howarth Farewell Message by David Mason There was the alien spaceship. It squatted in the middle of the airfield's main runway, in the way of every plane landing and taking off, to the complete confusion of traffic control. The airport people had asked Vigou, politely, to move it. He had looked at them with blank indifference and gone on making notes on Terran marriage rights. Nobody had suggested forcing Vigou to move his ship. The ship looked as heavy as a battle cruiser. It probably was armed, and it did not look as if it could be moved by anything short of a hydrogen bomb. Vigou when told about hydrogen bombs, had smiled and implied that such weapons were about on par with stone axes. The governments of the world treated Vigou with respect and informed their peoples that he was merely a visiting student with no intention of harming them and should be given every courtesy according to the best traditions of hospitality to strangers. So far he had not become angry at anyone. 
It was not too difficult to be courteous to Vigou. He looked reasonably pleasant, the standard number of arms and legs, one head, and only a slight tint of green to the skin. The green tint had caused one restaurant in the southern United States some debate before they would permit him a table, but Vigou had not been angered. He had merely smiled and noted it down in his notes about taboos. In fact, the only thing that made it slightly difficult to be courteous to Vigou was his air of superiority. He paid for services and sample objects and information by trading strange gadgets which could do fabulous things and which were immediately patentable by the lucky owners. But he passed out the priceless gadgets with the air of a civilised man handing out glass beads and useless gimcracks to savages. It was a question how long before someone felt enough insulted by this air of superiority to lose his temper and kill the alien being. The governments of the world were nervously protective of Vigou, trying to postpone and prevent any such murder. They were afraid of a space fleet or police force that might come to inquire what had happened to him if he came to harm. At last, to the relief of governments and to the joy of the traffic control department of the airport where his ship still obstructed traffic, Vigou was about to go home. His ship was filled with photographs, notes and souvenirs. He announced that he had spent enough years in a tour of strange planets to complete his course of study. He announced a farewell speech. Photographers brought cameras to focus on him, standing on the lowered gangplank of his ship, and Colour TV projected his image to the screens of the world. A tallish person, only a little strange and ugly, with a smooth greenish tint to his skin. The photographers finished flashing stills, and the TV sound booms moved in to pick up his voice. The oldest reporter there was named McCann, and experience had made him leathery and cynical. He already knew what Vigou would say. The alien's superior attitude had made it only too clear. Someone reminded Vigou respectfully that he had promised a speech. Yes, indeed, he replied sonorously. His English was perfect. He had spent all of three hours in learning to speak it. You may write in your history books that I think Earth is a pleasant little planet, he went on, but sadly backward and primitive in many respects. I believe that this is caused by the numerous wars and the generally quarrelsome behaviour of your species. He said this without anger, and looked at the crowd and the cameras with a kind of superior pity and compassion in his gaze. If you could only stop this bickering among yourselves with a planet as green and pleasant as this, you could attain a harmony and pleasure of life equal to any of the truly civilised worlds of the galaxy. My home world, for example, abolished wars generations ago. We learned a philosophy of cooperation. He paused and gestured up dramatically at the starry night sky and again looked at the crowd with contempt. Yes, there are many worlds out there which are peaceful, productive and cooperative, but there are also worlds which are dead and shrunken cinders where there had been green planets and thriving races of people who could not give up war. For your sake, I hope that you will be able to change your path, but I think that you do not have the ability and that at last you will reach the end of the path you are on and destroy each other, and perhaps your world also. Each nova that you see in the sky marks the suicide of a race. Our knowledge of these matters is certain. There is never a nova caused simply by accident. Power sources cannot fail this way. Each nova tells us of a war, of the death of a culture which probably thought itself as civilised and yet could not subdue its innate savagery. The reporters scribbled and the cameras whirred. McCann closed his notebook, bored, and gazed at the sky, prepared to suffer through the rest of the speech. His paper could get the words of the speech from the TV. 
McCann had no comment to add. He had heard such ideas before. To the east, in the sky, was the distant glare of the landing lights of an oncoming aircraft. No, not a plane. A star. A star almost fantastically brilliant, brighter than the others, brighter than Mars. Mr. Vigou, a young reporter said excitedly, isn't that a Nova there? He pointed, and everyone looked. Vigou turned, his hand on the gangway rail. They waited and fidgeted as he stood without moving, looking up. After a time long enough for him to have memorised the entire star region, his eyes came down again, and he looked at them blankly, as if he had forgotten why they were there. McCann felt a sudden electric thrill of recognition. He had seen a similar, paralysed look of expression on the faces of men who had just learned that they had made some terrible mistake. He turned abruptly and pushed through the crowd, heading for a phone. The other reporters didn't understand. Not yet. This Nova, one of them said. What was it from? The goo looked up at it. A sun blew up he muttered, five years ago. The light took five years to get here. The microphones barely picked up his voice. Do you know anything about the people who live there, Mr. Vigou? Vigou opened his mouth as if to answer. Then he closed it again. He looked over his shoulder into the spaceship's entrance. A reporter asked, What about the Nova, Mr. Vigou? I was... I was very well acquainted with the people who caused it, Vigou said slowly. Very well acquainted. I cannot imagine why it happened. It was a war, wasn't it, Mr. Vigou? A war? Vigou looked up again and hesitated. Uh, yes, I suppose it was. A moment later he added, apparently without reason, I've been away from home a long time. How long will it take you to get back home, Mr. Vigou? Get back? Vigou looked around vaguely, his shoulders slumped. He looked less alien somehow, and more like the men around him, and more likeable. He looked back to his questioner. Oh, oh, yes, I'm... Uh, I've changed my mind. Uh, you may tell your papers that I've uh, decided to extend my stay with you for, uh, for some time, I think. The youngest reporter asked suddenly, Did the Nova have anything to do with you changing your mind? With this decision, I mean. The tall, greenish man in the odd clothes came down the gangplank and entered the crowd peering about as if he had forgotten the microphones and the cameras he was supposed to be speaking to. Then he saw his object and went through the crowd to him. It was an airport official. Sir, said Vigou to the official, humbly, and suddenly everyone watching knew how well Vigou had known the people of the Nova world. Sir, I believe this spaceship is in your way. Where would you like me to park it? End of Farewell Message by David Mason Recorded by Barry Howarth, Brisbane, Australia The Engineer by Frederick Pohl and C.M. Kornbluth This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Engineer by Frederick Pohl and C.M. Kornbluth The big wheels of tomorrow will be men who can see the big picture, but blowouts have small beginnings. It was very simple. Some combination of low temperature and high pressure had forced something from the seepage at the ocean bottom into combination with something in the water around them. And the impregnable armor around sub-Atlantic oil's drilling chamber 
had discovered a weakness. On the television screen, it looked more serious than it was, so Mulanoff told himself, staring at it grimly. You get down more than a mile, and you're bound to have little technical problems. That's why deep-sea oil wells were still there. Still, it did look kind of serious. The water driving in the pitted faults had the pressure of 1,800 meters behind it, and where it struck, it did not splash, it battered and destroyed. As Milenhoff watched, a bulkhead collapsed in an explosion of spray. The remote camera caught a tiny driblet of the scattering brine, and the picture in the screen fluttered and shrank and came back with a wavering sidewise pulse. Mulanoff flicked off the screen and marched into the room where the engineering board was waiting in attitudes of flabby panic. As he swept his hand through a snow-white crew cut and called the board to order, a dispatch was handed to him, a preliminary report from a quickly dispatched company troubleshooter team. He read it to the board, stone-faced. A veteran heat transfer man, the first to recover, growled, Some vibration thing and seepage from the oil pool? Sloppy drilling, he sneered. Big deal. So a couple hundred meters of shaft have to be plugged and pumped. So six or eight compartments go pop. Since when did we start to believe the CAC research and development hands out? Armor's armor. Sure, it pops when something makes it pop. If Atlantic oil was easy to get at, it wouldn't be here waiting for us now. Put a gang on the job. Find out what happened. Make sure it doesn't happen again. Big deal. Mulanoff smiled his attractive smile. Breck, he said. Thank God you've got guts. Perhaps we were in a bit of panic. Gentlemen, I hope we'll all take heart from Mr. Breck's level-headed... What did you say, Breck? Breck didn't look up. He was pawing through the dispatch Mulanoff had dropped on the table. Nine-inch plate, he read aloud, white-faced. And time of installation? Not quite seven weeks ago. If this goes on in a straight line, he grabbed for a pocket slide rule. We have, ah, uh, he swallowed, less time than the probable error. He finished. Breck, Mulanov yelled. Where are you going? The veteran heat transfer man said grimly as he sped through the door. To find a submarine. The rest of the engineering board was suddenly pulling chairs toward the troubleshooting team's dispatch. Mulanov slammed a fist on the table. Stop it, he said evenly. The next man who leaves the meeting will have his contract canceled. Is that clear, gentlemen? Good. We will now proceed to get organized. He had them. They were listening. He said forcefully, I want a task force consisting of a petrochemist, a vibrations man, a hydrostatics man, and a structural engineer. Co out mathematicians and computer men as needed. I will have all machines capable of handling Fourier series and up cleared for your use. The work of the task force will be divided into two phases. For phase one, members will keep their staffs as small as possible. The objective of phase one is to find the cause of the leaks and predict whether similar leaks are likely elsewhere in the project. On receiving a first approximation from the force, I will proceed to set up phase two to deal with countermeasures. He paused. Gentlemen, he said, we must not lose our nerves. We must not panic. Possibly the most serious technical crisis in Atlantic's history lies before us. Your most important job is to maintain, at all times, a cheerful, courageous attitude. We cannot, repeat, cannot, afford to have the sub-technical staff of the project panicked for lack of a good example from us. He drilled each of them in turn with a long glare. And, he finished, 
If I hear of anyone suddenly discovering emergency business ashore, the man who does it better get fitted for a sludge monkey suit, because that's where he'll be tomorrow. Clear? Each of the executives assumes some version of a cheerful, courageous attitude. They looked ghastly, even to themselves. Muhlenhoff stalked into his private office, the nerve center of the whole bulkheaded works. In Muhlenhoff's private office, you would never know you were 1,800 meters beneath the surface of the sea. It looked like any oilman's brass hat office anywhere, complete to the beautiful blonde outside the door, but white-faced and trembling. The potted palm, though the ends of its fronds vibrated gently, and the typical section chief bursting in in the typical flap. Sir, he whined, frenzied. Section six has been pinholed, the corrosion. Handle it, barked Muhlenhoff and slammed the door. Section six be damned. What did it matter if a few of the old bulkheads pinholed and filled? The central chambers were safe, until they could lick whatever it was that was corroding. The point was, you had to stay with it and get out the oil, because if you didn't prove your lease, Petromex would. Mexican oil wanted those reserves mighty badly. Mulanoff knew how to handle an emergency. Back away from it, get a fresh slant. Above all, don't panic. He slapped a button that guaranteed no interruption and irritably seeking distraction, picked up his latest copy of the new, new review. For he was, among other things, an intellectual, as time allowed. Under the magazine was the latest of several confidential communications from the home office. Mulanoff growled and tossed the magazine aside. He reread what Priestley had had to say. I know you understand the importance of beating our spick friends to the Atlantic Deep Reserves, so I won't give you a hard time about it. I'll just pass it on the way Lundstrom gave it to me. Tell Mulanoff he'll come back on the board or on a board, and no alibis or excuses. Get it? Well, hell. Mulanoff threw the sheet down and tried to think about the damn corrosion leakage situation. But he didn't try for long. There was, he realized, no point at all in him thinking about the problem. For one thing, he no longer had the equipment. Mulanoff realized, wonderingly, that he hadn't opened a table of integrals for ten years. He doubt that he could find his way around the pages well enough to run down a tricky form. He had come up pretty fast through the huge technical staff of Atlantic. First, he had been a geologist in the procurement section, one of those boots-and-leather-jacket guys who spent his days in rough, tough blasting and drilling and his nights in rarefied scientific air, correlating and integrating the findings of the day. Next, he had been the chief geologist, chair-born director of youngsters, now and then tackling a muddled report with theory of least squares and Gibbs phase rule that magically separated dross from limpid fact, or, he admitted wryly, at least turning the muddled reports over to mathematicians who specialized in those disciplines. Next, he had been a raw materials committee member who knew that drilling and figuring weren't the almighty things he had supposed them when he was a kid, who began to see the big picture of offshore leases and depreciation allowances, of power and fusible rocks and steel for the machines, butane for the drills, plastics for the pipelines, metals for the circuits, the computers, the doors, windows, walls, tools, utilities. A committee man who began to see that a friendly beer poured for the right resource commission man 
was really more important than least squares or phase rule because a resource commissioner who didn't get along with you might get along, for instance, with someone from coastwide. And a lot to coastwide the next available block of leases. Thus, working grievous harm to Atlantic in the billions it served. A committee man who began to see that the big picture meant government and science leaning chummily against each other. Government setting science new and challenging tasks like the Billion Barrel Procurement Program. Science backing government with all its tremendous prestige. You consume my waste hydrocarbons, Mulanoff thought comfortably, and I will consume yours. Thus mined, smelted, and milled, Mulanoff was tempered for higher things. For the first, the technical directorate of an entire Atlantic subsea petroleum corporation district and all wells, fields, pipelines, stills, storage fields, transport, fabrication, and maintenance appertaining thereto. Honors piled upon honors. And then... He glanced around him at the comfortable office. The top. Nothing to be added but voting stock and board membership, and those within his grasp if only he weathered this last crisis. And then the rarefied height he occupied alone. And, by God, he thought, I do a damn good job of it. Pleasurably, he reviewed his conduct at the meeting. He had already forgotten his panic. Those shaking fools would have brought the roof down on us, he thought savagely. A few gallons of water in an unimportant shaft, and there set to message the home office, run for the surface, abandon the whole project. The big picture. They didn't see it, and they never would. He might, he admitted, not be able to chase an integral form through a table, but by God, he could give the orders to those who would. The thing was organized now. The project was rolling. The task force had its job mapped out. And somehow, although he would not do a jot of the brain-wearing, eye-straining actual work, it would be his job because he had initiated it. He thought of the flat, dark, square miles of calcareous ooze outside under which lay the biggest proved untapped petroleum reserve in the world. Sector 41, it was called on the hydrographic charts. Perhaps, someday, the charts would say, Mulanoff Basin. Well, why not? The emergency intercom was flickering its red call light pusillanimously. Mulanoff calmly lifted the handset off its cradle and ignored the tinny bleat. When you gave an order, you had to leave the men alone to carry it out. He relaxed in his chair and picked up a book from the desk. He was, among other things, a student of old American history as time permitted. Fifteen minutes now, he promised himself, with the heroic past, and then back to work refreshed. Mulanoff plunged into the book. He had schooled himself to concentration. He hardly noticed when the pleading noise from the intercom finally gave up trying to attract his attention. The book was a study of that Mexican war in which the United States had been so astonishingly deprived of Texas, Oklahoma, and points west under the infamous Peace of Galveston. The story was well told. Muhlenhoff was lost in its story from the first page. Good thumbnail sketch of Presidente Lopez, artistically contrasted with the United States' Whitmore. More in sorrow than in anger, off-the-cuff psychoanalysis of the crackpot Texan Byerly, 
derisively known to Mexicans as El Cacafuego, Firely's raid at the head of a screwball irredentist, their prompt annihilation by the Mexican 3rd Armored Regiment, Byerly's impeccably legal trial and execution at Tehuantepec, stiff diplomatic note from the United States, bland answer, please mind your business, senors, and we will mind ours. Stiffer diplomatic note. We said, please, senors, and can we not let it go at that? Very stiff diplomatic note, and Latin temper flares at last. Mexico severs relations. Bad to worse, worse to worst. Massacre of Mexican nationals at San Antonio. Bland refusal of the United States federal government to interfere in local police problem of punishing the guilty. Mexican third armored raid San Antonio, arrest the murderers, fetid for weeks, their faces in the papers, their proud boasts of butchery retold everywhere, and hangs them before recrossing the border. United States declares war. United States loses war. Outmaneuvered, outgeneraled, outlogisticated, outgunned, outmanned, and outfought. Said the author, The colossal blow this cold military fact delivered to the United States collective ego is inconceivable to us today. Only a study of contemporary comment can make it real to the historian. The choked hysteria of the newspapers, the raging tides of suicides, Whitmore's impeachment and trial, the forced resignations of the entire general staff, all these serve only to sketch in the national mood. Clearly, something has happened to the military power which, within less than five decades previous, had annihilated the war machines of the common form and the Third Reich. We have the words of the contemporary military analyst Osgood Ferguson to explain it. The rise of the so-called political general means a decline in the efficiency of the army. Other things being equal, An undistracted professional beats an officer who is half soldier and half politician. A general who makes it his sole job to win a war will infallibly defeat an opponent who, by choice or constraint, must defend no voters of enemy ancestry, destroy no cultural or religious shrines highly regarded by the press, show leniency when leniency is fashionable at home, display condign firmness when the voters demand it, though it cause his zone of communications to blaze up into a fury of guerrilla clashes, choose his invasion routes to please a State Department apprehensive of potential future entente. It is unfortunate that most of Ferguson's documentation was lost when his home was burned during the unsettled years after the war. But we know that what Mexico's Presidente Lopez said to his staff was, My generals, win me this war. And this entire volume does not have enough space to record what the United States generals were told by the White House, the Congress as a whole, the Committees on Military Affairs, the Special Committees on Conduct of the War, the State Department, the Commerce Department, the Interior Department, the Director of the Budget, the War Manpower Commission, the Republican National Committee, the Democratic National Committee, the Steel Lobby, the Oil Lobby, the Labor Lobby, the Political Journals, the Daily Newspapers, the Broadcasters, the Ministry, the Granges, the Chambers of Commerce. However, we do know, unhappily, that the United States generals obeyed their orders. This sorry fact was inscribed indelibly on the record at the Peace of Galveston. Mulanoff yawned and closed the book. An amusing theory, he thought, but thin. Political generals? Nonsense. He was glad to see that his subordinates had given up their attempt to pass responsibility for the immediate problem to his shoulders. 
The intercom had been silent for many minutes now. It only showed, he thought comfortably, that they had absorbed his leading better than they knew. He glanced regretfully at the door that had sheltered him, for this precious, refreshing interlude, from the shocks of the project outside. Well, the interlude was over. Now to see about this leakage thing. Mühlenhoff made a note in his tidy card catalog mind to have maintenance on the carpet. The door was bulging out of true. Incredible sloppiness. And some damn fool had shot the locks in the ventilating system. The air was becoming stuffy. Aggressive and confident, the political engineer pressed the release that opened the door to the greatest shock of all. End of the Engineer by Frederick Paul and C.M. Cornbluth. Read by Paul Hampton. Let the Ants Try by James McRae. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Yvette D. Let the Ants Try by James McRae. Dr. Selva Gordy looked at the radioactive smear that had been Detroit. Then he looked down at the boiling anthill. Why not? he thought excitedly. Why not? Gordy survived the three-hour war, even though Detroit didn't. He was on his way to Washington, with his blueprints and models in his bag, when the bombs struck. He had left his wife behind in the city, and not even a trace of her body was ever found. The children, of course weren't as lucky as that. Their summer camp was less than 20 miles away and unfortunately in the direction of the prevailing wind. But they were not in any pain until the last few days of the month they had left to live. Gordy managed to fight his way back through the snarled, frantic airline controls to them. Even though he knew they would certainly die of radiation sickness, and they suspected it, There was still a whole blessed week of companionship before the pain got too bad. That was about all the companionship Gordy had for the whole year of 1960. He came back to Detroit as soon as the radioactivity had died down. He had nowhere else to go. He found a house on the outskirts of the city and tried to locate someone to buy it from. But the emergency administration laughed at him. Move in, if you're crazy enough to stay. When Gordy thought about it, it occurred to him that he was in a sort of state of shock. His fine, trained mind almost stopped functioning. He ate and slept, and when it grew cold, he shivered and built fires, and that was all. The war department wrote him two or three times, And finally, a government man came around to ask what had happened to the things that Gordy had promised to bring to Washington. But he looked queerly at the pink hairless mice that fed unmolested in the filthy kitchen, and he stood a careful distance away from Gordy's hairy face and torn clothes. He said, The secretary sent me here, Mr. Gordy. He takes a personal interest in your discovery. Gordy shook his head. The secretary is dead, he said. They were all killed when Washington went. There's a new secretary, the man explained. He puffed on his cigarette and tossed it into the patch Gordy was scrabbling into a truck garden. Arnold Kavanaugh, he knows a great deal about you, and he told me, if Selva Gordy has a weapon, we must have it. Our strength has been shattered. Tell Gordy we need his help. Gordy crossed his hands like a lean Buddha. I haven't got a weapon, he said. You have something that can be used as a weapon. You wrote to Washington before the war came and said, The war is over, said Selva Gordy. The government man sighed and tried again. But in the end, he went away. He never came back. The thing, 
Gordy thought, was undoubtedly written off as a crackpot idea after the man made his report. It was exactly that kind of discovery anyhow. It was May when John de Terry appeared. Gordy was spading his garden. Give me something to eat, said the voice behind Gordy's back. Selva Gordy turned around and saw the small, dirty man who spoke. He rubbed his mouth with the back of his hand. You'll have to work for it, he said. All right. The newcomer set down his pack. My name is John de Terry. I used to live here in Detroit. Selva Gordy said. So did I. Gordy fed the man and accepted a cigarette from him after they'd eaten. The first puffs made him light-headed. It had been that long since he'd smoked. And through the smoke, he looked at John de Terry amiably enough. Company would be all right, he thought. The pink mice had been company, of a sort. But it turned out that the mutation that made them hairless had also given them an appetite for meat. And after the morning when he had awakened to find tiny tooth marks in his leg, he'd had to destroy them. And there had been no other animal since. Nothing but the ants. Are you going to stay? Gordy asked. De Terry said, If I can. What's your name? When Gordy told him, some of the animal look went out of his eyes, and wonder took its place. Doctor? Selva Gordy? he asked. Mathematics and physics in Pasadena? Yes, I used to teach at Pasadena. And I studied there. John de Terry rubbed absently at his ruined clothes. That was a long time ago. You didn't know me. I majored in biology, but I knew you. Gordy stood up and carefully put out the stub of his cigarette. It was too long ago, he said. I hardly remember. Shall we work in the garden now? Together they sweated in the spring sunlight that afternoon and Gordy discovered that what had been hard work for one man went quickly enough for two. They worked clear to the edge of the plot before the sun reached the horizon. John de Terry stopped and leaned on his spade, panting. He gestured to the rank growth beyond Gordy's patch. We can make a bigger garden, he said. Clear out that truck and plant more food. We might even... He stopped. Gordy was shaking his head. You can't clear it out, said Gordy. It's rank stuff, a sort of crabgrass with a particularly tough root. I can't even cut it. It's all around here, and it's spreading. De Terry grimaced. Mutation? I think so. And look. Gordy beckoned to the other man and led him to the very edge of the cleared area. He bent down, picked up something red and wriggling between his thumb and forefinger. De Terry took it from his hand. Another mutation? He brought the thing close to his eyes. It's almost like an ant, he said. Except, well, the thorax is all wrong, and it's soft-bodied. He fell silent, examining the thing. He said something under his breath, and threw the insect from him. You wouldn't have a microscope, I suppose. No. And yet, that thing is hard to believe. It's an ant. But it doesn't seem to have a tracheal breathing system at all. It's something different. Everything's different, Gordy said. He pointed to a couple of abandoned rows. I had carrots there, at least. I thought they were carrots. When I tried to eat them, they made me sick. He sighed heavily. Humanity has had its chance, John, he said. The atomic bomb wasn't enough. We had to turn everything into a weapon. Even I, I made a weapon out of something that had nothing to do with war, and our weapons have blown up in our faces. De Terry grinned. Maybe the ants will do better. It's their turn now. I wish it were. Gordy stirred earth over the boiling entrance to an ant hole and watched the insects in their consternation. 
They are too small, I'm afraid. Why, no. These ants are different, Dr. Gordy. Insects have always been small because their breathing system is so poor. But these are mutated. I think. I think they actually have lungs. They could grow, Dr. Gordy, and if ants were the size of men, they'd rule the world. Lunged ants. Gordy's eyes gleamed. Perhaps they will rule the world, John. Perhaps when the human race finally blows itself up once and for all. De Terry shook his head and looked down again at his tattered, filthy clothes. The next blow-up is the last blow-up, he said. The ants came too late, by millions and millions of years. He picked up his spade. I'm hungry again, Dr. Gordy, he said. They went back to the house, and without conversation, they ate. Gordy was preoccupied, and Terry was too new in the household to force him to talk. It was sundown when they had finished, and Gordy moved slowly to light a lamp. Then he stopped. It's your first night, John, he said. Come down to the cellar. We'll start the generator and have real electric lights in your honour. The Terry followed the older man down a flight of steps, groping in the dark. By candlelight, they worked over a gasoline generator. It was stiff from disuse. But once it started, it ran cleanly. I salvaged it from my own, Gordy explained. The generator? And that. He swept an arm toward a corner of the basement. I told you I invented a weapon, he added. That's it. De Terry looked. It was as much like a cage as anything, he thought. The height of a man, and almost cubical. What does it do? he asked. For the first time in months, Selva Gordy smiled. I can't tell you in English, he said. And I doubt that you speak mathematics. The closest I can come is to say that it displaces temporal coordinates. Is that gibberish? It is, said De Terry. What does it do? Well, the War Department had a name for it. A name they borrowed from H.G. Wells. They called it a time machine. He met De Terry's shocked, bewildered stare calmly. A time machine? he repeated. You see, John, we can give the ants a chance after all, if you like. Fourteen hours later, they stepped into the cage, its batteries charged again, and its strange motor whining. And, forty million years earlier, they stepped out onto quaking, humid soil. Gordy felt himself trembling, and with an effort managed to stop. No dinosaurs or saber-toothed tigers in sight, he reported. Not for a long time yet, Terry agreed. Then, my lord! He looked around him with his mouth open wide. There was no wind, and the air was warm and wet. Large trees were clustered quite thickly around them, or what looked like trees. Terry decided they were rather some sort of soft-stemmed ferns or fungi. Overhead was deep cloud. Gordy shivered. Give me the ants, he ordered. Silently, De Terry handed them over. Gordy poked a hole in the soft earth with his finger and carefully tilted the flask, dropping one of the ant queens he had unearthed in the backyard. From her belly hung a slimy mass of eggs. A few yards away, it should have been farther, he thought, but he was afraid to get too far from De Terry and the machine. He made another hole and repeated the process. There were eight queens. When the eighth was buried, he flung the bottle away and came back to De Terry. That's it, he said. De Terry exhaled. His solemn face cracked in a sudden embarrassed smile. I, I guess I feel like God, he said. Good Lord, Dr. Gordy, talk about your great moments in history. This is all of them. I've been thinking about it. And the only event I can remember that measures up is the flood. 
It's not even that. We've created a race. If they survive, we have. Gordy wiped a drop of condensed moisture off the side of his time machine and puffed. I wonder how they'll get along with mankind, he said. They were silent for a moment, considering. From somewhere in the fern jungle came a raucous animal cry. Both men looked up in quick apprehension, but moments passed and the animal did not appear. Finally, Deteri said, Maybe we'd better go back. All right. Stiffly, they climbed into the closet-sized interior of the time machine. Gordy stood with his hand on the control wheel, thinking about the ants. Assuming that they survived, assuming that in 40 million years they grew larger and developed brains, what would happen? Would men be able to live in peace with them? Would it... might it not make men brothers, joined against an alien race? Might this thing prevent human war? And, his thoughts took an insane leap, could it have prevented the war that destroyed Gordy's family? Beside him, Deteri stirred restlessly. Gordy jumped and turned the wheel, and was in the dark mathematical vortex which might have been a fourth dimension. They stopped the machine in the middle of a city, but the city was not Detroit. It was not a human city at all. The machine was at rest in a narrow street, half blocking it. Around them towered conical metal structures, some of them a hundred feet high. There were vehicles moving in the street, one coming toward them and stopping. Dr. Gordy, De Terry whispered. Do you see them? Selva Gordy swallowed. I see them, he said. He stepped out of the time machine and stood waiting to greet the race to which he had given life. For these were the children of ants in the three-wheeled vehicle. Behind a transparent windshield, he could see them clearly. De Terry was standing close behind him now, and Gordy could feel the younger man's body shaking. They're ugly things, Gordy said mildly. Ugly. They're filthy. The ant-like creatures were as big as a man, but hard-looking and as obnoxious as black beetles. Their eyes, Gordy saw with surprise, had mutated more than their bodies. For instead of faceted insect eyes, they possessed iris, cornea, and pupil. Not round or vertical like a cat's eyes, or horizontal like a horse's eyes, but irregular and blotchy. But they seemed like vertebrates' eyes, and they were strange and unnatural in the parchment blackness of an ant's bulged head. Gordy stepped forward and simultaneously the ants came out of their vehicle. For a moment they faced each other, the humans and the ants, silently. What do I do now? Gordy asked De Terry over his shoulder. De Terry laughed, or gasped. Gordy wasn't sure. Talk to them, he said. What else is there to do? Gordy swallowed. He resolutely did not attempt to speak in English to these creatures, knowing as surely as he knew his name that English, and probably any other language involving sound, would be incomprehensible to them. But he found himself smiling pacifically to them, and that was, of course, as bad. The things had no expressions of their own that he could see, and certainly they would have no precedent to help interpret a human smile. Gordy raised his hands in the semantically sound gesture of peace and waited to see what the insects would do. They did nothing. Gordy bit his lip and, feeling idiotic, bowed stiffly to the ants. The ants did nothing. De Terry said from behind, Try talking to them, Dr. Gordy. That's silly, Gordy said. They can't hear but it was no sillier than anything else. Irritably, but making the words very clear, he said, 
We are friends. The ants did nothing. They just stood there, with the unwinking pupiled eyes fixed on Gordy. They didn't shift from foot to foot as a human might, or scratch themselves, or even show the small movement of human breathing. They just stood there. Oh, for heaven's sake, said to Terry. Here, let me try. He stepped in front of Gordy and faced the ant things. He pointed to himself. I am human, he said. Mammalian, he pointed to the ants. You are insects. That, he pointed to the time machine, took us to the past, where we made it possible for you to exist. He waited for a reaction, but there wasn't any. But Terry clicked his tongue and began again. He pointed to the tapering metal structures. This is your city, he said. Gordy, listening to him, felt the hopelessness of the effort. Something disturbed the thin hairs at the back of his skull, and he reached absently to smooth them down. His hand encountered something hard and inanimate. Not cold, but like spongy wood, without temperature at all. He turned around. Behind them were half a dozen larger ants. Drones, he thought. Or did ants have drones? John, he said softly. And the inefficient, fragile-looking pincer that had touched him clamped his shoulder. There was no strength to it, he thought at once. Until he moved, instinctively, to get away and then a thousand sharp serrations slipped through the cloth of his coat and into the skin. It was like catching oneself on a cluster of tiny fishhooks. He shouted, John, watch out! De Terry, bending low for the purpose of pointing at the caterpillar treads of the ant vehicle, straightened up, startled. He turned to run and was caught in a step. Gordy heard him yell, but Gordy had troubles of his own and could spare no further attention for de Terry. When two of the ants had him, Gordy stopped struggling. He felt warm blood roll down his arm, and the pain was like being flayed. From where he hung between the ants, he could see the first two, still standing before their vehicle, still motionless. There was a sour reek in his nostrils, and he traced it to the ants that held him and wondered if he smelled as bad to them. The two smaller ants abruptly stirred and moved forward rapidly on eight thin legs to the time machine. Gordy's captors turned and followed them, and for the first time since the scuffle, he saw de Terry. The young man was hanging limp from the lifted forelegs of a single ant, with two more standing guard beside. There was pulsing blood from a wound on de Terry's neck. Unconscious, Gordy thought mechanically, and turned his head to watch the ants at the machine. It was a disappointing sight. They merely stood there, and no one moved. Then Gordy heard de Terry grunt and swear weakly. How are you, John? he called. De Terry grimaced. Not very good. What happened? Gordy shook his head and sought for words to answer. But the two ants turned in unison from the time machine and glided toward de Terry, and Gordy's words died in his throat. Delicately, one of them extended a foreleg to touch de Terry's chest. Gordy saw it coming. John! he shrieked. And then it was all over. And de Terry's scream was harsh in his ear and he turned his head away. Dimly from the corner of his eye, he could see the saw-like claws moving up and down, but there was no life left in de Terry to protest. Selva Gordy sat against a wall and looked at the ants who were looking at him. If it hadn't been for that which was done to de Terry, he thought, there would really be nothing to complain about. 
It was true that the ants had given him none of the comforts that humanity lavishes on even its criminals, but they had fed him and allowed him to sleep, when it suited their convenience, of course, and there were small signs that they were interested in his comfort in their fashion. When the pulpy mush they first offered him came up thirty minutes later, his multi-legged hosts brought him a variety of foods, of which he was able to swallow some fairly palatable fruits. He was housed in a warm room, and, if it had neither chairs or windows, Gordy thought, that was only because ants had no use for these themselves. And he couldn't ask for them. That was the big drawback, he thought. That, and the memory of John de Terry. He squirmed on the hard floor until his shoulder blades found a new spot to prop themselves against, and stared again at the committee of ants who had come to see him. They were working an angular thing that looked like a camera, at least it had a glittering something that might be a lens. Gordy stared into it sullenly. The sour reek was in his nostrils again. Gordy admitted to himself that things hadn't worked out just as he had planned. Deep under the surface of his mind, just now beginning to come out where he could see it, there had been a furtive hope. He had hoped that the rise of the ants, with the help he had given them, would aid and speed the rise of mankind. For hatred, Gordy knew, started in the recoil from things that were different. A man's first enemy is his family, for he sees them first, but he sides with them against the families across the way. And still his neighbours are allies against the ghettos and Harlems of his town, and his town to him is the heart of the nation, and his nation commands life and death in war. For Gordy there had been a buried hope that a separate race would make a whipping boy for the passions of humanity, and that, if there were struggle, it would not be between man and man, but between the humans and the ants. There had been this buried hope, but the hope was denied, for the ants simply had not allowed man to rise. The ants put up their camera-like machine, and Gordy looked up in expectation. Half a dozen of them left, and two stayed on. One was the smallish creature with a bangle on the foreleg, which seemed to be his personal jailer. The other, a stranger to Gordy, as far as he could tell. The two ants stood motionless for a period of time that Gordy found tedious. He changed his position and lay on the floor and thought of sleeping. But sleep would not come. There was no evading the knowledge that he had wiped out his own race, annihilated them by preventing them from birth forty million years before his own time. He was like no other murderer since Cain, Gordy thought, and wondered that he felt no blood on his hands. There was a signal that he could not perceive, and his guardian aunt came forward to him, nudged him outward from the wall. He moved as he was directed, out the low exit hole. He had to navigate it on hands and knees, and down a corridor to the bright day outside. The light set Gordy blinking. Half blind, he followed the bangled ant across a square to a conical shed. More ants were waiting there, circled around a litter of metal parts. Gordy recognised them at once. It was his time machine, stripped piece by piece. After a moment, the ant nudged him again, impatiently, and Gordy understood what they wanted. They had taken the machine apart for study, and they wanted it put together again. Pleased with the prospect of something to do with his fingers and his brain, Gordy grinned and reached for the curious ant-made tools. He ate four times and slept once, never moving from the neighbourhood of the cone-shaped shed. 
and then he was finished. Gordy stepped back. It's all yours, he said proudly. It'll take you anywhere. A present from humanity to you. The ants were very silent. Gordy looked at them and saw that there were drone ants in the group, all still as statues. Hey, he said in startlement, unthinking. And then the needle-jawed ant claw took him from behind. Gordy had a moment of nausea, and then terror and hatred swept it away. Heedless of the needles that laced his skin, he struggled and kicked against the creatures that held him. One arm came free, leaving gobbets of flesh behind, and his heavy shod foot plunged into a pulpy eye. The ant made a whistling, gasping sound and stood erect on four hairy legs. Gordy felt himself jerked a dozen feet into the air, then flung free in the wild, silent agony of the ant. He crashed into the ground, cowering away from the staggering monster. Sobbing, he pushed himself to his feet. The machine was behind him. He turned and blundered into it a step ahead of the other ants and spun the wheel. A hollow insect leg, detached from the ant that had been closest to him, was flopping about on the floor of the machine. It had been that close. Gordy stopped the machine where it had started, on the same quivering primordial bog, and lay crouched over the controls for a long time before he moved. He'd made a mistake, he and Terry. There weren't any doubts left at all, and there was, there might, be a way to right it. He looked out at the coal measure forest. The fern trees were not the fern trees he'd seen before. The machine had been moved in space. But the time, he knew, was identically the same. Trust the machine for that. He thought, I gave the world to the ants right here. I can take it back. I can find the ants I buried and crush them underfoot, or intercept myself before I bury them. He got out of the machine, suddenly panicky. Urgency squinted his eyes as he peered around him. Death had been very close in the ant city. The reaction still left Gordy limp. And was he safe here? He remembered the violent animal scream he'd heard before, and shuddered at the thought of furnishing a casual meal to some dinosaur, while the ant queens lived safely to produce their horrid young. A gleam of metal through the fern trees made his heart leap. Burnished metal here could mean but one thing. The machine. Around a clump of fern trees, their bases covered with thick club mosses, he ran and saw the machine ahead. He raced toward it, then came to a sudden stop, slipping on the damp ground. For there were two machines in sight. The father machine was his own and through the screening mosses he could see two figures standing in it, his own and a Terry's. But the nearer was a larger machine, and a strange design, and from it came a hastening mob, not a mob of men, but of black insect shapes racing toward him. Of course, thought Gordy, as he turned hopelessly to run. Of course, the ants had infinite time to work in. Time enough to build a machine after the pattern of his own, and time to realise what they had to do to him to ensure their own race safety. Gordy stumbled, and the first of the black things was upon him. As his panicky lungs filled with air for the last time, Gordy knew what animal had screamed in the depths of the coal measure forest. End of Let the Ants Try by James McRae Recording by Yvette D. Blind Spot by Bascom Jones Jr. From Galaxy Science Fiction, February 1955 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. Everyone supported the Martian program until it struck home. Blind Spot by Bascom Jones, Jr. John Stark, director of the Department of Interplanetary Relations for Mars Settlement One, reread the final paragraph of the note which he had found on his desk upon returning from lunch earlier in the day. His eyes flickered rapidly over the moist, smeared Martian scrawl, ignoring the bitterness directed at him in the first paragraphs. He was vaguely troubled by the last sentences, but he hadn't been able to pin the feeling down. Our civilization predates that of Earth by millions of years. We are an advanced, peaceful race. Yet, since Earth's first rocket landed here thirteen years ago, we have been looked upon as freaks and contemptuously called bug men behind our backs. This is our planet. We gave you of our far advanced knowledge and science freely, so that Earth would be a better place. We asked nothing in return, but we were rewarded by having forced upon us foreign ideas of government religion and behavior our protests have been silenced by an armed police and punitive system we've never before needed some day you will awaken to this injustice on that day in your life you have my sympathy and pity stark knew that the settlement's investigations lab could readily determine the identity of the martian who had written the note but he hesitated to send it over under the new system such troublemakers were banished to the slave labor details of the precious earth mines to the north crumbling the note in sudden decision stark dropped it into the office incendiary tube the morning viz report had shown that there were more than seventeen thousand workers at the mines only five had been earthlings let the armed police system find the martian through their own channels it wasn't his job a glance at the solar clock on the far wall reminded him that there was still time for one more interview before the last bell so he impatiently signaled his secretary to send in the waiting couple ordinarily he liked his work and time meant little to him he had jumped from interpreter to director in the ten years since the department had been created but this day was different stark was to announce his engagement at the chief's dinner party that evening and time had seemed to drag since his lunch with carol when the door opened he rose and nodded to the plump freckle-faced girl who entered the girl topped five feet by one or two inches but she was no taller than the martian man who followed her at the prescribed four feet after the girl had seated herself stark and the martian sat down stark opened the folder which his secretary had placed on his desk earlier your names are ruth and ralph galrat and you want permission to move into housing perimeter d it was merely a formality since the information was in the folder when the girl nodded stark placed a small check mark in the space beside her name then he turned to the martian a large single red eye deep in the martian's smooth green forehead and above the two brown ones blinked once before he answered he spoke deliberately as is required of all martians under the new system i have taken the name of one of the early earthlings to write and pronounce the large red eye blinked again my wife would like to move into housing perimeter d by regulations i respect her wish stark placed a check mark by the martian's name he wiped the smudge of ink off his hand and said you both know of course that perimeter d is reserved for couples who have intermarried and are about to have offspring 
The girl and the Martian nodded, and the girl passed Stark a medical report. Stark looked over the report, and then made a notation on a small pink slip. He said, This permit certifies that you are eligible to move from Perimeter E to Housing Perimeter D. It also certifies that your husband has no record as a troublemaker. Stark looked at the girl. You understand that you may visit your friends in Perimeter E, but, by law, they will not be allowed to enter Perimeter D to visit you. And, of course, the new law clearly states that neither of you may visit Earthlings in Housing Perimeter A, B, or C. The girl looked down at her hands. Her voice was almost inaudible. My husband and I are familiar with the advantages and disadvantages listed under the section pertaining to intermarriage in the new law, Mr. Stark. Thank you. Stark rose as they left. For a brief moment he thought he had detected a sense of rebellion in their attitude. But that was not possible. The new law provided equality for all. And his department had been created to iron out relationships between the two races, except complaints originated by troublemakers for the purpose of weakening the new system. In such cases, investigations had stepped in, and the Martian or Earthling troublemaker had been sent to the rare earth mines. The reddish light filtered in through the quartz and lead wall of his office showed that it was almost time for last bell. On the street below, Shoppers were streaming out of the stores on their way to the various housing perimeters. Earthlings were climbing into their speedy little jet cars for the short trip to the recently modernized inner perimeters. Martians were waiting for the slower autobuses. The traffic problem had been solved under the new system by restricting the use of the Martian built jet cars to persons living in the inner perimeters. As Stark watched, a black jet car impatiently hurtled out of the line of traffic, howled through a crowd of Martians waiting for an autobus, and skidded to a stop at the curb in front of the building. A tall girl got out. The red evening glow reflected from her golden hair and made her breathing globe almost amber. Mayo Martians and Earthlings alike turned to stare in appreciation as she pushed her way through the crowd to the building's compressor lock. Carol was that kind of girl. Almost at the exact moment that Carol opened the door into Stark's office, the yellow viz screen of the vocal box on Stark's desk flashed on brilliantly, and the chief's booming voice filled the office. The light from the screen picked up the highlights on the furniture and gave a sallow green cast to Stark's features. Carol stepped back into the doorway to stay out of range of the two-way unit. Stark! The automatic tuner on the box connected to bring the chief's image to wire-sharp focus. Yes, sir? About the dinner tonight. Just checking to make sure you're planning to be there. We want a full turnout. An inspection team has come up from Earth, and we have two visiting dignitaries from Venus. Stark nodded and waited for the chief to say something else, but the viz screen blanked out. Carol said, That was Dad, wasn't it? Stark felt very depressed suddenly. Haven't you told him yet? No, he's been tied up with all those inspectors all afternoon, and you know how Dad is, Johnny. There's a right and a wrong time to tell him things. Right now, he's only interested in hearing about Earth. But we're supposed to announce our engagement tonight at dinner. He shook his head. We can't go on forever with just a few stolen moments here and there, eating an occasional lunch or third meal together in little out-of-the-way places. Carol laughed, the youthful swell of her breasts against the soft, spun-glass material of her blouse. Don't worry so, Johnny. I'm a big girl now. This is my eighteenth birthday. Dad's bark is much worse than his bite. I'll tell him about us on the way home. 
She moved closer to him until he could feel the warmth of her body. He could see the warm, damp indentation where her breathing globe had rested against her shoulders and chest. She asked teasingly, What did you get me for my birthday, Johnny? Something real nice? What did you want? Johnny asked her gently. And suddenly she wasn't teasing any more. She put her arms around him. Dad and my brothers would say I'm crazy, but all I want, Johnny, is you. Just you. You know that. Stark had picked out her birthday present, but he wanted it to be a surprise for that night. He said, I already saw one of your presents, a black jet car. How did you know that? I saw you drive up in it a few minutes ago. Carol giggled. Dad gave that to me. Did you see me plow through that crowd waiting for the autobus? Did your brother send you anything? She nodded. Three new outfits from Earth. They were on the same liner that brought the inspection team to the settlement this morning. Oh, yes, and the captain of the liner brought me this. She showed him the tiny pin she wore attached to her collar. The pin itself was a carefully wrought, but cruel caricature of an awkward bug-like creature. A small ruby set in the center of its face served as its eye. Stark frowned. Carol, you shouldn't be wearing that. He reached up and unpinned it. That's the sort of thing our department is fighting. But the captain said it was the latest rage back on Earth. They even make toys like it. I'm sure they're not designed to... to poke fun at anyone. Stark started to say something, but the last bell interrupted him. He said, If you're going to take your father home and tell him about us before dinner, you'd better hurry. I'll come earlier. Carol kissed him and said goodbye. She left the pen on Stark's desk and was smiling at him as she closed the door. After waiting until the first rush of workers had gone and the building was quiet, Stark caught the elevator down. The overhead lights in the compressor lock were reflected in the twin rows of breathing globes. The green-tinted ones had to be used by Martians in the building, and the clear ones were used by Earthmen when they were outside in the Martian atmosphere. Stark stopped in at a little open shop down one of the many side streets. The sign said closed, but he rang the bell until a little dried-up Martian appeared. The scorekeeper handed him a small box. Stark opened it and examined the ring, Carol's birthday present. The single large diamond set in the thin precious metal band dated back to an all-but-forgotten custom practiced on Earth. Stark thought the engagement ring would please Carol, though. Standing in the compressor lock at the chief's home later, Stark rubbed the diamond against the sleeve of his tunic. He fumbled with his breathing globe, and then pushed the button that activated the door. The teleguard beyond the opening door scanned him rapidly. As he stepped forward, a red light above the teleguard flashed on, and the door began to close again. Stark threw all his strength against the door and squeezed through into the house. Throughout the house, Stark could hear the alarm bell. A taped voice, activated by the teleguard, said, Do not enter! Do not enter! He found Carol and the chief in the library alone. Nearly purple with rage, the chief drew himself up to his full six feet. The chief bellowed, Stark, are you crazy? The growing feeling of sickness spread through Stark. Who do you think you are? the chief yelled. Get back to your office and consider yourself under arrest as a troublemaker. Give you people an inch, and you try to walk away with everything. Why, I wouldn't let you touch my daughter if you were the last living being in the universe. Carol didn't look up. She stood through it all silently, without moving. 
Stark knew now where his blind spot had been. He turned and left them. Back at his office, he waited for the police. Stark stared down at his reflection in the polished top of the desk. A yellow, moist film of sweat covered his face. The red eye set in his forehead blinked. But the pain visible just beyond the surface of that eye was not over Carol or himself. The pain was for what he was seeing for the first time now. The End of Blind Spot by Bascom Jones, Jr. A Trick of the Mind by William P. Salton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Quartertone A Trick of the Mind by William P. Salton Paul Donovan was sitting at a bar when he learned the trick. He had reached out to lift his martini glass when his hand stopped in midair, stood rigid, refused to move. Paul stared at it. Sweat broke out on his forehead. Thoughts of paralysis raced through his mind. The hand and arm seemed things apart, and he had a feeling of not possessing them, of complete divorcement from these members. Then he realized his whole body was frozen, and his mind, there was something new about it, something alien, as though it floated above his head and looked down at him in amusement. Panic flared, then subsided, as he became aware of a strange newness within himself. Vague and undefinable, this newness, but it was definitely a change, something he had never felt before. Think, he told himself fiercely. There's nothing wrong with you. You aren't drunk. This is only your second martini. Stop this nonsense and pick up that glass. The order was given with every ounce of his brain power behind it, and the order was obeyed but in a completely illogical manner. His body instantly became lax and docile, but the offending hand dropped to the bar as the martini glass, seemingly of its own volition, moved across the bar, levitated to his lips, tilted, and poured the drink into his mouth. The martini went smoothly down his throat, after which the glass returned to its former position. Paul snatched out a handkerchief and wiped his lips as he glanced guiltily up and down the bar. Had anyone been watching? Apparently not. Then Paul saw a small man with an ingrown chin get shakily off his stool. The little man gulped as he eyed Paul in terror. Then he looked back at his own beer glass as though it had turned into a cobra. Now he threw down a quarter and headed for the door. Paul grinned. Not interested in questioning or analyzing his new power, he was satisfied in being happy with it, in examining its possibilities. He ordered another drink. The barkeep set it before him, turned away, and another miracle was performed as slowly, steadily, the martini glass moved across the polished bar. At the edge, it rose evenly in the air. The martini glided smoothly down Paul's throat. Empty, the glass returned to the table. Paul tingled all over, thoroughly enjoying the new thrill, the new sense of power. It was far more intoxicating than the martinis themselves. With a marked sense of superiority, he again looked up and down the bar. The first flash of fear gone, he now regarded the other drinkers with patronizing contempt. That fat fellow there at the end, for instance, drinking a Manhattan, trying to look like a banker, trying to impress the people. Pompous ass. Maybe I can fix his wagon, Paul thought. The man raised his glass with an exaggerating sweep of his hand. Paul concentrated, and the poor unfortunate poured its entire contents over his immaculate shirt front. The barfly snickered as the man fumbled a bill onto the bar and fled. It worked, Paul gloated. A waiter passed, carrying a tray of appetizers. Paul closed his eyes, thought one into his mouth, and tasted the sharp, salty flavor of anchovy. This was fun. Next, he noticed a glossy dame sitting near the center of the bar, pushing out her front until it reminded him of twin cannons. So she thought she could scrounge another drink from the guy next to her, huh? 
Why didn't you just pick his pocket and be done with it? Why not, indeed? Effortlessly, the man's wallet flew out of his hip pocket and arced down into her low-cut bodice. The girl angled her popping eyes downward. Paul chuckled to himself as she slipped off the stool and headed for the ladies' room. It was all so easy. If he could manipulate his newfound power so cleverly, why not do something truly epic? Like dropping a brick on his boss's head? Or, come to think of it, how about putting some money into his own pocket? The cashier at the end of the bar rang up a sale. Then, with the cash drawer still open, his attention was attracted by a waiter. Opportunity. With hardly any effort at all, Paul transferred a $10 bill from the drawer into his shirt pocket. It crackled excitingly as he pressed it flat with a casual hand. Pure excitement swept him. He could do anything. Move into the really spectacular. He could... could even rob a bank. Thus, when the armored truck pulled up across the street, his mind was conditioned for its arrival. Through the window, he saw the rear door open. Then two armed guards emerged. Bored by the routine, one of them actually yawned as a third guard appeared from the theater entrance in front of which they were parked. He was carrying a satchel. As he handed it into the truck, Paul's mind worked automatically. Then he watched as the guards vanished inside the truck and closed the door. The truck spouted a white exhaust and pulled away. Paul was trembling now, suddenly aghast at what he had done. This wasn't a parlor game anymore, and he told himself it hadn't happened. Told himself this in quick desperation. That this whole thing had been nothing more than an idle daydream, a moment's relaxation along with a few drinks. Like hell it was. Regardless of how he figured it, he was now a big-time thief. Big time? How much is big time? How much money was now stuffed in the briefcase beside his stool? He reached down surreptitiously and hefted the bag for weight. Plenty. He ordered another drink and gave it no chance to play tricks, snatching the glass firmly by the stem and lifting it the old-fashioned way. It didn't help much. Then real panic welled up as a heavy hand dropped on his shoulder and he turned and saw the goggle eyes of the little fat man, saw a pudgy finger pointed accusingly. I tell you, officers, this is the guy, and he's nuts, stark raving nuts, I'm telling you. He gets his drinks without even lifting them. They bounce right off the bar. There were two policemen, a rather bored oldster with signs of breakfast on the front of his uniform, and a spruced-up young patrolman not yet disillusioned. The older cop dropped his hand from Paul's shoulder and spoke with a certain deference. This is no charge, mister, just a routine looking. Our friend here is all excited about something, and, well, you know how it is. That's okay, officer, Paul croaked, striving to control his voice. The younger cop, taking a cue from his superior's manner, threw a stern look at the discomfited fat man. Do you want to prefer any charges, mister? The fat man took an involuntary backward step, banged his heel against Paul's briefcase, and instantly both policemen were staring at the floor. Paul's eyes followed theirs. A chill went deep into his bones. That faulty catch! He'd meant to get it fixed. Now it was as undoing as a heap of banded banknotes spilled out onto the floor. The elder cop broke the silence. Maybe there'll be some charges. Maybe not. But I think we'll take a walk to the station all the same. Paul clawed at his mind for a retort. Any law against carrying money? he asked, trying to make it sound light. No law against it, no, but you've got to admit this is pretty unusual. Do you think I stole this money? The officer tipped his cap back and scratched his ear reflectively. No, but I got a hunch it doesn't belong to you. I don't think you got any right sitting here in the bar with it. I think maybe you got a boss somewhere that might have sent you to a bank or something, and he could be real nervous wondering why you don't get back. We'll just take a little walk to the station, and no offense to anybody, okay? Paul's mind was numb as he stood between the officers at the call box. He could not force his brain to function even normally, let alone execute any mental tricks discovered in the bottom of a martini glass. A squad car pulled up, and he climbed docilely in the back seat and sat like a man in a trance between the two silent policemen. 
At the station, there was the added chill of feeling like a man alone, a criminal involved in a terrible experience that was merely routine to the tormentors who walked by his side. It was one of the older stations, with a well-worn floor marked by the scuffing footsteps of many an unhappy wrongdoer. The desk sergeant had a sagging, disillusioned face and a pair of eyes that had given up all hope of utopia. He turned them on Paul and grunted. What's the gripe? The senior officer did the talking. We don't exactly know, sergeant, but we got a lead on this character, found him sitting in a gin mill with enough dough in his catch to pay off the national debt. It seemed a little out of line somehow. The desk sergeant stretched his scrawny neck and peered down at the offending briefcase. The dough in there? Right. Let's have a look. The younger officer lifted the bag as though it contained the secret to every unsolved crime on the books and deposited it triumphantly on the desk. Pretty battered leather to lug around real dough in, the sergeant commented. He lifted the flap and reached inside. Then he scowled at the accusing cop and tipped the briefcase upside down. A sheaf of white papers fell out, a pack of new lead pencils Paul had lifted from the supply shelf that afternoon, and a copy of Lurid Sex he had bought at the corner newsstand. That was all. The desk sergeant slammed the briefcase down on the desk and glowered at the trio before him. What kind of a rib is this? You jerks think I got nothing more to do than sit here and let you bounce your gags off me? Besides, this isn't even a gag. It's got no point. Let's have the snapper. I'm listening. The elder cop turned pale with amazement. The younger one, obviously of different metabolism, had turned beet red. After a thick pause, they found their voices simultaneously. I'll swear on the Bible that there was money in that damn briefcase when we first looked into it. Paul passed up the bus, preferring to walk the ten blocks to his apartment. He needed the air, and the sense of freedom was glorious. Thank heaven his mind had come unstuck that last moment, and now the sheaf of money was back where it belonged, in the satchel of the armored car guard. Humbled, completely chastened, and not a little scared, Paul hoped he had caused no one any inconvenience. And strong indeed were his resolutions. No more mental transference. In fact, no more martinis. From now on, he would get his money the hard way. In the end, that would turn out to be by far the easiest. End of A Trick of the Mind by William P. Salton The Great Nebraska Sea by Alan Danzig This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alex Clark The Great Nebraska Sea by Alan Danzig It has happened a hundred times in the long history of Earth, and, sooner or later, will happen again. Everyone, all the geologists at any rate, had known about the Kiowa Fault for years. That was before there was anything very interesting to know about it. The first survey of Colorado traced its course north and south in the narrow valley of Kiowa Creek, about 20 miles east of Denver. It extended south to the Arkansas River. And that was about all even the professionals were interested in knowing. There was never so much as a landslide to bring the fault to the attention of the general public. It was still a matter of academic interest when, in the late 40s, geologists speculated on the relationship between the Kiowa Fault and the Concus Fault farther south in New Mexico, and which followed the Picos as far south as Texas. Nor was there much in the papers a few years later when it was suggested that the Neobrara Fault, just inside a roughly parallel to the eastern border of Wyoming, was a northerly extension of the Kiowa. By the mid-60s, it was definitely established that the three faults were in fact a single line of fissure in the essential rock stretching almost from the Canadian border well south of the New Mexico-Texas line. It is not really surprising that it took so long to figure out the connection. The population of the states affected was in places as low as five people per square mile. The land was so dry it seemed impossible that it could ever be used except for sheep farming. It strikes us today as ironic that from the late 50s there was grave concern about the level of water table throughout the entire area. 
The even more ironic solution to the problem began in the summer of 1973. It had been a particularly hot and dry August, and the Forestry Service was keeping an anxious eye out for the fires it knew it could expect. Dense smoke was reported rising above a virtually uninhabited area along Black Squirrel Creek, and a plane was sent out for a report. The report was, no fire at all. The rising cloud was not smoke, but dust. Thousands of cubic feet of dry earth rising lazily on the summer air. Rock slides, they guessed. Certainly no fire. The Forestry Service had other worries at the moment, and filed the report. But after a week had gone by, the town of Edison, a good 20 miles away from the slides, was still complaining of the dust. Springs were going dry, too, apparently from underground disturbances. Not even in the Rockies could anyone remember a series of rock slides as bad as this. Newspapers in the mountain states gave it a few inches on the front page. Anything is news in late August. And the geologists became interested. Seismologists were reporting unusual activity in the area, tremors too severe to be rock slides. Volcanic activity? Specifically, a dust volcano? Unusual, they knew, but right on the Kiowa Fault, could be. Labor Day crowds read the scientific conjectures with late summer lazitude. Sunday supplements ran four-color artists' conceptions of the possible volcano. Only active volcano in U.S.? demanded the headlines, and some papers even left off the question mark. It may seem odd that the simplest explanation was practically not mentioned. Only Joseph Schwarzberg, head geographer of the Department of the Interior, wondered if the disturbance might not be a settling of the Kiowa Fault. His suggestion was mentioned on page 9 or 10 of the Monday newspapers, page 27 of the New York Times. The idea was not nearly so exciting as a volcano, even a lavaless one, and you couldn't draw a very dramatic picture of it. To excuse the other geologists, it must be said that the Kiowa Fault had never acted up before. It never sidestepped, never jiggled, never produced the regular shows of its little sister out in California, which almost daily bounced San Francisco or Los Angeles or someplace in between. The dust volcano was, on the face of it, a more plausible theory. Still, it was only a theory. It had to be proved. As the tremors grew bigger, along with the affected area, as several towns, including Edison, were shaken to pieces by incredible earthquakes, whole bus and plane loads of geologists set out for Colorado, without even waiting for their university and government department to approve budgets. They found, of course, that Schwartzberg had been perfectly correct. They found themselves on the scene of what was fast becoming the most violent and widespread earthquake North America, probably the world, has ever seen in historic times. To describe it in the simplest terms, land east of the fault was settling at a precipitous rate. Rock scraped rock with a whining roar. Shuddery as a squeaky piece of chalk raked across a blackboard, the noise was deafening. The surfaces of the land east and west of the fault seemed no longer to have any relation to each other. To the west, tortured rock reared into cliffs. East, where sharp reports and muffled wheezes told of continued buckling and dropping, the earth trembled downward. Atop the new cliffs, which seemed to grow by sudden inches from heaving rubble, dry earth fissured and trembled, sliding acres at a time to fall, smoking, into the bucking, heaving bottom of the depression. There, the devastation was even more thorough, if less spectacular. Dry earth churned like mud, and rock shards weighing tons bumped and rolled about like pebbles as they shivered and cracked into pebbles themselves. It looks like sand dancing in the child's sieve, said the normally impassive Schwartzberg in a nationwide broadcast from the scene of the disaster. No one here has ever seen anything like it, and the landslip was growing north and south along the fault. Get out while you can, Schwartzberg urged the population of the affected area. When it's over, you can come back and pick up the pieces. But the band of scientists who had rallied to his leadership privately wondered if there would be any pieces. The Arkansas River at Avondale and North Avondale was sluggishly backing north into the deepening trough, 
At the rate things were going, there might be a new lake the entire length of El Paso and Pueblo counties. And, warned Schwartzberg, this might only be the beginning. By 16 September, the landslip had crept down the Huerfano River past Cedarwood. Avondale, North Avondale, and Boone had totally disappeared. The land west of the fault was holding firm, though Denver had recorded several small tremors. Everywhere east of the fault, to almost 20 miles away, the now familiar lurch and steady fall had already sent several thousand Coloradans scurrying for safety. All mountain climbing was prohibited on the eastern slope because of the danger of rock slides from minor quakes. The geologists went home to wait. There wasn't much to wait for. The news got worse and worse. The Platte River, now, was creating a vast mud puddle where the town of Orchard had just been. Just below Masters, Colorado, the river leaped 70-foot cliffs to add to the heaving chaos below and the cliffs were higher every day as the land beneath them groaned downward in mile-square gulps. As the fault moved north and south, new areas quivered into unwelcome life. Fields and whole mountainsides moved with deceptive sloth, down, down. They danced like sand in a sieve. Dry, they boiled into rubble. Telephone lines, railroad tracks, roads snapped, and simply disappeared. Virtually all east-west land communication was suspended, and the president declared a national emergency. By 23 September, the fault was active well into Wyoming on the north, and rapidly approaching the border of New Mexico to the south. Chinchera and Branson were totally evacuated, but even so, the overall death toll had risen above a thousand. Away to the east, the situation was quiet, but even more ominous. Tremendous fissures opened up perpendicular to the fault, and a general subsidence of the land was noticeable well into Kansas and Nebraska. The western borders of these states, and soon of the Dakotas and Oklahoma as well, were slowly sinking. On the actual scene of the disaster, or scenes, it is impossible to speak of anything this size in the singular, there was a horrifying confusion. Prairie and hill cracked open under intolerable strains as the land shuddered downward in gasps and leaps. Springs burst to the surface in hot geysers and explosions of steam. The downtown section of North Platte, Nebraska, dropped eight feet, just like that, on the afternoon of 4 October. We must remain calm, declared the governor of Nebraska. We must sit this thing out. Be assured that everything possible is being done. But what could be done with his state dropping straight down at a mean rate of a foot a day? The fault nicked off the southeast corner of Montana. It worked its way north along the Little Missouri. South, it ripped past Roswell, New Mexico, and tore down the Picos towards Texas. All the upper reaches of the Missouri were standing puddles by now and the Red River west of Paris, Texas, had begun to run backward. Soon the Missouri began slowly slipping away westward over the slowly churning land. Abandoning its bed, the river spread uncertainly across farmland and prairie, becoming a sea of mud beneath the sharp new cliffs which rose in rending line, ever taller as the land continued to sink, almost from Canada to the Mexican border. There were virtually no floods, in the usual sense, the water moved too slowly, spread itself with no real direction or force. But the vast sheets of sluggish water and jelly-like mud formed death traps for the countless refugees now streaming east. Perhaps the North Platte disaster had been more than anyone could take. 193 people had died in that one cave-in. Certainly by 7 October, it had to be officially admitted that there was an exodus of epic proportion. Nearly two million people were on the move, and the U.S. was faced with a gigantic wave of refugees. Rails, roads, and airlines were jammed with terrified hordes who had left everything behind to crowd eastward. All through October, hollow-eyed motorists flocked into Tulsa, Topeka, Omaha, Sioux Falls, and Fargo. St. Louis was made distributing center for emergency squads, which flew everywhere with milk for babies and dog food for evacuating pets. Gasoline trucks boomed west to meet the demand for gas, but once inside the zone of terror, as the newspapers now called it, 
They found their route blocked by eastbound cars on the wrong side of the road. Shops left by their fleeing owners were looted by refugees from further west. An American Airlines plane was wrecked by a mob of would-be passengers in Bismarck, North Dakota. Federal and state troops were called out, but moving two million people was not to be done in an orderly way. And still, the landslip grew larger. The new cliffs gleamed in the autumn sunshine, growing higher as the land beneath them continued its inexorable descent. On 21 October, at Lubbock, Texas, there was a noise variously described as a hollow roar, a shriek, and a deep musical vibration, like a church bell. It was simply the tortured rock of the substrata giving way. The second phase of the national disaster was beginning. The noise traveled due east at better than 85 miles an hour. In its wake, the earth to the north just seemed to collapse on itself like a punctured balloon, read one newspaper report. Like a cake that's failed, said a Texarkana housewife who fortunately lived a block south of Thayer Street, where the fissure raced through. There was a sigh and a great cloud of dust, and Oklahoma subsided at the astounding rate of about six feet per hour. At Biloxi, on the Gulf, there had been uneasy shufflings underfoot all day. Not tremors, exactly, said the captain of a fishing boat, which was somehow to ride out the coming flood, but like as if the land wanted to be somewhere else. Everyone in doomed Biloxi would have done well to have been somewhere else that evening. At approximately 8.30 p.m., the town shuddered, seemed to rise a little like the edge of a hall carpet caught in a draft, and sank. So did the entire Mississippi and Alabama coast at about the same moment. The tidal wave, which was to gouge the center from the U.S., marched on the land. From the north shore of Lake Pontchartrain to the Apalachicola River in Florida, the Gulf Coast simply disappeared. Gulfport, Biloxi, Mobile, Pensacola, Panama City, 200 miles of shoreline vanished with over two and a half million people. An hour later, a wall of water had swept over every town from Dothan, Alabama to Bogalusa on the Louisiana-Mississippi border. We must keep panic from our minds, said the governor of Alabama in a radio message delivered from a hastily arranged all-station hookup. We of the gallant Southland have faced and withstood invasion before. Then, as ominous creakings and groanings of the earth announced the approach of the tidal wave, he flew out of Montgomery, half an hour before the town disappeared forever. One head of the wave plunged north, eventually to spend itself in the hills south of Birmingham. The main sweep followed the lowest land. Reaching west, it swallowed Vicksburg and nicked the corner of Louisiana. The whole of East Carroll Parish was scoured from the map. The Mississippi River now ended at about Eudora, Arkansas, and minute by minute the advancing flood bit away miles of riverbed swelling north. Chico, Jenny, Lake Village, Arkansas City, Snow Lake, Elaine, Helena, and Memphis felt the tremors. The tormented city shuddered through the night. The earth continued its descent, eventually tipping two and a half degrees down to the west. The Memphis tilt is today one of the unique and charming characteristics of the gracious old town, but during the night of panic, Memphis residents were sure they were doomed. South and west, the waters carved deeply into Arkansas and Oklahoma. By morning, it was plain that all of Arkansas was going under. Waves advanced on Little Rock at almost 100 miles an hour, new crests forming, overtopping the wave's leading edge as towns, hills, and the thirst of the soil temporarily broke the furious charge. Washington announced the official hope that the Ozarks would stop the wild gallop of the unleashed gulf, for in northwest Arkansas, the land rose to over 2,000 feet. But nothing could save Oklahoma. By noon, the water reached clutching fingers around Mount Scott and Elk Mountain, deluging Hobart and almost all of Greer County. Despite hopeful announcements that the wave was slowing, had virtually stopped after inundating Oklahoma City, was being swallowed up in the desert near Amarillo, the wall of water continued its advance. For the land was still sinking, and the floods were constantly replenished from the gulf. Schwartzberg and his geologist advised the utmost haste in evacuating the entire area between Colorado and Missouri, from Texas to North Dakota. 
Lubbock, Texas went under. On a curling reflex, the tidal wave blotted out sweet water and big spring. The Texas panhandle disappeared in one great swirl. Whirlpools opened. A great welter of smashed wood and human debris was sucked under, vomited up, and pounded to pieces. Gulf water crashed on the cliffs of New Mexico and fell back on itself in foam. Would-be rescuers in the cliffs along what had been the west bank of the Pecos River afterwards recalled the hiss and scream like tearing silk as the water broke furiously on the newly exposed rock. It was the most terrible sound they had ever heard. We couldn't hear any shouts, of course. Not that far away and with all the noise, said Dan Weaver, mayor of Carlsbad. But we knew there were people down there. When the water hit the cliffs, it was like a collision between two solid bodies. We couldn't see for over an hour because of the spray. Salt spray. The ocean had come to New Mexico. The cliffs proved to be the only effective barrier against the westward march of the water, which turned north, gouging out lumps of rock and tumbling down blocks of earth onto its own back. In places, scoops of granite came out like ice cream. The present fishing town of Rockport, Colorado, is built on a harbor created in such a way. The water had found its farthest westering, but still it poured north along the line of the original fault. Irresistible fingers closed on Sterling, Colorado, on Sydney, Nebraska, on Hot Springs, South Dakota. The entire tier of states settled from south to north, down to its eventual place of stability, 1,000 feet below the level of the new sea. Memphis was by now a seaport. The Ozarks, islands in a mad sea, formed precarious havens for half-drowned humanity. Waves bit off a corner of Missouri, flung themselves on Wichita. Topeka, Lawrence, and Belleville were the last Kansas towns to disappear. The governor of Kansas went down with his state. Daniel Byrne of Lincoln, Nebraska, was washed up half-drowned in a cove of the Wyoming cliffs, having been sucked from one end of vanished Nebraska to the other. Similar hairbreadth escapes were recounted on radio and television. Virtually the only people saved out of the entire population of Pierre, South Dakota, were the six members of the Creeth family. Plucky Timothy Creeth carried and dragged his aged parents to the loft of their barn on the outskirts of town. His brother Jeffrey brought along the younger children and what provisions they could find. Uh, mostly a ham and about half a ton of vanilla cookies, he explained to his eventual rescuers. The barn, luckily collapsing in the vibrations as the waves bore down on them, became an ark in which they rode out the disaster. We must have played cards for four days straight, recalled genial Mrs. Creeth when she afterwards appeared on a popular television spectacular. Her rural good humor, undamaged by an ordeal few women can ever have been called on to face, she added, We sure wondered why flushes never came out right. Jiminently, we left the King of Hearts behind, in the rush. But such lightheartedness and such happy endings were by no means typical. The world could only watch aghast as the water raced north under the shadow of the cliffs, which occasionally crumbled, roaring into the roaring waves. Day by day, the relentless rush swallowed what had been dusty farmland, cities, and towns. Some people were saved by the helicopters, which flew mercy missions just ahead of the advancing waters. Some found safety in the peaks of western Nebraska and the Dakotas. But when the waters came to rest along what is roughly the present shoreline of our inland sea, it was estimated that over 14 million people had lost their lives. No one could even estimate the damage to property. Almost the entirety of eight states and portions of 12 others had simply vanished from the heart of the North American continent forever. It was in such a cataclysmic birth that the now peaceful Nebraska Sea came to America. Today, nearly 100 years after the unprecedented and happily unrepeated disaster, it is hard to remember the terror and despair of those weeks in October and November 1973. It is inconceivable to think of the United States without its beautiful and economically essential curve of interior ocean. Two-thirds as long as the Mediterranean, it graduates from the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico through the equally blue waves of the Mississippi Bight, becoming cooler and greener, north and west of the pleasant fishing isles of the Ozark Archipelago, finally shading into the gray-green chop of the Gulf of Dakota.
What would the United States have become without the 5,600-mile coastline of our inland sea? It's only within the last 20 years that any but the topmost layer of water has cleared sufficiently to permit a really extensive fishing industry. Mud still held in suspension by the restless waves will not fully precipitate even in our lifetimes. Even so, the commercial fisheries of Missouri and Wyoming contribute no small part to the nation's economy. Who can imagine what the Middle West must have been like before the amelioration of climate brought about the proximity of a warm sea? The now temperate state of Minnesota, to say nothing of the submerged Dakotas, must have been Siberian. From contemporary accounts, Missouri, our second California, was unbelievably muggy, almost uninhabitable during the summer months. Our climate today, from Ohio and North Carolina to the rich fields of New Mexico and the orchards of Montana, is directly ameliorated by the marine heart of the continent. Who today could imagine the United States without the majestic sea cliffs in stately parade from New Mexico to Montana? The beaches of Wyoming, the American Riviera, where fruit trees grow almost to the water's edge? Or incredible Colorado, where the morning skier is the afternoon bather, thanks to the monorail connecting the highest peaks with the glistening white beaches? Of course, there have been losses to balance slightly these strong gains. The Mississippi was, before 1973, one of the great rivers of the world. Taken together with its main tributary, the Missouri, it vied favorably with such giant systems as the Amazon and the Ganges. Now, ending as it does at Memphis and drawing its water chiefly from the Appalachian Mountains, it is only a slight remnant of what it was. And though the Nebraska Sea today carries many times the tonnage of shipping and its ceaseless traffic, we have lost the old romance of river shipping. We may only guess what it was like when we look upon the Ohio and the truncated Mississippi. And transcontinental shipping is somewhat more difficult, with trucks and the freight railroads obliged to take the sea ferries across the Nebraska Sea. We shall never know what the United States was like with its numerous coast-to-coast -coast highways busy with trucks and private cars. Still, the ferry ride is certainly a welcome break after days of driving, and for those who wish a glimpse of what it must have been like, there is always the Cross-Canada Thruway and the magnificent U.S. Highway 73, looping north through Minnesota and passing through the giant port of Alexis, North Dakota, shipping center for the wheat of Manitoba and crossroad of a nation. The political situation has long been a thorny problem. Only tattered remnants of the eight submerged states remained after the flood, but none of them wanted to surrender its autonomy. The tiny fringe of Kansas seemed, for a time, ready to merge with contiguous Missouri. But following the lead of the Arkansas Forever faction, the remaining population decided to retain political integrity. This has resulted in the continuing anomaly of the seven fringe states, represented in Congress by the usual two senators each, though the largest of them is barely the size of Connecticut, and all are economically indistinguishable from their neighboring states. Fortunately, it was decided some years ago that Oklahoma, only one of the eight to have completely disappeared, could not in any sense be considered to have a continuing political existence. So... Though there are still families who proudly call themselves Oklahomans, and the Oklahoma Oil Company continues to pump oil from its submerged real estate, the state has in fact disappeared from the American political scene. But this is by now no more than a petty annoyance, to raise a smile when the talk gets around to the question of states' rights. Not even the tremendous price the country paid for its new sea, 14 million dead, untold property destroyed, really offsets the asset we enjoy today. The heart of the continent, now open to the shipping of the world, was once dry and landlocked, cut off from the bustle of trade and the ferment of world culture. It would indeed seem odd to an American of the 50s or 60s of the last century to imagine sailors from the merchant fleets of every nation walking the streets of Denver, fresh ashore at Newport, only 15 miles away or to imagine Lincoln, Fargo, Kansas City, and Dallas as world ports and great manufacturing centers. Utterly beyond their ken would be Roswell, New Mexico, Benton, Wyoming, Westport, Missouri, and the other new ports of over a million inhabitants, each which have developed on the new harbors of the Inland Sea. 
Unimaginable, too, would have been the general growth of population in the states surrounding the new sea. As the water tables rose and manufacturing and trade moved in to take advantage of the just-created axis of world communication, a population explosion was touched off of which we are only now seeing the diminution. This new westering is to be ranked with the first surge of pioneers which created the American West. But what a difference. Vacation paradises bloom. A new fishing industry thrives. Her water road is America's main artery of trade, and fleets of all the world sail where once the prairie schooner made its laborious and dusty way west. End of The Great Nebraska Sea by Alan Danzig Recording by Alex Clark, Plattsburgh, New York Welcome Martians by S. A. Lombino. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. Only one question seemed important in this huge space venture. Who was flying where? Welcome, Martians, by S. A. Lombino. The only sound was the swish of the jets against the sand as the big ship came down. Slowly, nose pointed skyward, a yellow tail streaming out behind the tubes, it settled to the ground like a cat nuzzling its haunches against a velvet pillow. Dave Langley peered through the viewport. I feel kind of funny, he said. A tremor of excitement flooded through Cal Manor's thin frame. Mars, he whispered. We made it. Gently, the fins probed the sand, poking into it. Cal cut the power, and the big ship shuddered and relaxed, a huge metal spider with a conical head. Cal peered through the viewport, his eyes scanning the planet. Behind him, Dave struggled into the spacesuit, gathering up his instruments. I can make tests, Dave said. Keep the starboard guns trained on me. Cal nodded. He walked Dave to the airlock and lifted the toggles on the inner hatch. Dave stepped into the small chamber, and Cal snapped the hatch shut. He walked quickly to the starboard guns, wiggled into the plastic seat behind them, and pitched his shoulders against the braces. Outside, like a grotesque balloon, Dave stumbled around on weighted feet, taking his readings. What's out there? Cal wondered. Just exactly what? He tightened his grip on the big blasters and trained the guns around to where Dave puttered in the sand. Dave suddenly stood erect, waving at Cal, and started to lumber back to the ship. Cal left the guns and went to the airlock. He stepped into the chamber, closed the toggles on the hatch behind him, and twirled the wheel on the outer hatch. He was ready to move back into the ship again when Dave stepped through the outer hatch, his helmet under his arm. It's okay, Cal. Breathable atmosphere. And the pressure is all right, too. Cal let out a sigh of relief. Come on, he said. Get out of that monkey suit. Then we'll claim the planet for Earth. They went back into the ship and Dave took off the suit, hanging it carefully in its locker. Both men strapped on holsters and stun guns from the munitions locker. They checked the charges in their weapons, holstered them, and stepped out into the Martian night. It was cold, but their clothing was warm, and the air was invigorating. Cal looked up at the sky. Phobos, he said, pointing. And Demos, Dave added. Ike and Mike. Yeah, Dave smiled. How do you feel, Dave? Cal asked suddenly. How do you mean? Mars. I mean, we're the first men to land on Mars. The first, Dave. They were walking aimlessly, in no particular hurry. It's funny, Dave said. I told you before, I feel kind of... The music started abruptly, almost exploded into being. Tore through the silence of the planet like a strident scream of a wounded animal. Trumpets blasted raucously, trombones moaned and slid, 
bass drums pounded a steady tattoo tubas heavy and solemn like old men belching clarinets shrill and squealing cymbals crashed a military band blaring its march into the night what dave's mouth hung open he stared into the distance there were lights and the brass gleamed dully a group of men were marching toward them blowing on their horns waving brilliant banners in the air people cal said and music like ours music just like ours the procession spilled across the sand like an unraveling spool of brightly colored silk. Children danced on the outskirts of the group, hopping up and down, screaming in glee. Women waved banners, sang along with the band. The music shouted out across the sand, a triumphal march with a lively beat. A fat man led the procession. He was beaming his smile a great enameled gash across his face the music became louder closer ear-shattering now welcome the shouts rang out welcome welcome english the word escaped dave's lips with a sudden hiss for god's sake cal they're speaking english something's wrong cal said tightly this isn't mars we've made a mistake dave the fat man was closer now, still grinning, his stomach protruding, a gold watch hanging across his vest beneath his jacket. He wore a white carnation in his buttonhole. A Hamburg, black, was perched solidly across his head. They're human, Dave whispered. The fat man stopped before them, raising his hands. The music ceased as abruptly as it had begun. He stepped forward and extended his hand. Welcome home, he said. Welcome home? The words seared across Cal's mind with a sudden understanding. There's been some mistake, he started. Mistake? The fat man chuckled. Nonsense, nonsense. I'm Mayor Panley. You're back in New Calith, gentlemen. The city is yours. The world is yours. Welcome home. You don't understand, Cal persisted. We've just come from Earth. We've just traveled more than 50 million miles through space. We're from Earth. I know, the mayor said. I know. You know? Of course. Isn't it wonderful? The crowd cheered behind him, telling the night how wonderful it was. Cal blinked, turned to Dave. The mayor put his arms about the two men. We've been watching your approach for weeks. I'll have to admit we were a little worried in the beginning. Worried? The mayor began to chuckle again. Why, yes, yes. Not that we didn't think you'd make it. But there were some who, um... Here are the television trucks now. The trucks wheeled across the sand, just like the thousands of trucks Cal had seen back on Earth. The television cameras pointed down at them, and the men stood behind them with earphones on. Smile! Smile! the mayor whispered. Cal smiled. Dave smiled, too. Ladies and gentlemen, Mayor Panley said to the cameras, it is a distinct honor for New Calith. The crowd raised their voices, drowning out his voice. The banners waved, yellow, red, blue, orange, welcome, welcome, welcome. The distinct honor of New Callus to be able to welcome Bobby Gallus and Gary Dale. Gallus, Dale, the voices sang. Gallus, Dale, Gallus, Dale. Just a second, Cal interrupted. You don't understand at all. Those aren't our... Four years in space, the mayor continued. Four years among the stars. To Earth and back, fellow citizens, for the glory of Mars. You've got that twisted, Cal said. We didn't... The mayor took Cal's elbow and turned him toward the cameras. You were in space for four years, weren't you, Captain Gallus? Yes, we were. But it wasn't... Space, the mayor gushed. Limitless space, the first men to land on Earth. 
Again the cries of the crowd split the night. Across the stretches of the sky, the mayor continued, across the uncharted wilderness above, across the... There were banquets and more banquets, and women in every shape and size. The city of New Calith went all out to welcome the space travelers, Bobby Gallus and Gary Dale. At the end of the week of festivities, the mayor came to Cal and Dave. Have you enjoyed your stay, boys? he asked. It was swell, Cal said. But you've got things all. I was wondering when you plan to leave for the capital. Don't misunderstand me. We'd like you to stay as long as you want to, but... For God's sake, Cal snapped, will you please listen to me? Mayor Panley was visibly shaken. Why, of course, Captain Gallus, of course. Why, certainly. He lapsed into silence. I'm not Bobby Gallus, Cal said, and this isn't Gary Dale. The mayor nodded his head. You're not Gallus and Dale, he said slowly. That's right, Cal said. We didn't go to Earth. We came here from there. This is the first time we've ever been on Mars. Do you understand? We're Earthmen. Earthmen? The mayor considered this for a second and then burst out laughing. Why, that's preposterous, absolutely preposterous. His laugh rose in volume to a bellow. Oh, you're joking. I should have known. You're only joking. We're not joking. This is all some kind of horrible mistake. We're the first men to land on Mars. You've got to understand that, Dave pleaded. The mayor was still laughing. He walked to the door and opened it. All right, boys, you've had your little joke. You've earned the right to it. I'll make arrangements for you to leave for Dome City in the morning. He shook his head and chuckled again. Earth man, tisk tisk. And then he was gone. They sat alone in the hotel room. It was like any Earth hotel they had ever been in. A big, soft bed. A wall telephone two dressers two armchairs a big mirror over one of the dressers a television set on the other dresser this is screwy dave said is it possible we're back on earth is it possible the joke is on us maybe everyone is just ribbing us maybe we've been going around in circles for four years maybe no Cal said, we're on Mars all right. I don't know exactly how to explain it, but I've got an idea. What's that? Dave asked. Cal shrugged. Probably all wrong, of course, but it has something to do with comparable development of cultures on different planets. You mean Mars is in exactly the same state of development as Earth? Something like that. You know the theory give two different places the same materials to start with and their cultures will run parallel to each other for the rest of their existence sure dave said but these guys gallus and dale how the hell could we possibly be mistaken for them i don't know cal leaned back on the bed and stared at the ceiling maybe we'll find out in dome city maybe Dave repeated hollowly. The president of the planet greeted their ship in Dome City. There were more parades, banners, bands, banquets, reporters, cameras, confettis, women, speeches, presentations. And at last they stood before the president's desk, two bodyguards standing on either side of him. He was a thin man, slightly balding, with rimless glasses. Gentlemen, he said, I don't have to tell you how pleased I am. Cal took a deep breath. We've been trying to tell Major Panley, he said, that we are not Gallus and Dale. The president smiled. I know. He told me of your little joke. It's not a joke. The president cocked an eyebrow. No. He looked at his bodyguards. Do you feel any ill effects in space? he asked. Cal grimaced. Oh, great. Now he thinks we're psycho. 
Look, can't you get this through your heads? We are from Earth. We never heard of Gallison Dale. My name is Calvin Manners, and this is David Langley. Very interesting, the President said. He tapped his finger on the back of his other hand and stared at the two Earthmen. He reached over toward the intercom on his desk then and pressed a button. Yes, a woman's voice answered. Miss Daniels, will you bring in the photos of Captain Gallus and Lieutenant Dale, please? Yes, sir. The President turned to the two men again. Those are your ranks, are they not? Yes, but we're in the United States Army. The what? The United States Army. The United States is a country on Earth. Really? Now we're getting somewhere. What else does Earth have? What is it like? Are the inhabitants intelligent? Yes, we are. We're Earthmen. Can't you understand that? I think you're carrying the joke a little too far, gentlemen. A joke is a joke. But we've spent millions of dollars on your trip. Really, this is no time for banter. Cal opened his mouth, ready to protest, just as the outside door swung wide. An attractive blonde in a smart suit stepped into the room and walked to the president's desk. She kept her eyes glued on the two Earthmen, dropped two large photographs on the desk, and turned. She stared over her shoulder at Cal and Dave until she was gone. The president smiled knowingly. Women are falling all over you two, I imagine. We're both married, Cal said dryly. We don't care for all this. Married? The president was shocked. I thought we'd distinctly chosen unmarried men for the job. Strange. We've got wives on Earth, Dave said. Aha, the president said. Then they are intelligent beings. Pity, pity. A twinge of anticipation curled up Cal's spine. Pity? Why a pity? Why did you say that? Well, you know, surely you realize this was the only flight we could afford. What? For the meantime, anyway, we might attempt another flight in fifty years, sixty perhaps, maybe more. But you've already proven space travel, Captain Gallus. The achievement is ours. All we need now is the money to... Damn it, I am not Captain Gallus, Cal shouted. And we've got to get back to Earth. I've got a kid, Mr. President. He's six years old, and... Cal stopped abruptly. Oh, this is all nonsense. Why am I arguing with you? Can't you understand we are Earthmen? What do we have to do to prove it? The President sighed turned over the photographs on the desk. They were glossy prints of two men in uniform. They were young men in khaki, smiles on their faces. One of the men looked exactly like Calvin Manners. The other strongly resembled David Langley. Here are your photographs, the President said. This is you, Captain, and you, Lieutenant. They were taken before the trip. You're younger, of course. Cal stared at the photograph. It could have been he. The nose was a little sharper, perhaps, and the face thinner. But it could have been he. It could have been he. It's a freak accident, he shouted. A coincidence in two parallel cultures. A... Uh... He saw the look on the President's face then. It was a cold look, a suspicious one. Cal stopped speaking, sweat staining the armpits of his uniform shirt. The president grinned again. That's better. I understand the strain of space, gentlemen, but we must be practical, mustn't we? He paused. Shall we talk about Earth now? The only sound was a swish of jets against the grass as the big ship came down. Slowly, Nose pointed skyward, a yellow tail streaming out behind the tubes, it settled to the ground like a cat nuzzling its haunches against a velvet pillow. In the distance, the lights of New York danced crazily, 
gleaming from a thousand spires that scratched the sky. The radios blared forth excitedly, and the police cars screamed through the night as they rushed to City Hall to pick up the mayor. Inside the ship, Gary Dale peered through the viewport. I feel kind of funny, he said. A tremor of excitement flooded through Bobby Gallus' thin frame. Earth, he whispered. We made it. The End of Welcome Martians by S. A. Lombino The Foreign Hand Tie by Randall Garrett as David Gorton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. The Foreign Hand Tie by Randall Garrett. From Istanbul in Turkish Thrace to Moscow, USSR, is only a couple of hours outing for a round trip in a fast jet plane, a shade less than 1,100 miles in a bee line. Unfortunately, Mr. Raphael Poe had no way of chartering a bee. The United States cruiser Woonsocket, having made its placid way across the Mediterranean, up the Aegean Sea, and through the Dardanelles to Bosphorus, stopped overnight at Istanbul and then turned around and went back. On the way in, it had stopped at Gibraltar, Barcelona, Marseille, Genoa, Naples, and Athens, the main friendly ports on the northern side of the Mediterranean. On the way back, it performed the same ritual on the African side of the sea. Its most famous passengers were the American Secretary of State, two senators, and three representatives. Its most important passenger was Mr. Raphael Poe. During the voyage in, Mr. Raphael Poe remained locked in a stateroom all by himself, twiddling his thumbs restlessly and playing endless games of solitaire, making bets with himself on how long it would be before the ship hit the next big wave and wondering how long it would take a man to go nuts in isolation. On the voyage back, he was not aboard the wound socket at all, and no one missed him because only the captain and two other Navy men had known he was aboard, and they knew that he had been dropped overboard at Istanbul. The sleek, tapered cylindroid might easily have been mistaken for a naval torpedo, since it was roughly the same size and shape. Actually, it was a sort of hybrid, combining the torpedo and two-man submarine that the Japanese had used in World War II, plus refinements contributed by such apparently diverse arts as skin diving, cybernetics, and nucleonics. Inside this one-man underwater vessel, Raphael Poe lay prone, guiding the little atomic-powered submarine across the Black Sea, past Odessa, and up the Dnieper. The first leg, the 400 miles from the Bosphorus to the mouth of the river, was relatively easy. The 260 miles from there to the Napropovosk was a little more difficult, but not terribly so. It became increasingly more difficult as the Dnieper narrowed and became more shallow. On to Kiev, his course changed to Napropovosk from northeast to northwest for the next 250 miles. At Kiev, the river changed course again, heading north. 350 miles farther on, at Smolensk, he was heading almost due east. It had not been an easy trip. At night, he had surfaced to get his bearings and to recharge the air tanks. Several times, he had had to take to the land, using the caterpillar treads on the little machine because of obstacles in the river. At the end of the ninth day, he was still 180 miles from Moscow, but at that point he got out of the submarine and prepared himself for the trip overland. When he was ready, he pressed a special button on the control panel of the expensive little craft. Immediately, the special robot brain took over. It had recorded the trip upstream. By applying that information in reverse, a mirror image, so to speak, it began guiding itself back toward Istanbul, applying the necessary corrective factors that made the difference between an upstream and a downstream trip. If it had made a mistake or had been discovered, it would have blown itself to bits. As a tribute to modern robotics and ultra-micro-miniaturization, it is a fact that the little craft was picked up five days later a few miles from Istanbul by the USS Paducah. By that time, a certain Vladimir Terensky, a shambling, not-too-bright deaf-mute, had made his fully documented appearance in Moscow. Spies like fairies and other such elusive sprites traditionally come in rings. The reason for this circumstructural metaphor is obscure, but it remains a fact that a single spy, all by himself, is usually of very little use to anybody. Espionage, on any useful scale, requires organization. There is, as there should be, a reason for this. The purpose of espionage is to gather information. 
preferably useful information, against the wishes of and in spite of the efforts of a group, usually referred to as the enemy, which is endeavoring to prevent that information from getting into other hands than their own. Such activities obviously imply communication. An espionneur working for side A, who finds a bit of important information about side B, must obviously communicate that bit of information to side A, or it is of no use whatsoever. All of these factors pose complex problems. To begin with, the espionneur must get himself into a position in which he can get hold of the information he wants. Usually that means he must pass himself off as something he is not, a process which requires time. Then when he gets the information he is after, he must get it to his employers quickly. Information, like fish, becomes useless after a certain amount of time, and unlike fish, there is no known way of refrigerating it to retard spoilage. It is difficult to transmit information these days. It is actually easier for the espionneur to transmit it than to get it, generally speaking, but it is difficult for him to do both jobs at once. So the spy ring's two major parts consist of the ones who get the information from the enemy and the ones who transmit it back to their employers. Without magic, it is difficult for a single spy to be of any benefit, and magic, in this case, can be defined as some method by which information can be obtained or transmitted without fear of discovery by the enemy. During World War I, a competent spy equipped with a compact, transistorized shortwave communication system could have had himself a ball. If the system had included a miniature full-color television camera, he could have gone hog-wild. In those days, such equipment would have been magic. All this is not apropos of nothing. Mr. Raphael Poe was, in his own way, a magician. It is not to be supposed that the United States of America had no spy rings in the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics at that time. There were plenty of them. Raphael Poe could have, if it were so ordained, availed himself of the services of any one or all of them. He did not do so for two reasons. In the first place, the more people who are in on a secret, the more who can give it away. In other words, a ring, like a chain, is only as strong as its weakest section. In the second place, Raphael Poe didn't need any assistance in the first place. That is, he needed no more assistance than most magicians do, a shill in the audience. In this particular case, the shill was his brother, Leonard Poe. Operation Map Case was as ultra-secret as it could possibly be. Although there were perhaps two dozen men who knew of the existence of the operation by its code name, such as the naval officers who had helped get Raphael Poe to his destination, there were only five men who really knew what Operation Map Case was all about. Two of these were, of course, Raphael and Leonard Poe. Two others were the President of the United States and the Secretary of Defense. The fifth was Colonel Julius T. Spaulding of United States Army Intelligence. On the seventh day after Raphael Poe's arrival in Moscow, the other four men met in Blair House, across the street from the White House, in a room especially prepared for the purpose. No one but the President knew the exact purpose of the meeting, although they had an idea that he wanted more information of some kind. The President himself was the last to arrive. Leaving two Secret Service men standing outside the room, he carefully closed the door and turned to face the Secretary of Defense, Colonel Spaulding, and Leonard Poe. "'Sit down, gentlemen,' he said, seating himself as he spoke. "'Gentlemen, before we go any further, I must conduct one final experiment in order to justify Operation Mapcase. I will not explain it just yet.' He looked at Lenny Poe, a small, dark-haired man with a largish nose. Mr. Poe, can you contact your brother at this moment? Lenny Poe was a man who was not overawed by anyone and had no inclination to be formal, not even toward the president. Yeah, sure, he said matter-of-factly. The president glanced at his watch. It is now five minutes of ten. That makes it five minutes of six in the evening of Moscow. Is your brother free to move around? That is, can he go to a certain place in the city? Lenny closed his eyes for a moment, then opened them. Rafe says he can go any place that the average citizen would be allowed to go. Excellent, said the president. He gave Lenny an address, an intersection of two streets not far from Red Square. Can he get there within fifteen minutes? Make it twenty, said Lenny. Very well, twenty minutes. When he gets there, I'll ask you to relay further instructions. Lenny Poe closed his eyes, folded his arms, and relaxed in his chair. The other three men waited silently. Nineteen minutes later, Lenny opened his eyes and said, Okay, he's there. Now what? There's a lamp post on that corner, I believe, said the president. Can your brother see it? Lenny closed his eyes again. Sure. There's a guy leaning against it. 
The president's eyes brightened. Describe him. Lenny's eyes still closed, said, Five feet ten, heavy set, gray hair, dark rimmed glasses, brown suit, flashy necktie. By the cut of his clothes, I'd say he was either British or American, probably American, 55 or 56 years old. It was obvious to the Secretary of Defense and to Colonel Spaulding that the president was suppressing some inward excitement. Very good, Mr. Poe, he said. Now you will find a box of colored pencils and a sketch pad in that desk over there. Can you draw me a fairly accurate sketch of that man? Yeah, sure. Lenny opened his eyes, moved over to the desk, took out the pencils and sketch pad, and went to work. He had to close his eyes occasionally, but his work was incredibly rapid, and at the same time almost photographically accurate. As the picture took form, the president's inward excitement increased perceptibly. When it was finally finished, Lenny handed the sketch to the president without a word. The president took it eagerly, and his face broke out in his famous grin. Excellent. Perfect. He looked at Lenny. Your brother hasn't attracted the man's attention in any way, has he? Nope, said Lenny. Fine. The experiment is over. Relay my thanks to your brother. He can go ahead with whatever he was doing now. I don't quite understand, said the Secretary of State. I felt it necessary to make one final experiment of my own devising, the President said. I wanted Raphael Poe to go to a particular place at a particular time, with no advance warning, to transmit a picture of something he had never seen before. I arranged this test myself, and I am positive that there could be no trickery. Never seen before? The secretary repeated bewilderedly. He gestured at the sketch. Why, that's obviously Bill Donovan of the Moscow delegation. Poe could have seen a photograph of him somewhere before. Even so, the president pointed out, there would be no way of knowing that he would be at that spot, but that's beside the point. Look at that necktie. I had noticed it, the defense secretary admitted. It was certainly an outstanding piece of neckwear. As drawn by Leonard Poe, it was a piece of brilliant chartreuse silk, fully three and a half inches wide at its broadest. Against that background, rose-pink nude girls were cavorting with pale mauve satyrs. That tie, said the president, was sent to me 15 years ago by one of my constituents when I was in Congress. I never wore it, of course, but it would have been criminal to have thrown away such a magnificently obscene example of bad taste as that. I sent it to Donovan in a sealed diplomatic pouch by special courier, with instructions to wear it at this time. He, of course, has no idea why he is standing there. He is merely obeying orders. Gentlemen, this is completely convincing me. Absolutely no one but myself knew what I had in mind. It would have required telepathy even to cheat. Thank you very much, Mr. Poe. Colonel Spaulding, you may proceed with Operation Mapcase as planned. Dr. Malakronovo, will you initial these requisition forms, please? Dr. Sonia Malakronova, a dowdy-looking middle-aged woman with unplucked eyebrows and a mole on her chin, adjusted her steel-rimmed glasses, took the proffered papers from the clerk, ran her eyes over them, and then put her initials on the bottom of each page. Thank you, comrade doctor said the clerk when she handed back the sheaf of papers. Certainly, comrade. And the two of them went about their business. Not far away in the Cathedral of St. Basil, Vladimir Turinsky, alias Raphael Poe, was also apparently going about his business. The cathedral had not seen nor heard of liturgy of the Russian Orthodox Church or any other church for a good many decades. The Bolsheviks, in their zeal to protect the citizens of the Soviet Unions from the pernicious influence of religion, had converted it into a museum as soon as possible. It was the function of Tovarish Turinsky to push a broom around the floors of the museum, and this he did with great determination and efficiency. He also cleaned windows and polished metalwork when the occasion demanded. He was only one of a large crew of similarly employed men, but he was a favorite with the head custodian, who not only felt sorry for the simple-minded deaf-mute, but appreciated the hard work he did. If on occasion Comrade Turinsky would lean on his broom and fall into a short reverie, it was excusable because he still managed to get all his work done. Behind Comrade Torinsky, a guide was explaining a display to a group of tourists, but Torinsky ignored the distraction and kept his mind focused on the thoughts of Dr. Sonia Malarkonova. After nearly ten months of patient work, Raphael Poe had hit upon something that was, to his way of thinking, more important than all the information he had transmitted to Washington thus far. Picking brains telepathically was not, even for him, an easy job. 
He had the knack and the training, but in addition, there was the necessity of establishing a rapport with the other mind. Since he was a physicist and not a politician, it was much easier to get information from the mind of Sonia Malakronova than to get it from the premier. The only person with whom he could keep in contact over any great distance was his brother, and that only because the two of them had grown up together. He could pick up the strongest thoughts of any nearby person very easily. He did not need to hear the actual words, for instance, of a nearby conversation in order to follow it perfectly, because the words of verbal communication were strong in a person's mind. But getting deeper than that required an increasing amount of understanding of the functioning of the other person's mind. His ability to eavesdrop on conversations had been of immense benefit to Washington so far, but it was difficult for him to get close enough to the higher-ups in the Soviet government to get all the data that the President of the United States wanted. But now that he had established a firm mental linkage with one of the greatest physicists in the Soviet Union, he could begin to send information that would be of tremendous value to the United States. He brushed up a pile of trash, pushed it into a dustpan, and carried it off toward the disposal chute that led to the trash cans. In the room where the brooms were kept, he paused and closed his eyes. Lenny, are they picking this up? Sure, Rafe. I'm ready with the drawing board any time you are. As Dr. Sonia Malakrinova stood in her laboratory looking over the apparatus she was perfecting for the glory of the Soviet state, she had no notion that someone halfway around the world was also looking at it over her shoulder, or rather, through her own eyes. Lenny started with the fives first, and worked his way up to the larger denominations. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five, thirty, forty, fifty, sixty, he muttered happily to himself. Two, fifty, three... 350, 4, 450. It was all there, so he smiled benevolently at the man in the pay window. Thank you much, Lee. Then he stepped aside to let another lucky man cash a winning ticket. His horse had come in at 15, 610, 450 for straight place and show, and 60 bucks on the nose had paid off very nicely. Lenny Poe took out his copy of the daily racing for him and checked over the listing for the next race. Hmm. Ha. Huh. Purse. 7,500. Four-year-olds and up. Handicap. Seven furlongs. Turf course. Mm hmm Lenny Poe had a passion for throwing his money away on any unpredictable event that would offer him odds. He had, deep down, an artistic soul, but he didn't let that interfere with his desire to lay a bet at the drop of an old fedora. He had already decided several hours before that Duck Soup in the next race would win handily and would pay off at something like 20 or 25 to 1 but he felt it his duty to look one last time at the previous performance record, just to be absolutely positive. Satisfied, he folded the racing form, shoved it back into his pocket, and walked over to the $50 window. "'Give me nine tickets on duck soup in the seventh, he said, plonking the handful of bills down on the counter. But before the man behind the window grading could take the money, a huge ham-like and rather hairy hand came down on top of his own hand, covering it and the money at the same time. "'Hold it, Lenny.' said a voice at the same time. Lenny jerked his head around to his right, and looked up to see a largish man who had cop written all over him. Another such individual crowded past Lenny on his left to flash a badge on the man in the betting window so that he would know that this wasn't a hold-up. Hey, said Lenny. His mind was thinking fast. He decided to play his favorite role, that of indignant Italian. What's the matter with you, huh? This a no free country. A man got a no rights. Come on, Mr. Poe, the big man said quietly. This is important. Poe, you out of your mind. That's the name of a river, or a raven. I'm a forget a which. My name is a Manelli. Scusi, signore, the big man said with exaggerated politeness. Masele a veramente italiano. Non è l'uomo che sarciamo. Lenny's Italian was limited to a handful of words. He knew he was trapped, but he faced the situation with a plume. That's a lie. I was in a Chicago that night. Ah, oh, Cosa Cordero. Avanti, Saca Santoni. He jerked his thumb toward the gate. Let's go. Lenny muttered something that the big man didn't quite catch. What'd you say? Upper United States. The northern United States. Lenny said calmly, shoving his 450 bills into his pocket. That's where Chicago is. Never mind. Come in, boys. Back to the drawing board. The two men escorted Lenny to a big, powerful Lincoln. He climbed into the back seat with the big one, while the other one got behind the wheel. As soon as they had left the racetrack and were well out on the highway, the driver said, You want to call in, Mario? This traffic is pretty heavy. 
The big man beside Lenny leaned forward over the back of the front seat, unhooked the receiver of the scrambler-equipped radiophone, and sat back down. He thumbed a button on the side of the handset and said, This is 702. After a short silence, he said, You can call off the net. You want him brought in? He listened for a moment. Okay. Are we clear through the main gate? Okay. Off. He leaned forward to replace the receiver, speaking to the driver as he did so. Straight to the Air Force Base. They've got a jet there waiting for him. He settled back comfortably and looked at Lenny. You can at least tell people where you're going. Very well, said Lenny. He folded his arms, closed his eyes, and relaxed. Right now, I'm going off to dreamland. He waited a short while to see if the other would say anything. He didn't, so Lenny proceeded to do exactly what he had promised to do. He went off to dreamland. He had not been absolutely sure when he made the promise that he would actually do just that, but the odds were in favor of it. It was now one o'clock in the morning in Moscow, and Lenny's brother, Raphael, was a man of regular habits. Lenny reached out. When he made contact, all he got was a jumble of hash. It was as though someone had made a movie by cutting bits and snippets from a hundred different films, no bit more than six or seven frames long, with a soundtrack that might or might not match, and projected the result through a drifting fog using an ever-changing lens that rippled like the surface of a wind-ruffled pool. Sometimes one figure would come into sharp focus for a fraction of a second, sometimes in color, sometimes not. Sometimes Lenny was merely observing the show. Sometimes he was in it. Rafe! Hey, Rafe! Wake up! The jumble of hash began to stabilize, becoming more coherent. Lenny sat behind the far desk, watching his brother come up the primrose path in a unicycle. He pulled it to a halt in front of the desk, opened the pilot's canopy, threw out a rope ladder, and climbed down. His gait was a little awkward in spite of the sponge rubber floor because of the huge flowered carpet bag he was carrying. A battered top hat sat precariously on his blonde curly hair. Lenny, boy, am I glad to see you. I got it. The whole trouble is in the wonkler, where the spadulator comes across the trellis grid. He lifted the carpet bag and sat it down on the lab table. Connect up the grovel meter. We'll show those Pentagon pickles who has the push and go here. Rafe, Lenny said gently. Wake up. You're dreaming. You're asleep. I want to talk to you. I know, he grinned widely. And you don't want any back talk from me. Yock, 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 just wait till I show you. In his hands, he held an object which Lenny did not at first understand. Then Rafe's mind brought it into focus. This, Rafe held it up, is a rocket motor. Rafe, wake up, Lenny said. The surroundings stabilized a little more. I will in just a minute, Lenny, Rafe was apologetic. But let me show you this. It did bear some resemblance to a rocket motor. It was about as long as a man's forearm and consisted of a bulbous chamber at one end, which narrowed down into a throat and then widened into a horn-like exhaust nozzle. The chamber was black, the rest was shiny chrome. Rafe grasped it by the throat with one hand. The other he clasped firmly around the combustion chamber. Watch! Now watch! He gave the bulbous, rubbery chamber a hard squeeze. Squawk! went the horn. Rafe! Lenny shouted. Wake up! Wake up! Rafe blinked as the situation clarified. What? Just a second, Lenny. Just... a second. Raphael Poe blinked his eyes open. The moon was shining through the dirty windows of the dingy little room that was all he could call home. For a while, at least. Outside the window were the gray streets of Moscow. His brother's thoughts resounded in his fully awake brain. Rafe, you like... Sure, sure. What is it? The conversation that followed was not in words or pictures, but a weird combination of both, plus a strong admixture of linking concepts that were neither. In essence, Lenny merely reported that he had taken the day off to go to the races, and that Colonel Spaulding was evidently upset for some reason. He wondered if Rafe were in any kind of trouble. No trouble. Everything's fine at this end. But Dr. Malakrinova won't be back on the job until tomorrow afternoon. Or this afternoon, rather. I know. Lenny replied. That's why I figured I could take time off for a go at the ponies. I wonder why they're in such a fuss, then, Rafe thought. I'll let you know when I find out, Lenny said. Go back to sleep and don't worry. In a small office in the Pentagon, Colonel Julius T. Spaulding cradled the telephone on his desk and looked at the Secretary of Defense. That was the airfield. Poe will be here shortly. We'll get to the bottom of this pretty quickly. I hope so, Julius, the Secretary said heavily. The president is beginning to think we're both nuts. The colonel, a lean, nervous man with dark, bushy eyebrows and a mustache to match, 
rolled his eyes upward toward the ceiling. I'm beginning to agree with him. The defense secretary scowled at him. What do you mean? Anybody who takes telepathy seriously is considered a nut, said the colonel. True, said the secretary, but that doesn't mean we are nuts. Oh, yeah? The colonel took a cigar out of his mouth and gestured with it. Anybody who'd do something that convinces all his friends he's nuts must be nuts. The secretary smiled wanly. I wish you wouldn't be so logical. You almost convinced me. Don't worry, said the colonel. I'm not ready to have this room measured for sponge rubber wallpaper just yet. Operation Mapcase has helped a lot in the past few months, and it will help even more. All you have to do is get the bugs out of it, said the secretary. If we did that, Colonel Spaulding said flatly, the whole operation would fold from lack of personnel. Just carry on the best you can, the secretary said gloomily as he got up to leave. I'll let you handle it. Fine, I'll call you later. Twenty minutes after the defense secretary had gone, Lenny Poe was shown into Colonel Spaulding's office. The agent who had brought him in closed the door gently, leaving him alone with the colonel. I told you I'd be back this evening. What were you in such a hurry about? You're supposed to stay in touch, Colonel Spaulding pointed out. I don't mind your penchant for ponies particularly, but I'd like to know where to find you if I need you. I wouldn't mind in the least, Colonel. I'd phone you every fifteen minutes if that's what you wanted, except for one thing. What's that? Lenny jerked a thumb over his shoulder. Your linguistically talented flat feet. Did you ever try to get into a floating crap game where you were being followed by a couple of bruises who look more like cops than cops do? Look, Poe, I can find you plenty of action right here in Washington if it won't offend your tender sensibilities to shoot crap with a senator or two. Meanwhile, sit down and listen. This is important. Lenny sat down reluctantly. Okay, what is it? Dr. Davenport and his crew are unhappy about that last batch of drawings you and I gave them. What's the matter? Don't they like the color scheme? I never thought scientists had any artistic taste anyway. It's got nothing to do with that. The the phone rang. Colonel Spaulding scooped it up and identified himself then. What? Yeah. All right. Send him in. He hung up and looked back at Lenny. Davenport. We can get a story firsthand. Just sit there and look important. Lenny nodded. He knew that Dr. Amadeus Davenport was aware that the source of those drawings was Soviet Russia, but he did not know how they had been obtained. As far as he knew, it was just plain, ordinary spy work. He came in briskly. He was a tall, intelligent-looking man with a rather craggy face and thoughtful brown eyes. He put a large briefcase on the floor, and after the preliminaries were over, he came right to the point. Colonel Spaulding, I spoke to the Secretary of Defense, and he agreed that perhaps this situation might be cleared up if I talked directly with you. I hope so, the Colonel said. Just what is it that seems to be bothering you? These drawings, Davenport said. Don't make any sense. The device they're supposed to represent couldn't do anything. Look, I'll show you. He took from his briefcase photostatic copies of some of the drawings Lenny had made. Five of them were straight blueprint-type drawings. The sixth was a copy of Lenny's near-photographic paintings of the device itself. This component here, he said, gesturing at the set of drawings, simply baffles us. We have the opinion that your agents are known to the Soviet government and have been handed a set of phony plans. What's it supposed to do? Lenny asked. We don't know what it's supposed to do, the scientist said, but it's doubtful that it would actually do anything. He selected one of the photocopies. See that thing, the one shaped like the letter Q with an offset tail? According to the specifications, it is supposed to be painted emerald green, but there's no indication of what it is. Lenny Poe reached out, picked up a photocopy, and looked at it. It was, or had been, an exact copy of the drawing that was used by Dr. Sonia Malakrinova. But whereas the original drawing had been labeled entirely in Cyrillic characters, these labels were now in English. The drawings made no sense to Lenny at all. They hadn't when he had made them. His brother was a scientist, but Lenny understood none of it. Who translated the Russian into English? he asked. A Mr. Berinsky. He's one of our best experts on the subject. I assure you the translations are accurate. Dr. Davenport said. But if you don't know what the thing is, the colonel objected, how can you say the device won't work? Maybe it would if that Q-shaped thing was... I know what you mean, Davenport interrupted. But that's not the only part of the machine that doesn't make any sense. He went on to explain other discrepancies he had detected in the drawings, but none of it penetrated to Lenny, although Colonel Spaulding seemed to be able to follow the physicist's conversation fairly readily. Well, what's your suggestion, doctor? the colonel asked at last. 
If your agents can get further data, the physicist said carefully, it might be of some use. At the same time, I'd check up on the possibility that your agents are known to the NKVD. I'll see what can be done, said the colonel. Would you mind leaving those copies of the drawings with me for a while? Go right ahead, Davenport said. One other thing, if we assume this device is genuine, then it must serve some purpose. It might help if we knew what the device is supposed to do. I'll see what can be done, Colonel Spaulding repeated. When Davenport had gone, Spaulding looked at Poe. Got any explanation for that one? No, Lenny admitted. All I can do is check with Rafe. He won't be awake for a few hours yet. I'll check on it and give you an answer in the morning. Early next morning, Colonel Spaulding walked through his outer office. He stopped at the desk where the pretty brunette WAC sergeant was typing industriously, leaned across the desk, and gave her his best leer. How about a date tonight, music lover? he asked. Das Rheingold is playing tonight. A night at the opera would do you good. I'm sorry, sir, she said primly. You know enlisted women aren't allowed to date officers. Make out an application for OCS. I'll sign it. She smiled at him. But then I wouldn't have any excuse for turning you down. And then what would my husband say? I'll bribe him. I'll send him to OCS. He's not eligible. Officers are automatically disqualified. Colonel Spaulding sighed. Ah, guy can't win against competition like that. Anything new this morning? Mr. Poe is waiting in your office. Other than that, there's just the routine things. He went on into his office. Lenny Poe was seated behind the colonel's desk, leaning back in the swivel chair, his feet on top of the desk. He was sound asleep. The colonel walked over to the desk, took his cigar from his mouth, and said, Good morning, Colonel Spaulding. Lenny snapped awake. I'm not Colonel Spaulding, he said. Then why are you sitting in Colonel Spaulding's chair? I figured if I was asleep, nobody would know the difference. Lenny got up and walked over to one of the other chairs. These don't lean back comfortably. I can't sleep in them. You can sleep later. How was your session with Rafe? Lenny glowered glumly. I wish you and Rafe hadn't talked me into this job. It's a strain on the brain. I don't know how he expects anyone to understand all that garbage. All what garbage? Lenny waved a hand aimlessly. All this scientific guff. I'm an artist, not a scientist. If Rafe can get me a clear picture of something, I can copy it. But when he tries to explain something scientific... He might as well be thinking in Russian or old upper-middle-high Martian or something. I know, said Colonel Spaulding, looking almost as glum as Lenny. Did you get anything at all that would help Dr. Davenport figure out what those drawings mean? Rafe said that the translations are all wrong, Lenny said. I can't get a clear picture of just what is wrong. Colonel Spaulding thought for a while in silence. Telepathy, at least insofar as the Poe brothers practiced it, certainly had its limitations. Lenny couldn't communicate mentally with anyone except his brother Rafe. Rafe could pick up the thoughts of almost anyone if he happened to be close by, but couldn't communicate over a long distance with anyone but Lenny. The main trouble lay in the fact that it was apparently impossible to transmit a concept directly from brain A to brain B unless the basic building blocks of the concept were already present in brain B. Raphael Poe, for instance, had spent a long time studying Russian, reading Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, and Turgenev, in the original tongue, familiarizing himself with modern Russian thought through the courtesy of Izvestia, Pravda, and Crocodil, and finally spending time in the United States building and near the Russian embassy, in order to be sure that he could understand the mental processes involved. Now, science has a language of its own, or rather, a multiplicity of languages, each derived partly from the native language of various scientific groups and partly of borrowings from other languages. In the physical sciences especially, the language of mathematics is a further addition. More than that, the practice of the scientific method automatically induces a thought pattern that is different from the type of thought pattern that occurs in the mind of a person who is not scientifically oriented. Lenny's mind was a long way from being scientifically oriented. Worse, he was a bigot. He not only didn't know why the light in his room went on when he flipped a switch, he didn't want to know. To him, science was just so much flummery, and he didn't want his brain cluttered up with it. Facts mean nothing to a bigot. He has already made up his mind, and he doesn't intend to have his solid convictions disturbed by anything so unimportant as a contradictory fact. Lenny was of the opinion that all mathematics was arcane gobbledygook, and his precise knowledge of the mathematical odds in poker and dice games didn't abate that opinion one whit. Obviously, a mind like that is utterly incapable of understanding a projected thought of 
scientific content. Such a thought bounces off the impregnable mind shield that the bigot has set up around his little area of bigotry. Colonel Spaulding had been aware of these circumstances since the inception of the Operation Mapcase. Even though he himself had never experienced telepathy more than half a dozen times in his life, he had made a study of the subject and was pretty well aware of its limitations. The colonel might have dismissed, as most men do, his own fleeting experiences as coincidence or imagination, if it had not been for the things he had seen and felt in Africa during World War II. He had only been a captain then, on detached duty with British intelligence, under crusty old Colonel Sir Cecil Haversham, who didn't believe a word of all that mystic nonsense. Colonel Haversham had made the mistake of alienating one of the most powerful of the local witch doctors. The British government had hushed it all up afterwards, of course, but Spaulding still shuddered when he thought of the broken-spirited, shrunken caricature of his old self that Colonel Haversham had become after he told the witch doctor where to get off. Spaulding had known that there were weaknesses in the telepathic communication linkage that was the mainspring of Operation Mapcase, but he had thought they could be overcome by the strength of the system. Lenny had no blockage whatever against receiving visual patterns and designs. He could reproduce an electronic wiring diagram perfectly because, to him, it was not a grouping of scientific symbols, but a design of lines, angles, and curves. At first, it is true, he had a tendency to change them here and there, to make the design balance better to make it more aesthetically satisfying to his artistic eye. But that tendency had been easily overcome, and Colonel Spaulding was quite certain that that wasn't what was wrong now. Still, Lenny, he said carefully, are you sure you didn't jigger up those drawings to make them look prettier? Lenny Poe gave the Colonel a look of disgust. Positive. Race checked them over every inch of the way as I was drawing them, and he rechecked again last night, or this morning, on those photostats Davenport gave us. That's when he said there was something wrong with the translations. But he couldn't make it clear just what was wrong? Eh? Lenny shrugged. How can anybody make any sense out of that gobbledygook is beyond me. The colonel blew out a cloud of cigar smoke and looked thoughtfully at the ceiling. As long as the diagrams were just designs on paper, Lenny Poe could pick them up fine, which meant that everything was Jim Dandy as long as the wiring diagrams were labeled in the Cyrillic alphabet. The labels were just more squiggles to be copied as a part of the design. But if the labels were in English, Lenny's mind would try to make sense out of them. And since scientific concepts did not make sense to him, the labels came out as pure nonsense. In one of his drawings, the lead wire had been labeled simply ground to powder, and if the original drawing hadn't been handy to check with, it might have taken quite a bit of thought to realize what was meant was to power supply ground. Another time, a GE2N188A transistor had come out labeled GEZNISSA. There were others much worse. Russian characters, on the other hand, didn't have to make any sense to Lenny, so his mind didn't try to force them into a preconceived mold. Lenny unzipped his leather portfolio he had brought with him, a specially made carrier that looked somewhat like an oversized briefcase. Maybe these'll help, he said. We managed to get two good sketches of the gadget, at least as much of it as that Russian lady scientist has put together so far. I kind of like the rather abstract effect you get from all those wires snaking in and around, with that... Green glass tube in the center. Pretty, isn't it? Very, said the colonel without conviction. I wonder if it will help Davenport any. He looked at the pictures for several seconds more. Then suddenly, his eyes narrowed. Lenny, this piece of green glass, the thing's shaped like the letter Q. Yeah, sort of. Why? You said it was a tube, but you didn't make it look hollow when you drew it. It isn't. It's solid. Does a tube have to be hollow? Yeah, I guess it does, doesn't it? Well, then, it isn't a tube. Colonel Spaulding picked up the phone and dialed a number. Colonel Spaulding here, he said after a moment. Let me speak to Dr. Davenport. And after a wait. This is Colonel Spaulding, Doctor. I think we may have something for you. Good morning, Colonel. I'm glad to hear that. What is it? The Q-shaped gadget, the one that you said was supposed to be painted emerald green. Are you sure that's the right translation of the Russian? Well, um... Davenport hesitated. I can't be sure on my own say-so, of course. I don't understand Russian. But I assure you that Mr. Berinsky is perfectly reliable. Oh, I have no doubt of that, Colonel Spaulding said easily. But tell me, does Mr. Berinsky know how to read a circuit diagram? He does, Davenport said somewhat testily. Of course, he wasn't shown the diagram itself. We had the Russian labels copied, and he translated from a list. I had a sneaking suspicion that was it, said Spaulding. 
Tell me, doctor, what does L-E-A-D spell? Lead, said the doctor, promptly pronouncing it L-E-E-D. Then, after a pause, he said, or lead, this time pronouncing it L-E-D. It would depend on the context. Suppose it was on a circuit diagram, the colonel prompted. Then it would probably be lead. What's all this leading up to, colonel? Bear with me. Suppose you had a cable coming from a storage battery, and you wanted to make sure that the cable was reasonably resistant to corrosion. So you order it made out of the metal lead. It would be a L-E-D-L-E-E-D, -E -E wouldn't it? Um, I suppose so. You might get pretty confused if you didn't have a circuit diagram in front of you to tell you what the label was talking about, mightn't you? I see what you mean, the scientist said slowly. But we can't show those circuit diagrams to Berinsky. The Secretary of Defense himself has classified them as Class AAA Ultra Hyper Top Secret. That puts them just below the Burn the Contents Before Reading class, and Berinsky doesn't have that kind of clearance. Then get somebody else, Colonel Spaulding said tiredly. All you need is a man who can understand technical Russian and has a top-level secrecy clearance. If we haven't got at least one man in these United States with such simple qualifications as those, then we might as well give the country over to the Reds or back to the Redskins, since our culture is irreprievably doomed. And he lowered the phone gently to its cradle. There's no such word as irreprievably, Lenny pointed out. There is now, said Colonel Spaulding. Raphael Poe moseyed through the streets of Moscow in an apparently aimless manner. The expression on his face was that of a reasonably happy moron. His aimless manner was only apparent. Actually, he was heading toward the Lenin Soviet People's Higher Research Laboratories. Dr. Sonia Borisovna Malakronova would be working late this evening, and he wanted to get as close as possible in order to pick up as much information as he could. Rafe had a great deal of admiration for that woman, he admitted to himself. She was... Granted, as plain as unsalted matzah. No, that was an understatement. If it were possible to die of the uglies, Sonia Borisovna would have been dangerously ill. Her disposition did nothing to alleviate that drawback. She fancied herself as cold, hard, analytical, and ruthless. Actually, she was waspish, arrogant, overbearing, and treacherous. What she considered in herself to be scientific detachment was really an isolation born of fear and distrust of the entire human race. To her, communism was a religion, Das Kapital, and the Communist Manifesto were holy writ enshrining the dogmata of Marxism-Leninism, and the conflict with the West was a jihad, a holy war, in which God, in his manifestation as dialectic materialism, would naturally win out in the end. All of which goes to show that a scientific bent in itself does not necessarily keep one from being a bigot. Rafe's admiration for the woman stemmed solely from the fact that in spite of all the powerful drawbacks that existed in her mind, she was still capable of being a brilliant, if somewhat erratic, scientist. There was a more relaxed air in Moscow these days. The per capita production of the Soviet Union still did not come up to that of the United States, but the recent advances in technology did allow a feeling of accomplishment, and the hard drive for superiority was softened a trifle. It was no longer considered the height of indolence and unpatriotic time-wasting to sit on a bench and feed pigeons, nor was food so scarce and costly that throwing away a few breadcrumbs could be considered sabotage. So Rafe Poe found himself a quiet corner near the linen Soviet people's laboratories, took out a small bag of dried breadcrumbs, and was soon surrounded by pigeons. Dr. Malakronova was carefully calibrating and balancing the electronic circuits that energized and activated and controlled the output of the newly installed beam generator, a ring of specially made greenish glass that had a small cylinder of the same glass projecting out as a tangent. Her assistant, Alexis, a man of small scientific ability but a gifted mechanic, worked stolidly with her. It was not an easy job for Alexis. Sonia Borisovna was by no means an easy woman to work with. There was, as there should have been, a 50-50 division in all things, a proper state of affairs in a people's republic. Alexis Andreevich did half the physical work, got all the blame when things went wrong, and none of the credit when things went right. Sonia Borisovna got the remaining 50%. Sonia Borisovna Malakronova had been pushing herself too hard, and she knew it. But, she told herself, for the glory of the Soviet peoples, the work must go on. After spending two hours taking down instrument readings, she took the results to her office and began to correlate them. I have to replace that 149.0 micro-micro frequency control on stage two with something more sensitive, she thought. 
and the field modulation coils require closer adjustment. She took off her glasses and rubbed at her tired eyes while she thought. Perhaps the 25 microfarad, 12-volt electrolytic condenser could be used to feed the pigeons, substituting a breadcrumb capacitor in the sidewalk circuit. She opened her eyes suddenly and stared at the blank wall in front of her. Pigeons, she said wonderingly. Breadcrumb capacitor? Am I losing my mind? What kind of nonsense is that? She looked back down at her notes, then replaced her glasses so that she could read them. Determined not to let her mind wander in that erratic fashion again, she returned her attention to the work at hand. She found herself wondering if it might not be better to chuck the whole job and get out while the getting was good. The old gal, she thought, is actually tapping my mind. She's picking up everything. Sonia Borisovna sat bolt upright in her chair, staring at the blank wall again. Why am I thinking such nonsense? she said aloud. And why should I be thinking in English? When her words registered on her ears, she realized that she was actually speaking in English. She was thoroughly acquainted with the language, of course, but it was not normal for her to think in it unless she happened to be conversing with someone in that tongue. The first whisper of a suspicion began to take form in the mind of Dr. Sonia Borisovna Malakrinova. Half a block away, Raphael Poe emptied the last of his breadcrumbs on the sidewalk and began walking away. He kept his mind as blank as possible while his brow broke out in a cold sweat. That, said Colonel Julius Spaulding scathingly, is as pretty a mess as I've seen in years. It's a breadboard circuit, I'll admit, Dr. Davenport said defensively, but it's built according to the schematics you gave us. Doctor, said the colonel, during the war the British dropped our group a radio transmitter. It was the only way to get the stuff into Africa quickly. The parachute failed to open. The transmitter fell 2,000 feet, hit the side of a mountain, and tumbled down another 800 feet. When we found it four days later, its wiring was in better shape than that thing is now. That's quite sufficient to test the operation of the device, Davenport said coldly. Spaulding had to admit to himself that it probably was. The thing was a slapdash affair. The colonel had a strong feeling that Davenport had assigned the wiring job to an apprentice and gave him half an hour to do the job. But the soldering jobs looked tight enough, and the components didn't look as though they'd all been pulled out of the salvage bin. What irritated Colonel Spaulding was Davenport's notion that the whole thing was a waste of time, energy, money, and materials, and therefore there was no point in doing a decent job of testing it at all. He was glad that Davenport didn't know how the information about the device had been transported to the United States. As it was, he considered the drawings a hoax on the part of the Russians. If he had been told that they had been sent telepathically, he would probably have gone into fits of acute exasperation over such idiocy. The trouble with Davenport was that, since the device didn't make any sense to him, he didn't believe it would function at all. Oh, it will do something, all right, he'd said once. But it won't be anything that needs all that apparatus. Look here. He had pointed toward the schematic. Where do you think all that energy is going? All you're going to get is a little light, a lot of heat, and a couple of burned-out coils. I could do the same job cheaper with a dozen 250-watt light bulbs. To be perfectly honest with himself, Spaulding had to admit that he wasn't absolutely positive that the device would do anything in particular either. His own knowledge of electronic circuitry was limited to ham radio experience, and even that was many years out of date. He couldn't be absolutely sure that the specifications for the gadget hadn't been garbled in transmission. The Q-shaped gizmo, for instance. It had taken the better part of a week for Raphael Poe to transmit the information essential to the construction of that enigmatic bit of glass. Rafe had had to sit quietly in the privacy of his own room and print out the specifications in Russian, then sit and look at the paper while Lenny copied the design. Then each paper had to be carefully destroyed, which wasn't easy to do. You don't go around burning papers in a crowded Russian tenement unless you want the people in the next room to wonder what you're up to. Then the drawings Lenny had made had had to be translated into English, and the piece carefully made to specifications. Now here it was, all hooked up and presumably ready for action. Colonel Spaulding fervently hoped there would be some action. He didn't like the smug look on Dr. Amadeus Davenport's face. The device was hooked up on a testing room circuit and controlled from outside. The operation could be watched through a heavy pane of bulletproof glass. With all that power going into it, Davenport said, I don't want anyone to get hurt by spatters of molten metal when those field coils blow. They went outside to the control console, and Dr. Davenport flipped the energizing switch. 
After the device had warmed up on low power, Davenport began turning knobs slowly, increasing the power flow. In the testing room, the device just sat there, doing nothing visible, but the meters on the control console showed that something was going on. A greenish glow came from the housing that surrounded the Q-shaped gadget. Where the Russians made their mistake in trying to fool anyone with that thing was in their design of that laser component, said Dr. Davenport. Or, I should say, that thing that is supposed to look like a laser component. Laser? said Colonel Spaulding uncomprehendingly. It means light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, Davenport explained. Essentially, a laser consists of a gas-filled tube or a solid ruby bar with parallel mirrors at both ends. By exciting the atoms from outside, light is generated within the tube, and some of it begins to bounce back and forth between the mirrors at the ends. This tends to have a cascade effect on the atoms, which have picked up the energy from outside, so that more and more of the light generated inside the tube tends to be parallel to the length of the tube. One of the mirrors is only partially silvered, and eventually the light bouncing back and forth becomes powerful enough to flash through the half-silvered end, giving a coherent beam of light. Maybe that's what this is supposed to be, said the colonel. Davenport chuckled dryly. <laughs> Not a chance. Not with an essentially circular tube that isn't even silvered. Lenny Poe, the colonel noticed, wasn't the only person around who didn't care whether the thing he referred to as a tube was hollow or not. Is it doing anything? Colonel Spaulding asked anxiously, trying to read the meters over Davenport's shoulder. It's heating up, Davenport said dryly. Spaulding looked back at the apparatus. A wisp of smoke was rising slowly from a big coil. A relay clicked minutely. What? For a confused second, everything seemed to happen at once. But it didn't. There was a definite order to it. First, a spot on the ceramic tile wall of the room became suddenly red, orange, white hot. Then there was a little crater of incandescent fury as though a small volcano had erupted in the wall. Following that, there was a sputtering and crackling from the innards of the device itself, and a cloud of smoke arose suddenly, obscuring things in the room. Finally, there was the crash of circuit breakers as they reacted to the overload from the short circuit. There was silence for a moment, then the hiss of the automatic fire extinguishers in the testing room as they poured a cloud of carbon dioxide snow on the smoldering apparatus. There, said Davenport, with utter satisfaction. What did I tell you? You didn't tell me this thing was a heat ray projector, said Colonel Spaulding. What are you talking about? Dr. Davenport said disdainfully. Develop the film in those automatic cameras, Spaulding said, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. As far as Colonel Spaulding was concerned, the film showed clearly what had happened. A beam of energy had leaped from the tail of the Q-tube, hit the ceramic tile of the wall, and burned its way through in half a second or so. The hole in the wall, surrounded by fused ceramic, was mute evidence of the occurrence of what Spaulding had seen. But Dr. Davenport pooh-poohed the whole thing. Evidence to the contrary, he was quite certain that no such thing had happened. A piece of hot glass from a broken vacuum tube had done it, he insisted. A piece of hot glass had burned its way through half an inch of tile and a wall? Davenport muttered something about the destructive effects of shaped charges. He was more willing to believe that something as wildly improbable as that had happened than admit that the device had done what Colonel Spaulding was quite certain it had done. Within three hours, Davenport had three possible explanations of what had happened, each of which required at least four unlikely things to happen coincidentally. Colonel Spaulding stalked back to his office in a state of angry disgust. Just because the thing was foreign to Davenport's notions, he had effectively tied his own hands, and Colonel Spaulding's too. Where's Lenny Poe? he asked the WAC sergeant. I want to talk to him. She shook her head. I don't know, sir. Lieutenant Fesner called in half an hour ago. Mr. Poe has eluded them again. Colonel Spaulding gazed silently at the ceiling for a long moment, then... Sergeant Nugget, take a letter to the President of the United States, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, Washington, D.C. Dear sir, consider this my resignation. I've had so much experience with jackasses lately that I have decided to change my name to Hackenbush and become a veterinarian. Here's truly, etc. Got that? Yes, sir, said the sergeant. Burn it. When Fumblefingers Fesner and his boys find Lenny Poe again, I want to know immediately. He stalked on into his office. Raphael Poe was beginning to feel distinctly uncomfortable. Establishing a close rapport with another mind can be a distinct disadvantage at times. A spy is supposed to get information without giving any. A swapping of information is not at all to his advantage. 
it was impossible to keep his mind a perfect blank. What he had to do was keep his strongest surface thoughts entirely on innocuous things. The trouble was that it made it extremely difficult to think about some way to get out of the jam he was in. Thinking on two levels at once, while not impossible, required a nicety of control that made wire-walking over Niagara look easy. The thing to do was to make the surface thoughts automatically repetitive. A song. In a hall of strange description, antiquarian Egyptian, figuring his monthly balance sheet, a troubled monarch sat, with a frown upon his forehead, hurling interjections horrid at the state of his finances, for his pocketbook was flat. Simultaneously, he kept a picture in his mind's eye. It had to be something vivid that would be easy to concentrate on. The first thing that came to mind was the brilliant necktie that the president had used in his test several months before. He conjured it up in all its chartreuse glory, then he animated it. Mauve satyrs danced with rose-pink nymphs and chased them over the yellow-green landscape. Not a solitary single copper cent had he to jingle in his pocket and his architects had gone off on a strike, leaving pyramids unfinished for their wages had diminished and their credit vanished likewise in a way they didn't like. Rafe could tell that Dr. Malakranova's mind was trying to reject the alien ideas that were coming into her mind. She wasn't consciously trying to pick up Rafe's thoughts, but the rejection was ineffective because of its fascination. The old business about the horse's tail. If you see a white horse, you'll soon get rich if you can keep from thinking about the horse's tail until it's out of sight. The first thought that comes to mind is, I mustn't think about the horse's tail. A self-defeating proposition. If Sonia Borisovna had been certain that she was receiving the thoughts telepathically, she might have been able to reject them. But her mind rejected the idea of telepathy instead, so she was susceptible to the thoughts because she thought they were her own. The cavorting of the nymphs and satyrs became somewhat obscene, but Rafe didn't bother to correct it. He had more to worry about than offending the rather prim mind of Dr. Malakronova. It was harder for His Royal Highness than for Sons of Toil, for the horny-handed workmen only ate three fig per day, while the king liked sweet potatoes, puddings, pies, and canned tomatoes, boneless ham, and Blue Point oysters cooked some prehistoric way. What to do now? Should he try to get out of Russia? Was there any quick way out? He had all the information he needed on the heat beam projector that Dr. Malakronova was building. The theory behind it was perfectly clear. All it needed was further experimentation. If it worked out according to theory, it would be an almost perfect defense against even the fastest intercontinental ballistic missiles. As he growled, the royal grumbler spied a bit of broken tumbler in a long undusted corner just behind the chamber door. When his hungry optic spied it, he stood silently and eyed it. Then he smote his thigh with ecstasy and danced about the floor. Maybe he should try to make a run for the American embassy. No, no one there knew him, and they probably couldn't get him out of the country anyway. Besides, it would take him too long to explain the situation to them. By the wit Osiris gave me, this same bit of glass shall save me. I shall sell it as a diamond at some stupendous price, and whoever I ask to take it will find for his own sweet sake it will be better not to wait until I have to ask him twice. The theory behind the heat projector was simply an extension of the laser theory, plus a few refinements. Inside a ring made of the proper material, the light, acted upon by... Exterior magnetic fields tended to move in a circle, so that the photon cascade effect was all in one direction instead of bouncing back and forth between a pair of mirrors. That light could be bent around corners by making it travel through a glass rod was well known, and the Malacronova Q-tube took advantage of that effect. In a way, the principle was similar to that of the cyclotron, except that instead of spinning ions around in a circle to increase their velocity, a beam of coherent light was circulated to increase its intensity. Then, at the proper moment, a beam of intense coherent light shot out of the tangent that formed the tail of the Q-tube. If the material of the Q was properly constructed and contained atoms that fluoresced strongly in the infrared, you had a heat beam that delivered plenty of power. And since the radiation was linear and in step, the Q-tube didn't heat up much at all. The cascade effect took most of the energy out as radiation. Then a royal proclamation was dispatched throughout the nation, most imperatively calling to appear before the king under penalties most cruel every man who sold a jewel or who bought and bartered precious stones and all that sort of thing. But knowing all that didn't help Raphael Poe or the United States of America one whit if the information couldn't be gotten out of Russia and into Colonel Spaulding's hands. Lenny had told him of the trouble the colonel was having with Dr. Davenport. If he could only communicate with Lenny but if he did, Dr. Malakronova would pick up every bit of it, and that would be the end of that. 
No, he had to figure out some way to get himself and the information both out of the country. Meanwhile, he had to keep thinking of an animated necktie, and he had to keep singing. Thereupon the jeweler's nether joints all quaked and knocked together as they packed their saratogas in lugubrious despair. It was ever their misfortune to be pillaged by extortion, and they thought they smelled a rodent on the sultry desert air. Lenny Poe shoved open the door of Colonel Spaulding's outer office with a violence that startled Sergeant Nugget. Is Spaulding in? he barked. I think he's expecting you, she said. There was no time to buzz the colonel. Poe was already opening the door. Rafe's in trouble, Lenny said hurriedly, slamming the door behind him. Where have you been? snapped the colonel. Never mind that. Rafe's in trouble, I said. We gotta figure a way to get him out of it. Colonel Spaulding dropped all thought of bawling out Poe. What'd he say? What's the trouble? All he's doing is broadcasting that necktie, like an animated cartoon in Technicolor, and he's singing. Singing? Singing what? As they faced the great propylon with an apprehensive smile on, sculptured there in hieroglyphics six feet wide and nine feet high, was the thread of King Ramses to chop off every man to pieces, who, when showed the royal diamond, would dare refuse to buy. Colonel Spaulding blinked. That's pretty. What does it mean? Nothing. It's a song. That's all. That female Russian scientist can read Rafe's mind, and he's broadcasting this stuff to cover up. Quickly, he told Spaulding what the situation was, as he had been able to piece it together from Rafe's secondary thoughts. Ye gods! Colonel Spaulding slapped at his brow. Then he grabbed for the telephone and started dialing. Lenny dropped into one of the chairs, closed his eyes, and concentrated. Rafe! Rafe, listen to me! Rafe! Then the richest dealer, Mulai Hassan, eyed the gem and coolly said, The thing is but a common tumble bottom, nothing more. Whereupon the king's assassin drew his sword, and Mulai Hassan never peddled rings again upon the Nile's primeval shore. But below the interference came Rafe's thoughts and the one thing of primary importance to him was to get the information on the heat beam generator to the United States. No bigotry, no matter how strong, is totally impregnable. Even the most narrow-minded racial bigot will make an exception if a person of the despised race risks his own life to save the life of the bigot or someone the bigot loves. The bigotry doesn't collapse, not by a long shot, but an exception is made in that one case. Lenny Poe made an exception. Any information that was worth his brother's life was important. Therefore, it was not, could not be, scientific gobbledygook, no matter how it sounded. Rafe, give it to me. Try me. I can copy it. Then Abdullah Abdul Mahdi faintly said the stone was shoddy, but he thought that in a pinch he might bid fifty cents himself. There ensued a slight commotion where he could repent the notion that Abdullah was promoted to the oriental shelf. Rafe, stop singing that stupid song and give me the stuff. She can't learn anything if you just think about that theory stuff. She already knows that. Come on, give. Lenny Poe grabbed a pencil and a sheaf of paper from the colonel's desk and began writing frantically as the song of the Egyptian diamond stopped suddenly. Words. Nonsense words. That's all most of the stuff was to Lenny. It didn't matter. He spelled them as he thought they should be, and if he made a mistake, Rafe would correct him. Rafe tried to keep a picture of the words as they would look if printed while he thought them verbally, and that helped. The information came across in the only way it could come across. Not as concepts, but as symbols. Lenny hardly noticed that the Secretary of Defense and the President had come into the room. He didn't even realize that Colonel Spaulding was feeding him fresh sheets of paper. Lenny didn't seem to notice the time passing, nor the pain in his hand as the muscles tired. He kept writing. The President left with the Defense Secretary and came back again after a while, but Lenny ignored them. And when it was over, he pushed pencil and paper aside and, massaging his right hand with his left, sat there with his eyes closed. Then, slowly, a smile spread over his face. Well, I'll be damned, he said slowly and softly. Mr. Poe, said the president, is there any danger that your brother will be captured within the next hour? Lenny looked up with a startled grin. Oh, hi. I didn't notice you, Mr. President. What'd you say? The president repeated his question. Oh, no, that's nothing to worry about. The little men in white coats came after Dr. Mala Cronova. She started screaming that telepathic spies were stealing a secret. She smashed all her apparatus and burned all her papers on top of the wreckage before they could stop her. She keeps shouting about a pink and purple orgy and singing a song about glass diamonds and Egyptian kings. I wouldn't say she was actually insane, but she is very disturbed. Then your brother is safe? As safe as he ever was, Mr. President. Thank heaven for that, said the President. If they'd ever capture him and made him talk... He stopped. I forgot he said lamely after a moment. Lenny grinned. That's all right, Mr. President. I sometimes forget it myself. 
but it was his handicap, I guess, that made him concentrate on telepathy so that he doesn't need his ears to hear what people are saying. Maybe I could read minds the way he does if I'd been born that way. Come to think of it, I doubt if the Russians would have believed he was a spy if they'd caught him, unless they really did believe he was telepathic. A physical examination would show immediately that he was born without eardrums and that the inner ear bones are fused. They wouldn't try to make a man talk if an examination showed that he really was a deaf mute. The buzzer on the colonel's intercom sounded. Yes, said Spaulding. Dr. Davenport is here, said Sergeant Nugget. He wants to talk to you. Send him in, said Colonel Spaulding gleefully. I have a nice scientific theory I want to shove down his throat. End of the Foreign Hand Tie by Randall Garrett